Random House Audio presents As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. Read for you by Mark Cashman, Robertson Dean, Lena Patel, and Lorna Raver. Jewel and I come up from the field, following the path in single file. Although I am 15 feet ahead of him, anyone watching us from the cotton house can see Jewel's frayed and broken straw hat, a full head above my own. The path runs straight as a plumb line, worn smooth by feet and baked brickard by July, between the green rows of laid by cotton, to the cotton house in the center of the field, where it turns and circles the cotton house at four soft right angles, and goes on across the field again, worn so by feet in fading precision. The cotton house is of rough logs, from between which the chinking has long fallen. Square, with a broken roof set at a single pitch, it leans, in empty and shimmering dilapidation, in the sunlight, a single broad window in two opposite walls, giving onto the approaches of the path. When we reach it, I turn and follow the path which circles the house. Jewel, fifteen feet behind me, looking straight ahead, steps in a single stride through the window. Still staring straight ahead, his pale eyes like wood set into his wooden face, he crosses the floor in four strides, with the rigid gravity of a cigar store Indian dressed in patched overalls and endued with life from the hips down, and steps in a single stride through the opposite window, and into the path again, just as I come around the corner. In single file and five feet apart, and Jewel now in front, we go on up the path, toward the foot of the bluff. Cole's wagon stands beside the spring, hitched to the wheel, the reins wrapped about the seat stanchion. In the wagon, two chairs. Jewel stops at the spring and takes the board from the wheel of the kitchen drinks. I pass him and mount the path, beginning to hear Cash's saw. When I reach the top, he has quit sawing. Standing in a little eclipse, he has fitted two wooden boards together. Between the shadow spaces, they are yellow as gold, like soft gold, bearing on their flanks in smooth undulations the marks of the ad's blade. A good carpenter Cash is. He holds the two planks on the trestle, fitted along the edges, in a quarter of the finished box. He wheels and spins along the edge of them, then lowers them and takes up the ads. A good carpenter. Addy Bundren could not want a better one, a better box to lie in. It will give her confidence and comfort. I go on to the house, followed by the chuck, chuck, chuck of the ads. Cole, someone saved out the eggs and baked yesterday. The cakes turned out right well. We depend a lot on our chickens. They have good layers, what few we have left after the possums and such. Snakes too in the summer. A snake will break up a hen house quicker than anything. So that was going to cost so much more than Mr. Toll thought, and after I promised that the difference in the number of eggs would make it up, I had to be more careful than ever, because it was on my final say-so we took them. We can eat cheaper chickens, but I gave my promise, as Miss Longington said when she advised me to get a good breed, because Mr. Tull himself admits that a good breed of cows or hogs pays in the long run. So we didn't for me, we couldn't afford to use the egg beans, because I couldn't have had Mr. Tull chide me when it was on my say-so we took them. So when Miss Longington told me about the cakes, I thought that I could bake them and earn enough at one time to increase the net value of the flock the equivalent of two more, and that by saving the eggs out one at a time, even the eggs wouldn't be costing anything. And that week they laid so well that I not only saved out enough eggs above what we had engaged to sell to bake the cakes with, I had saved enough so that the flour and the sugar and the clove wood would not be costing anything. So I baked yesterday, more careful than ever I baked in my life, and the cakes turned out right well. But when we got to town this morning, Miss Longton told me the lady had changed her mind and was not going to have the party after all. She ought to take in those cakes anyway, Kate says. I She ought to take them, Kate says. But those rich town ladies can change their minds. Poor folks can't. Riches is nothing in the face of the Lord, for he can see into the heart. Maybe I can take them Saturday, I said. They turned out real well. You can't get two dollars a piece for them, Kate says. Well, it isn't like they cost me anything, I say. I saved them out and swapped a dozen of them for the sugar and flour. It isn't like the cakes cost me anything, as Mr. Tull himself realizes that the eggs I saved were over and beyond what we had engaged to sell. So we could have found the eggs, or they had been given to us. She ought to take in those cakes when she found and gave you her word, Kate says. The Lord can see into the heart. If it is his will that some folks has different ideas of honesty from other folks, it is not my place to question his decree. I reckon she never had any use for them, I say. They turned out real well, too. The quilt is drawn up to her chin, hot as it is, with only her two hands and her face outside. She is propped on the pillow, with her head raised so she can see out the window. And we can hear him every time he comes up the ads or the saw. If we were dim, we could almost watch her face and hear him, see him. Her face is wasted away so that the beam falls the end of the ceiling. Her eyes are like two candles when you watch them gutter down into the sockets of iron candlesticks. But the eternal and the everlasting grace is not upon all. They turned out real nice, I say. But not like the cakes Addie used to bake. You can see that girl's washing and ironing the pillow, if I ever was. Maybe it will reveal her grandma to me, laying there at the mercy and the ministration of four men and a tomboy girl. There's not a woman in this section could ever bake with Addie Bundren, I say. First thing we know, she'll be up and baking again, and then we won't even take the Under the pit, she makes no more of a hump than a railroad, and the only way you can tell she is breathing is by the sound of the mattress shucks. Even the hair of her cheek does not move, even with that girl standing right over her, fanning her with a fan. While we watch, she swaps the fan to the other hand without stopping it. Is she sleeping? Kate whispers. She's just walking. The girl says. We can hear the saw on the board. It sounds like snoring. Eula turns on the trunk and looks out the window. Her necklace looks really nice with her You wouldn't think it only cost 25 cents. She ought to take those cakes, Kate says. I could have used the money real well, but it's not like they cost me anything except the baking. I can tell him that anybody is likely to make a miscue, but it's not all of them that can get out of it without wrath, I can tell him. If only everybody can eat their mistakes, I can tell him. Someone comes through the hall. It is Darrell. He does not look in as he passes the door. Eula watches him as he goes on and passes from side again toward the back. Her hand rises and touches the beads lightly, and on the wall. When she finds me watching her, her eyes go blank. Darrell. Paul and Bernard. Paul is tilting snuff from the lid of his snuff box into his lower lip, holding the lip outdrawn between thumb and finger. They look around as I cross the porch and dip the gourd into the water bucket and drink. Where 
Water's Jewel. Paul says, When I was a boy, I first learned how much better water tastes when it is set a while in a cedar bucket. Warm is cool, with a faint taste like the hot July wind in cedar tree smells. It has to set at least six hours and be drunk from a gourd. Water could never be drunk from metal. And at night, it is better still. I used to lie on the pallet in the hall, waiting until I could hear them all asleep, so I could get up and go back to the bucket. It would be black, the shelf black, the still surface of the water around orifice in nothingness, where before I started awake with the dipper, I could see maybe a star or two in the bucket, and maybe in the dipper. After that, I was bigger, older. Then I would wait until they all went to sleep so I could lie with my shirt tail up, hearing them asleep, touching myself, feeling the cool silence blowing upon my parts, and wondering if Cash was yonder in the darkness doing it too. I've been doing it perhaps for the last two years before I could have wanted to, or could have. Pa's feet are badly splayed, his toes cramped and bent and warped, with no pain in the little cold, working so hard in the wet and homemade shoes when he was a boy. Beside his chair is broken stiff. They look as though they have been hacked with a blunt axe out of pig iron. Meredith has been to town. I have never seen him go to town in overalls. His wife, they say. She taught school, too, once. I fling the dipper dregs to the ground and wipe my mouth on my sleeve. It is going to rain before morning, maybe before dark. Down to the barn, I say, harnessing the team. Down there, fooling with that horse. He will go on through the barn, into the pasture. The horse will not be in sight. He is up there among the pine seedlings, in the pool. Jewel whistles, once, and shrill. The horse snorts, then Jewel sees him, glinting for a gaudy instant among the blue shadows. Jewel whistles again. The horse comes dropping down the slope, stiff-legged, his ears cocking and flicking, his mismatched eyes rolling, and fetches up twenty feet away, broadside on, watching Jewel over his shoulder in an attitude kittenish and alert. Come here, sir, Jewel says. He moves, moving that quick, his coat bunching, tongues swirling like so many flames. With tossing mane and teeth, no one Stop. Feet punched, watching Jewel. Jewel walks steadily toward him, his hands at his sides. Sleep on Jewel's legs, and two figures coming from the tableau, savage in the sun. When Jewel can almost touch him, the horse stands on his hind legs and slashes down at Jewel. Then Jewel is enclosed by a glittering maze of hooves as by an illusion of wings. Among them, beneath the upward trunk, he moves with a plastic limber to the For an instant before the jerk comes onto his arms, he sees his whole body earth-free, horizontal, whipping snake limber, until he finds the horse's nostrils and touches earth again. Then they are rigid, motionless, terrific. The horse back thrust on stiffened, quivering legs with lowered head. Jewel, with dug heels, shutting off the horse. Patting the horse's neck in short strokes, myriad and caressing, cursing the horse with obscene ferocity. They stand in rigid, terrific hiatus, the horse trembling and groaning. Then Jewel is on the horse's back. He flows upward in a swooping swirl like the lash of a whip, his body in midair shaped to the horse. For another moment, the horse stands spraddled, with lowered head, before it bursts into motion. And descends into a series of spine-jolting jumps, Jewel high, leech-like on the withers, to the fence, where the horse bunches to a scuttering halt again. Well, Jewel says, you can quit now, if you've got a plenty. Inside the barn, Jewel slides running to the ground before the horse stops. The horse enters the stall, Jewel following. Without looking back, the horse kicks at him, slamming a single hoof into the wall with a pistol-like report. Jewel kicks him in the stomach. The horse arches his neck back, crop-toothed. Jewel strikes him across the face with his fist and slides onto the trough and mounts upon it. Clinging to the hay rack, he lowers his head and peers out across the stall tops and through the doorway. The park is empty. From here, he cannot even hear Cass sawing. He reaches up and drags down hay in hurried armsful and crams it into the rack. Eat, he says. Get the goddamn stuff out of sight while you got a chance, you bustle gutted bastard. You sweet son of a bitch, he says. It's because he stays out there, right under the window, hammering and sawing on that goddamn box, where she's got to see him. Where every breath she draws is full of his knocking and sawing, where she can see him saying, See? See what a good one I'm making for you? I told him the ghost on my bed. I said, Good God, do you want to see her in it? It's like when he was a little boy, and she says if she had some fertilizer, she would try to raise some flowers, and he'd taken the bread pan and brought it back from the barn full of dung. And now the mother's sitting there like buzzards, waiting, fanning themselves. Because I said, if you wouldn't keep on sawing and nailing at it until a man can't sleep even, and her hands laying on a quilt like two of them roots dug up and tried to wash, and you couldn't get them clean. I can see the fan and Dewey Dell's arm. I said, If you just let her alone. Sawing and knocking, and keeping the air always moving so fast on her face that when you're tired you can't breathe it, and that goddamn ad's going one lick less, one lick less, one lick less, until everybody that walks in the world will have to stop and see it and say what a fine carpenter he is. If it had just been me when Cash fell off of that church, and if it had just been me when Pa laid sick with that little dude fell on him, it would be happening with every coming to stare at her, because if there's a God, what the hell is he for? It would just be me and her on a high hill, and me rolling the rocks down the hill at their faces, picking them up and throwing them down the hill, faces and teeth and all by God until she was quiet, and not that goddamn pads going one lick less, one lick less, and we could be quiet. Hello. We watch him come around the corner and mount the steps. He does not look at us. You ready? He says. If you're hitched up, I say. I say. He spits. Between the ball. He spits without moving. He spits with decorous and deliberate precision into the pulp dust below the porch. Paul rubs his hands slowly on his knees. He is gazing out beyond the crest of the bluff, out across the land. Jewel watches him a moment. Then he goes on to the pail and drinks again. I dislike undecision as much as air a man. Pa says. It means three dollars, I say. The shirt across Pa's hump is faded lighter than the rest of it. There is no sweat stain on his shirt. I have never seen a sweat stain on his shirt. He was sick once from working in the sun when he was twenty-two years old, and he tells people that if he ever sweats, he will die. I suppose he believes it. 
But if she don't last until you get back, he says, she will be disappointed. Vernon spits into the dust, but it will rain before morning. She's counted on it. Paul says, she'll want to start right away. I know her. I promised her I'd keep the team here and ready. And she's counted on it. We'll need that three dollars then, sure, I say. He gazes out over the land, raising his hands on his knees. Since he lost his teeth, his mouth collapses in slow repetition when he dips. The stubble gives his lower face that appearance that old dogs have. You better make up your mind soon, so we can get there and get a load on before dark, I say. Ma ain't that sick, Jewel says. Shut up, doll. That's right, Vernon says. She seems more like herself today than she has in a week. Time you and Jewel get back, she'll be setting up. You ought to know, Jewel says. You've been here often enough looking at her. You and your folks. Vernon looks at him. Jewel's hands look like pale in front of her face. He is a bit taller than everything says. Always keeps. I told him because he was keeping up. That's why she named him Jewel, I told him. Shut up, Jewel, Pa says, but as though he is not listening much. He gazes out across the land, rubbing his knees. You could borrow the loan of Vernon's team and we could catch up with you, I say, if you didn't wait for us. I'll shut your goddamn mouth, Jewel says. She'll want to go now, Pa says. He rubs his knees. Don't hear a man dislike it more. It's laying there, watching Cash Whittle on that damn, Jewel says. He says it hoss savagely, but he does not say a word. Like a little boy in the dark, afraid of his courage and suddenly aghast into silence by his own noise. She wanted that like she wants to go in our own wagon, Pa says. She'll rest easier for knowing it's a good one, in private. She's a very private woman. You know it well. Then let it be private, Jewel says. But how the hell could you expect it to be? He looks at the back of Pa's head, his eyes like pale wooden eyes. So, Vernon says, she'll hold on till it's finished. She'll hold on till everything's ready, till her own good time. And with the roads like they are now, it won't take you no time to get her to town. It's fixing up to rain, Pa says. I am a luckless man. I have ever been. He rubs his hands on his knees. It's that darn doctor, liable to come at any time. I couldn't get word to him until so late. That he was to come tomorrow and tell her the time was coming. She wouldn't wait. I'm all up. Wagon or no wagon, she wouldn't wait. Then she'd be upset. And I wouldn't upset her for the living world. With that family burying ground in Jefferson and them of her blood waiting for her there, she'll be impatient. I promised my word me and the boys would get her there quick as mules could walk it, so she could rest quiet. He runs his hands on his knees. No man ever disliked it more. If everybody wasn't burning hell to get her there, Jewel says in that harsh, savage voice, with cash all day long right under the window, hammering and sawing at that. It was her wish, Pa says. You got no affection nor gentleness for her. You never had. We will be beholden to no man, he says, me and her. We have never yet been, and she will rest quieter for knowing it, and that it was her own blood sought out the birds and gave them all. She was to make up after herself. It means three dollars, I say. Do you want us to go or not? Pa rubs his knees. We'll be back by tomorrow sundown. Well, Pa says. He looks like a cry haired, mounting snuff slowly against his gums. Come on, Jewel says. He goes down the steps. Vernon fits me the dust. By sundown now, Pa says. I would not keep her waiting. Jewel glances back, then he goes on around the house. I enter the hall, hearing the voices before I reach the door. Tilting a little down the hill, as our house does, a breeze draws through the hall all the time, upslanting. A feather dropped near the front door will raise and brush along the ceiling, slanting backward until it reaches the downturning current of the back door. So with voices. As you enter the hall, they sound as though they were speaking out of the air about your head. Clearly. It was the sweetest thing I ever saw. It was like he knew he would never see her again. That Aunt Bundren was driving him from his mother's deathbed, never to see her in this world again. I always said Doyle was different from those others. I always said he was the only one of them about his mother's nature, had any more for thinking. Not the jewel, the one she labored so to bear and coddled and petted so, and who cleaned the tantrums or fitting fowls, and bent and devilment to devil her until I could fit on the Not him to come and tell her goodbye. Not him to miss a extra three dollars to pass her his mother's goodbye kiss. Abundant through and through, loving nobody, caring for nothing except how to get something with the least amount of work. Mr. Tulsa said Darlon wants to wait. He said Darlon must beg them on his knees not to force him to leave her in her condition. But nothing would do but Anson Jewel must make that three dollars. Nobody that knows Anson could have expected different. But to think of that boy. So in all those years of self-denial and downright partiality, they couldn't fool me. Mr. Tull says Mrs. Bundren liked Jewel the least of all, but I knew better. I knew she was partial to him, to the same quality in him that let her put up with Aunt Bundren when Mr. Tull said she ought to poison him, for three dollars, denying his dying mother the goodbye kiss. Why, for the last three weeks I've been coming over every time I could, coming sometimes when I shouldn't have, neglecting my own family and duty so that somebody would be with her in her last moments, and she would not have to face the great unknown without one familiar face to give her courage. Not that I deserve credit for it. I will expect the same for myself. But thank God it will be the faces of my loved kin, my blood and flesh. For in my husband and children, I have been more blessed than most, trials though they have been at times. She lived, a lonely woman, lonely with her pride, trying to make folks believe different, hiding the fact that they just suffered her, because she was not cold in the coffin before they were carting her forty miles away to bury her, flouting the will of God to do it. But she wanted to go, Mr. Tull said. It was her own wish to lie among her own people. Then why didn't she go alive, I said. Not one of them would have stopped her, with even that little one almost old enough now to be selfish and stone-hearted like the rest of them. It was her own wish, Mr. Tull said. I won't say it was. And you would believe Ants, of course, I said. A man like you would. Don't tell me. I'd believe him about something he couldn't expect to make anything off of me by not telling, Mr. Tull said. Don't tell me, I said. A woman's place is with her husband and children, alive or dead. Would you expect me to want to go back to Alabama and leave you and the girls when my time comes? That I left of my own will to cast my lot with yours for better and worse until death and after? 
Well, folks are different, he said. I should hope so. I have tried to live right in the sight of God and man, for the honor and comfort of my Christian husband and the love and respect of my Christian children, so that when I lay me down in the consciousness of my duty and reward, I will be surrounded by loving faces, carrying the farewell kiss of each of my loved ones into my reward. Not like Anna Bondren, dying alone, hiding her pride and her broken heart. Lying there with her head propped up so she could watch Cash building the coffin, having to watch him so he would not skimp on it, like as if there was tea for three dollars before the rain come and the river got too high to get across it. Like as not, if they hadn't decided to make that last load, they would have loaded her into the wagon on a quilt and crossed the river first and then stopped and give her time to die, but Christian death they would let her. Except Darrell. It was the sweetest thing I ever saw. I still love that. But always the Lord restores my faith and reveals to me his bounteous love for his creatures. Not Jewel, the one she had always cherished. Not him. He was after that three extra dollars. It was Darrell. The one that folks say is queer, lazy, pardon the multiplicity. And Jewel, he's doing something and that near naked girl always standing over Abby with a pen, so that every time the body tried to talk to her and cheer her up, why well, her back? Like she was trying to keep anybody from coming near her at all. It was Doral. He came to the door and stood there, looking at his dying mother. He just looked at her, and I felt the bounteous love of the Lord again and his mercy. I saw the jewel she had just been pretending, but that it was between her and Doral that the understanding and the true love was. He just looked at her, upset, knowing that Anne was driving him away, and he would never see her again. He said nothing. Just looking at her. What do you want, Doral? Dewey Dell said, not stopping the fan, speaking up quick, keeping even him from her. He didn't answer. He just stood and looked at his dying mother, his heart too full for words. Dewey Dell. The first time, me and Leif picked on down the road. Pa doesn't sweat because he will catch his death from the sickness, so everybody that comes to help us. And Jewel don't care about anything. He's not care Not care again. And Cash likes on the long, hot, sad, baby, and the plates, and then into something. And Pa thinks because neighbors will always treat one another that way, because he has always been too busy letting neighbors do for him to find out. And I did not think that Doral would, and sits at the supper table with his eyes gone further than the food, and the lamp, full of the land dug out of the sea, and the holes filled with distance beyond the land. We picked on down the road, the woods getting closer and closer, and the secret shade, picking on into the secret shade with my sack and lace sack. Because I said, will I, or won't I, when the sack was half full? Because I said, if the sack is full when we get to the woods, it won't be me. I said, if it don't mean for me to do it, the sack will not be full, and I will turn up the next row. But if the sack is full, I cannot help it. It will be that I have to do it all the time, and I cannot help it. And we picked on toward the secret shade, and our eyes were drowned together. Touching on his hands and my hands, and I didn't say anything. I said, what are you doing? And he said, I am picking into your sack. And so it was full when we came to the end of the row, and I could not help it. And so it was because I could not help it. It was then, and then I saw Darl and he knew. He said he knew without the words, like he told me that Ma is going to die without words. And I knew he knew, because if he had said he knew with the words, I would not have believed that he had been there and saw us. But he said he did know, and I said, are you going to tell Paul? Are you going to kill him? Without the words, I said it. And he said, why, without the words? And that's why I can talk to him. With knowing, with holding, because of He stands in the room, looking at her. What do you want, Darl? I say. She is going to die, he says. And old turkey buzzard told coming to watch her die, but I can fool them. Thank you, I say. Before we get back, he says. Then why are you taking Jewel? I say. I want him to help me load, he says. Come. Ants keeps on rubbing his knees. His overalls are faded. On one knee, Serge Patch got out of a pair of Sunday pants, wore iron slick. No man dislikes it more than me, he says. A fella's got to guess ahead now and then, I say. But come long and short, there won't be no harm done either way. She'll want to get started right off, he says. It's far enough to Jefferson at best. But the roads is good now, I say. It's fixing to rain tonight, too. He's at New Hope, too, not three miles away. But it's just like him to marry a woman born a day's hard ride away and have to die on him. He says. He'll get back in plenty of time, I say. I wouldn't worry none. It means three dollars, he says. Might be it won't be no need for them to rush back no ways, I say. I hope it. She's going. He says, her mind set on it. It's a hard life on women, for a fact. Some women. I'm on my mom and to be 70 and more. Worked every day, rain or shine. Never a sick day since her last chap was born, until one day she kind of looked around her, and then she went and taken that lace trim night down she had had 45 years, and never wore out of the chest. And put it on, and laid down on the bed, and pulled the covers up, and shut her eyes. You all have to look out for Pa the best you can, she said. I'm tired. Aunt rubs his hands on his knees. The Lord give us. We can hear cows and song beyond the corner. It's true. Never a true death we've ever breathed. The Lord giveth, I say. That boy comes up the hill. He is tall and thick, nigh long as he is. He slings it to the ground and grunts ha, and spits over his shoulder like a man. Dern nigh long as he is. What's that, I say? A hog? Where'd you get it? Down to the bridge, he says. He turns it over, the underside caked over with dust where it is wet, the eye coated over, pumped under the dirt. Are you aiming to leave it laying there? Aunt says. I aim to show it to Ma, Vardaman says. He looks toward the door. We can hear the talking, coming out on the draft. Cash, too, knocking and hammering at the bulb. There's company in there, he says. Just my folks, I say. They'd enjoy to see you, too. He says nothing from the door. Then he looks down at the fish, in the dust. He turns it over with his foot and prods at the eye bump with his toe, gouging at it. 
Dan's just looking out over the land. Vardaman looks at Ansa's face, then at the door. He turns, going toward the corner of the house, when Ansa calls him without looking around. You clean that fish, Ant says. Vardaman stops. Why can't Dewey Dow clean it? He says. You clean that fish, Ant says. Oh, pa, Vardaman says. You clean it, Ant says. He won't look around. Vardaman comes back and picks up the fish. It slides out of his hands, smearing wet dirt onto him, and flops down, dirtying itself again. Gap more, goggle-eyed, hiding into the dust like it's ashamed of being dead, like it was in a hurry to get back here again. Vardaman cusses it. He cusses it like a grown man, standing in the straddle of it. Ants don't look around. Vardaman picks it up again. He goes out of the old house, tilting it in both arms like an armful of wood, it overlapping him on both ends, head and tail. Dern not big as he is. Ants' his wrists dangle out of his sleeves. I never see him with a shirt on that looked like it was his in all my life. They all looked like Jewel might have given him his old ones. Not Jewel, though. He's long-armed, even if he is fiddling, except for the lack of sweat. You could tell there ain't been nobody else who put answers that way without no mistake. His eyes look like pieces of burnt-out cinder fixed in his face, looking out over the land. When the shadow touches the steps, he says, It's five o'clock. Just as I get up, Cora comes to the door and says it's time to get on. Ants reaches for his shoes. Now, Mr. Bundren, Cora says, don't you get up now. He puts his shoes on, stopping into them, like he does everything, like he's hoping all the time he really can't do it and can quit trying to. When we go up the hall, we can hear them clumping on the floor like they was iron shoes. He comes toward the door where she is, blinking his eyes, kind of looking ahead of himself before he sees, like he's hoping to find her setting up, in a chair maybe, or maybe sleeping, and looks into the door in that surprised way like he looks in and finds her still in bed every time, and Dewey Dell still a fan in her with the fan. He stands there, like he don't aim to move again or nothing else. Well, I reckon we better get on, Cora says. I got to feed the chicken. It's fixing to rain, too. Clouds like that don't lie, and the cotton making every day the Lord sends. That'll be something else for him. Cash is still trimming at the boards. If there's a thing we can do, Cora says. Answer let us know, I say. Answer don't look at us. He looks around, blinking, in that surprised way, like he had wore himself down being surprised and was even surprised at that. If Cash just works that careful on my barn. I told Anne it likely won't be no need, I say. I so hope it. Her mind is set on it, he says. I reckon stop it. It comes to all of us, Cora says. Let the Lord comfort you. About that corn, I say. I tell him again I will help him out if he gets into a tight, with her sick and all. Like most folks around here, I done hope him to already. I can't quit now. I aim to get to go, he says. Seems like I can't get my mind on nothing. Maybe she'll hold out till you are laid by, I say. If God wills it, he says. Let him comfort you, Cora says. If Cash just works that careful on my barn, he looks up when you open. You reckon I'll get to you this week, he says. Take no rust, I say. Whenever you get around to it. We get into the wagon. Cora sets the click box on her lap. It's fixing to rain, show. I don't know what he'll do, Cora says. I just don't know. Poor Anne, I say. She kept him at work for thirty odd years. I reckon she is tired. And I reckon she'll be behind him for thirty years more, Kate says. He'll get another one before cotton picking. I reckon Cash and Dog can get married now, Eula says. That poor boy, Cora says. The poor little tyke. What about Jewel? Kate says. You can too, Eula says. Hm, Kate says. I reckon you will. I reckon so. I reckon that's me. Well, they need to do it. Why, Kate? Cora says. The wagon begins to rattle. The poor little tyke, Cora says. It's fixing to rain this night. Yes, sir. A rattling wagon is mighty dry weather for a burnt cell. But that'll be cute. She says. Ants. During that road. And it's fixing to rain, too. I can stand here and see and see it with second sight. But shutting down behind them like a wall. Shutting down betwixt them and my given promise. I do the best I can. Not just I can get my mind on anything. But turn them, boys. I lay in there, right up to my door, where every bad luck that comes and goes is bound to find it. I told Daddy it won't any luck living on the road when it come by here. And she said, for the world like a woman, get up and move then. But I told her it won't no luck in it, because the Lord put roads for traveling. Why he laid them down flat on the earth? When he aims for something to be always a moving, you know, like a road or a horse or a wagon, but when he aims for something to stay put, he makes it up and down ways, like a tree or a man. And so he never aims for folks to live on the road, because which gets there first, I says, the road or the house. Did you ever know him to set a road down by a house, I says? No, you never, I says, because it's always men can't rest till they gets to the house set where everybody that passes in the wind spit in the doorway, keeping the folks from breakfast and wanting to get up and go somewhere else when he aims for them to stay put like a tree or a stand of corn. Because if he aims for a man to be always a moving and going somewhere else, wouldn't he have put him long ways on his belly like a snake? It stands to reason he would. Putting it where every bad luck prowling can find it and can spring to my door, charging me taxes on top of it. Making me pay for cash having to get them carpenter notions when if there hadn't been no road come there, he wouldn't have bought them. Falling off of churches and lifting no hand in six months, and me and Addie slaving and a slaving when there's plenty of sawing on this place he could do if he's got to saw. And Dar, too. You can leave them, turn them. It ain't that I'm afraid of work. I always has fed me and mine and kept a roof above us. It's that they would shorthand me just because he tends to his own business. Just because he's got his eyes full of the land all the time. I says to them, he was all right at first, with his eyes full of the land, he got the land laid up and down ways then. It wasn't until that air road come and switched the land around long ways, and his eyes still full of the land, that they begun to threaten me out of him, trying to shorthand me with the law, making me pay for it. She was well and hale as e'er a woman ever were, except for that road, just laying down, resting herself in her own bed, asking naught of none. Are you sick, Addie? 
I said. I am not sick, she said. You lay you down and rest you, I said. I know you are not sick. You are just tired. You lay you down and rest. I am not sick, she said. I will get up. Lay still and rest, I said. You are just tired. You can get up tomorrow. And she was laying there, well and hale as air a woman ever were, except for that road. I never sent for you, I said. I take you to witness. I never sent for you. I know you didn't. Who about it? About that. Where is she? She's a laying down, I said. She's just a little tired, but she'll... Get out in here, Ants, he said. Go sit on the porch a while. And now I got to pay for it. Me without a tooth in my head. Hoping to get ahead enough so I could get my mouth fixed where I could eat God's own vittles as a man should. And her hail and well as a woman in the land until that day. Got to pay for being put to the need of that three dollars. Got to pay for the way for the boys to have to go away. And now I can see same as second sight the rain shutting down betwixt us. Coming up that road like a darn man. Like it want e'er other house to rain on in all the living land. They told me cast their luck and right. For they were sinful men. But I do not say it's a curse on me. Because I have done no wrong to be cussed by. I'm not religious, I reckon. But peace is in my heart. I know it is. I have done things, but neither better nor worse than them that pretend otherwise. And I know that old master will care for me as for e'er a sparrow that falls. But it seems hard that a man in his need could be so flouted by a road. Vardaman comes around, bloody as a hog, to his knees. And that air fish chopped up with the axe like as not. Or maybe throw it away for him to lie about the dog's edit. Well, I reckon I ain't no cause to expect no more. Brothers. He comes along, watching the house, quiet, and sits on the steps. Whew, he says. I'm pure tired. Go wash them hands, I say. But couldn't no woman strove harder than Addie to make them right. Man and boy. I'll say that for you. It was full of blood and guts as a hog, he says. But I just can't seem to get no harm to anything, with this here weather sapping me too. Pa, he says. Is Ma sick some more? Go wash them hands, I say. But you just can't seem to get no harm to it. Pa. He's been to town this week. <laughs> oh, I like a joint of white bone. He has a horse for back. Two, I say. Back running, through between the two sets of bobbing mule ears, the road vanishes beneath the wagon, as though it were a ribbon, and the front axle were a spool. Do you know she's going to die, Jewel? It takes two people to make you, and one people to die. That's how the world is going to end. I said to Louis Bell, you want her to die so you can get to town, is that it? She wouldn't say what we both knew. The reason you will not say it is, when you say it, even to yourself, you will know it's true, is that it? But you know it is true. You can't even die today when you know it is true. She will not say it. She just keeps on saying, are you going to tell Paul? Are you going to kill him? You cannot believe it is true because you cannot believe that Dewey Dell, Dewey Dell Bundren, could have such bad luck. Is that it? The sun, an hour above the horizon, is poised like a bloody egg upon a crest of thunderbolts. The light has turned copper, and the eye portentous, in the nose, sulfurous. When Peabody comes, they will have to use the rope. He has puzzle gutted himself eating cold greens. With the rope, they will haul him up the path, balloon-like up the sulfurous air. Jewel, I say. Do you know that Addie Bundren is going to die? Addie Bundren is going to die. Peabody. When Ants finally sent for me of his own accord, I said... He has wore her out at last. And I said a damn good thing. And at first I would not go, because there might be something I could do and I would have to haul her back, my God. I thought maybe they have the same sort of fool ethics in heaven they have in the medical college, and that it was maybe Vernon Tull sending for me again, getting me there in the nick of time, as Vernon always does things, getting the most for a pimp, like it does for his own. But when it got far enough into the day for me to read weather sign, I knew it couldn't have been anybody but Ansford sent. I knew that no one could ever need a doctor in the face of a cyclone. And I knew that if it had finally occurred to Ansford, he would have already too late. When I reach the spring and get down and hitch the team, the sun has gone down behind a bank of black cloud like a top-heavy mountain range, like a load of cinders dumped over there, and there's no wind. I could hear Cash sawing for a mile before I got there. Ants is standing at the top of the bluff above the path. Where's the horse? I say. Jewel's taken and gone, he says. Can't nobody else catch it. You'll have to walk up, I reckon. Me? Walk up? Weighing 225 pounds? I say. Walk up that darn wall? He stands there beside a tree. Too bad the Lord made the mistake of giving trees roots, and giving the ants bundrens he makes feet and legs. If he just swapped them, there would never be a worry about this country being deforested someday, or any other country. What do you aim for me to do, I say? Stay here and get blowed clean out of the county when that cloud breaks? Even with the horse, it would take me fifteen minutes to ride up across the pasture to the top of the ridge and reach the house. The path looks like a crooked limb blown against the bluff. Ants has not been in town in twelve years. And how his mother ever got up there to bed him, he's being his mother's son. Vardaman's getting the rope, he says. After a while, Vardaman appears with the plow line. He gives the end of it to Ants and comes down the path, uncoiling it. You hold it tight. I can see this is on my books. So I'm going to charge you just the same, whether I get there or not. I got it, Ants says. You can come on up. I'll be damned if I can see why I don't quit. A man seventy years old, weighing two hundred and odd pounds, being hauled up and down the damn mountain rope. I reckon it's because I must reach the fifty thousand dollar mark of dead accounts on my books before I can quit. What the hell does your wife mean, I say, taking sick on top of a dern mountain? All right, sorry, he says. He let the rope go, just dropped it, and he has turned toward the house. There's a little daylight up here still, of the color of sulfur matches. The boards look like strips of sulfur. Ants does not look back. 
Vernon Tull says he brings each ward up to the window for her to see it, and says it is all right. The boy overtakes us, and looks back at him. Where's the rope? He says. It's where you left it, I say. Where do you mind that rope? I got to get back down that bluff. I don't aim for that storm to catch me up here. I blow too darn far once I got started. The girl is standing by the bed, fanning her. When we enter, she turns her head and looks at us. She's been dead these ten days. I suppose it's haven't been a part of Anne's for so long that she cannot even make that change, if change it be. I can remember how when I was young I believed death to be a phenomenon of the body. Now I know it to be merely a function of the mind. And that of the minds are the ones who suffer the bereavement. The nihilists say it is the end, the fundamentalists the beginning, when in reality it is no more than a single tenant or family moving out of a tenement or a town. She looks at us. Only her eyes seem to move. It's like they touch us, not with sight or sense, but like the stream from a hose touches you. The stream at the instant of impact is dissociated from the nozzle as though it had never been there. She does not look at Anne's at all. She looks at the boy. Beneath the quilt, she's no more than a bundle of rotten sticks. Well, Miss Addie, I say. The girl does not stop the fan. How are you, sister? I say. Her head lies gaunt on the pillow, looking at the boy. You picked a fine time to get in here and go the storm. Then I send Anne's and the boy out. She watches the boy as he leaves the room. She has not moved, save her eyes. He and Anne's are on the porch when I come out. The boy is sitting on the steps. Anne's standing by a post, not even leaning against it. His arms dangling. The hair pushed and matted up on his head like a dipped rooster. He turns his head and looks at me. Why didn't you send for me sooner? I say. It was just one thing and then another, he says. That here Cora and me and the boys was aiming to get up with, and Dewey Dale had taken good care of her, and folks coming in, the offering to help and such, but I just thought, damn the money, I say. Did you ever hear of me worrying a fellow before he was ready to pay? It ain't begrudging the money, he says. I just kept a thinking. She's going, is she? The darn little tiger is sitting on the top step, looking smaller than ever in the sulfur-colored light. That's the one trouble with this country. Everything, weather, he hangs on too long. Like our rivers, our land. Opaque, slow, violent, shaping and creating the life of man in its implacable and brooding image. I knowed it, Anne says. All the while I made show, her mind is sought on it. And a damn good thing, too, I say. With a trifling... He sits on the top step, small, motionless in faded overalls. When I came home, he looked up at me, then at Anne's. But now he has stopped looking at us. He just sits there. Have you told her yet? Anne says. What for? I say. What the devil for? She knew it. I know that when she see you, she would know it. Same as writing. You wouldn't need to tell her. Her mind? Behind us, the girl says, Paul? I look at her, at her face. You better go quick, I say. When we enter the room, she's watching the door. She looks at me. Her eyes look like lamps blaring up just before the oil is gone. She wants you to go out, the girl says. Now, Addie, Anne says, when he come all the way from Jefferson to get you well? She watches me. I can feel her eyes. It's like she was shoving at me with them. I have seen it before in women. Seen them drive from the room, them coming with sympathy and pity, with actual help, and clinging to some trifling animal to whom they never were more than pack horses. That's what they mean by the love that passeth understanding. That pride, that furious desire to hide that abject nakedness which we bring here with us, carry with us into operating rooms, carry stubbornly and furiously with us into the earth again. I leave the room. Beyond the porch, Cash's saw snores steadily into the board. A minute later, she calls his name, her voice harsh and strong. Cash, she says. Cash. And this one, this two. Done. Um. From behind his leg, Cardamon appears, with his round head and his eyes round and his mouth beginning to open. She looks at Paul. All her failing life appears to drain into her eyes. Urgent, irremediable. Dewey Dale says. Why, Annie, Paul says. Him and Dara went to make one more load. They thought there was time. They didn't wait for it. And that three dollars on him. He stoops. Well, he does. Without the coat. Paul does not all. He's in her eyes alone, listening to the irrevocable cessation of his voice. Then she raises herself. He has not moved in ten days. Dewey Dale leans down, trying to press her back. Me, she says. Ma. She's looking out the window. At Cash, stooping steadily at the board in the failing light, laboring on toward darkness and into it, as though the stroking of a saw illumined its own motion. Born and saw, engendered. You, Cash, she shouts, her voice harsh, strong, and unimpaired. You, Cash! He looks up at the gaunt face framed by the window in the twilight. It is a composite picture of all time since he was a child. He drops the saw and lifts the board for her to see, watching the window in which the face is not moved. He drags a second plank into position and slants the two of them into their final juxtaposition, gesturing toward the ones yet on the ground, shaping with his empty hand in pantomime the finished box. For a while still, she looks down at him from the composite picture, neither with censure nor approbation. Then the face disappears. She lies back and turns her head without so much as glancing at Paul. She looks at Vardaman. Her eyes, the life in them, rush instantly upon them. The two flames glare up for a steady instant. Then they go out, as though someone had leaned down and blown upon them. Ma, Dewey Dell says. Ma. Leaning above the bed, her hands lifted a little, the fan still moving like it has for ten days, she begins to keen. Her voice is strong, young, tremulous and clear, wrapped with its own timbre and volume, the fan still moving steadily up and down, whispering the useless air. Then she flings herself across Addie Bundren's knees, clutching her, shaking her with the furious strength of a young before sprawling suddenly across the handful of rotten bones that Addie Bundren left, 
jarring the whole bed into a chattering sibilance of mattress shucks, her arms out, and a fan in one hand, still beating with expanding breath into the quilt. From behind Pa's leg, Bartman appears, his mouth full open, and all color draining from his face into his mouth, as though he has by some means fleshed his own teeth in himself, sucking. He begins to move slowly backward from the bed, his eyes round, his pale face fading into the dusk like a piece of paper pasted on a failing wall, and so, out of the door. Pa leans above the bed in the twilight, his humped silhouette partaking of that owl-like quality of a rag feathered distant within which lurks a wisdom too profound or too inert for even thought. Dern them boys, he says. Do, I say. Overhead the day drives level and gray, hiding the sun by a flight of gray spears. In the rain the mules smoke a little, splashed yellow with mud. The off one clinging and sliding lunges to the side of the road above the ditch. The tilted lumber gleams dull yellow, water soaked and heavy as lead, tilted at a steep angle into the ditch above the broken wheel. About the shattered spokes and about Jewel's ankles, a runnel of yellow, neither water nor earth swirls, curving with the yellow road neither of earth nor water, down the hill dissolving into a streaming mass of dark green, neither of earth nor sky. Jewel, I say. Cash comes to the door, carrying the saw. Pa stands beside the bed, humped, his arms dangling. He turns his head, his chin collapsing slowly as he works the snuff against his gums. She's gone, Cash says. She's taken and left us, Pa says. Cash does not look at him. How nigh are you done, he says. Cash does not answer. He enters, carrying the saw. I reckon you better get at him, Pa says. You'll have to do the best you can with them boys gone off that way. Cash looks down at her face. He is not listening to Pa at all. He does not approach. He stops in the middle of the floor, the saw against his leg, his, his face composed. If you get in a tight, maybe Thunder Man will get here tomorrow and help you, Pa says. Good, good. Cash is not listening. He is looking down at a peaceful, rigid face, fading into the dusk as though darkness were a precursor of the ultimate earth, until at last the face seems to float between the pond, blackly, as a reflection of a dead leaf. There is Christians enough to help you, Pa says. Pa is not listening. After a while, he turns without looking at Pa and leaves the room. Then the saw begins to snore again. They will help us in our sorrow, Pa says. But competent, unhurried, stirring the dying light so that at each stroke her face seems to wake a little into an expression of movement and of waiting, as though she were counting the strokes. Pa looks down at the face, at the black sprawl of Dewey Dell's hair, the outflung arms, the clutched fan now motionless on the fading quilt. I reckon you better get supper on, he says. Dewey Dell does not move. Get up now and put supper on, Pa says. We got to keep the strength up. I reckon Dr. Peabody's right hungry coming all this way. And Cash will need to eat quick and get back to work so we can finish it in time. Dewey Dell rises heaving to her feet. She looks down at the face. It is like a casting of fading bronze upon the pillow, the hands alone still with any semblance of life, a curled, gnarled inertness, a spent yet alert quality of weariness, exhaustion, travail, has not yet departed, as though they doubted even yet the actuality of rest, guarding with horned and penurious alertness the cessation which they know cannot last. Dewey Dell stoops and slides the quilt from beneath them and draws it up over them to the chin, smoothing it down, drawing it smooth. Then, without looking at Pa, she goes around the bed and leaves the room. She will go out with where she can stand in the twilight and look at his back with such an expression that, feeling her eyes and turning, he will say, I would not let it grieve me now. She was old and sick too, suffering more than we knew. She couldn't do that way. getting big now, and with you to take good care of them all. I would try not to let it grieve me. I expect you'd better go and get some supper ready. It don't have to be much, but they'll need to eat. And she looking at him, saying, You could do so much for me if you just would. If you just knew. And you could do so much for me if you just would. And if you just would. Paul stands over the bed, angle-armed, pumped, motionless. He raises the hand to his head, scouring his hair, listening to the saw. He comes nearer and rubs his hand, palm and back, on his thigh, and lays it on her face, and then on the hump of quilt where her hands are. He touches the quilt, as he saw Dewey Dell do, trying to smooth it up to the chin, but disarranging it instead. He tries to smooth it again, clumsily, his hand awkward as a claw, smoothing at the wrinkles which he made, and which continue to emerge beneath his hand with perverse ubiquity, so that at last he desists, his hand falling to his side and stroking itself again, palm and back, on his thigh. The sound of the saw snores steadily into the room. Pa breathes with a quiet, rasping sound, mouthing the snuff against his gums. God's will be done, he says. Now I can get them teeth. Jewel's hat droops limp about his neck, channeling water onto the soaked toe sack tied about his shoulders, as, ankle deep in the running ditch, he cries with a sleeping tooth, with a piece of rotting log for fulcrum at the axle. Jewel, I say. She is dead, Jewel. Al Bundren is dead. Vardaman. Then I begin to run. I run farther back and come to the edge of the porch and stop. Then I begin to cry. I can feel where the fish was in the dust. It is cut up into pieces of not fish now, not blood on my hands and overalls. Then it wasn't perfect. It had a door. And now she is getting so far ahead, I cannot catch her. The trees look like chickens when they ruffle out into the cool dust on the hot days. If I jump off the pole, I will be where the fish was. And it all cut up into not fish now. I can hear the bed and her face and them, and I can feel the floor shake when he walks on it. They came and did it. They came and did it when she was all right, but he came and did it. The fat son of a bitch. I jump from the porch, running. The top of the barn comes swooping up out of the twilight. If I jump, I can go through it like the pink lady in the circus, into the warm smelling, without having to wait. My hands grab at the bushes. 
beneath my feet the rocks and dirt go rubbling down. Then I can breathe again in the warm smelling. I enter the stall, trying to touch him, and then I can cry, then I vomit the crying. As soon as he gets through kicking, I can, and then I can cry, the crying can. He killed her! He killed her! The life in him runs under the skin, under my hand, running through the splotches, smelling up into my nose where the sickness is beginning to cry, vomiting the crying, and then I can breathe, vomiting it. It makes a lot of noise. I can smell the life running up from under my hands, up my arms, and then I can leave the stall. I cannot find it. In the dark, along the dust, the walls, I cannot find it. The crying makes a lot of noise. I wish it wouldn't make so much noise. Then I find it in the wagon shed, in the dust, then I run across the lot and into the road, the stick dancing on my shoulder. They watch me as I run up, beginning to jerk back, their eyes rolling, snorting, jerking back on the hitch rein. I strike. I can hear the stick striking. I can see it hitting their head, the breast yoke, missing altogether sometimes as they rear and plunge. But I am glad. You killed my maw! The stick breaks, they rearing and snorting, their feet popping loud on the ground, loud because it is going to rain and the air is empty for the rain. But it is still long enough. I run this way and that as they rear and jerk at the hitch rein, striking. You killed her! I strike at them, striking, they wheeling in a long lunge, the buggy wheeling onto two wheels and motionless, like it is nailed to the ground, and the horses motionless like they are nailed by the hind feet to the center of a whirling plate. I run in the dust. I cannot see, running in the sucking dust where the buggy vanishes tilted on two wheels. I strike, the stick hitting into the bouncing, striking into the dust, and then into the air again, and the dust sucking on down the road faster than if a car was in it. And then I can crawl, looking at the stick. It is broken down to my hand, not longer than stove wood that was a long stick. I feel away, and I can cry. It does not make so much noise now. The cow standing in the barn door, too. When she sees me come into the lot, she lows. Her mouth full of flopping green. Her tongue flopping. I ain't a-going to milk you. I ain't a-going to do nothing for them. I hear her turn when I pass. When I turn, she is just behind me with her sweet, hot, hard breath. Didn't I tell you I wouldn't? She nudges me, snuffing. She moans deep inside, her mouth closed. I jerk my hand, cursing her like Jewel does. Get now. I stoop my hand to the ground and run at her. She jumps back and whirls away and stops watching me. She moans. She goes on to the path and stands there, looking up the path. It is dark in the barn, warm, smelling, smelling. I can cry quietly, watching the top of the hill. Cash comes to the hill, limping where he fell off of the church. He looks down at the spring, run up the road and back toward the barn. He comes down the path stiffly and looks at the broken hitch chain and at the dust in the road and then up the road, where the dust is gone. I hope they'll run clean past two by now. I so hope it. Cash turns and looks up the path. Turn him. I showed him. Turn him. I am not crying now. I am not anything. Dewey Dell comes to the hill and calls me. Vardaman. I am not anything. I am quiet. You, Vardaman. I can cry quiet now, feeling and hearing my tears. Won't it won't. It hadn't happened then. It was a laying right there on the ground. And now she's getting ready to cook it. In the dark, I can hear wood. Silence. I know them. But not living sounds, not even him. It is as though the dark were resolving him out of his integrity into an unrelated scattering of components. Snuffings and stampings. Snuffings and calls. An ammoniac hair. An illusion of a coordinated whole of splotched hide and strong bones within which, detached and secret and familiar, and is different from my is. I see him dissolve. Legs. A rolling eye. A gaudy splotching like cold flames. And float upon the dark in a fading solution. All one, yet neither. All either, yet none. I can see hearing coil toward him, caressing, shaping his hard shape. Setlock, hip, shoulder and head. I'm not afraid. Cooked in it. Cooked in it. Do we know? He could do so much for me if he just wanted. He could do everything for me. It's like everything in the world for me is in some tubs of guts. So that you wonder how there can be any room in it for anything else very important. He's a big tub of guts and I'm a little tub of guts. And if there is not any room for anything else important in a big tub of guts, how can it be room in a little tub of guts? But I know it is there because God gave women a sign when something has happened bad. It's because I'm alone. If I could just feel it, it would be different. Because I would not be alone. But if I were not alone, everybody would know it. And he could do so much for me, and then I would not be alone. Then I could be all right alone. I would let him come in between me and Leif, like the moon came in between me and Leif, and so Leif is alone too. He is Leif, and I am Dewey Bell, and when Mother died, I had to go beyond and outside of me and Leif and Bell to grieve, because he could do so much for me he don't know it. He don't even know it. From the back porch I cannot see the barn. Then the sound of Cash's sawing comes in from that way. It is like a dog outside the house, going back and forth around the house to whatever door you come to, waiting to come in. He said I worry more than you do, and I said, you don't know what worry is, so I can't worry. I tried to, but I can't think long enough to worry. I like the kitchen lamp. The fish, cut into jagged pieces, lays quietly in the pan. I put it into the cupboard quick, using it into the hole, hearing. It took her ten days to die. Maybe she don't know it is yet. Maybe she won't go until cash. Or maybe until jewel. I take the dish of greens from the cupboard and the bread pan from the cold stove, and I talk, watching the door. Where's Vardaman? Cash says. And the lamp, his sawdust at arms, look like sand. I don't know, I ain't seen him. He bought his team, run away. See if you can find Vardaman. The horse will let him catch him. Wait, take the computer. I cannot see the barn. I said, I don't know how to worry. I don't know how to cry. I tried, but I can't. 
After a while, the sound of the saw comes around, coming back along the ground in the dead dark. Then I can see him, going up and down above the plank. You come in to supper, I say. Tell him. He could do everything for me, and he don't know it. He is his guts, and I am my guts, and I am Rafe's guts. That's it. I don't see why he didn't stay in town. We are country people, not as good as town people. I don't see why he didn't. Then I can see the top of the barn. The cow stands at the foot of the path, lowing. When I turn back, Cash is gone. I carry the buttermilk in. Pa and Cash in here at the table. Where's the big fish, Bud called, sister? He says. I set the milk on the table. I never had no time to cook it. Plain turnip greens is mighty spindling eaten for a man my size, he says. Cash is eaten. About his head, the pink of his hat is splintered into his hand. His shirt is blotched with sweat. He has not washed his hands and arms. You ought to took time, Pa says. Where's Vardaman? I go toward the door. I can't find him. Here, sister, he says. Never mind about the fish. It'll save, I reckon. Come on and sit down. I ain't minding it, I say. I'm going to milk before it sits in the rain. Paul helps himself and pushes the dish on, but he does not begin to eat. His hand half closed on either side of his plate. His knees bowed a little. His awry hair standing into the lamplight. He looks as if the mother is the steer and it no longer alive and don't yet know that it is dead. But Cash is eating and he is too. You better eat something, he says. He is looking at Paul. Like Eric and me. You'll need it. Aye, Pa says. He rises up like a steer that's been kneeling in a pond and you run at it. She would not begrudge me it. When I'm outside of the house, I go fast. The cow lows at the foot of the bluff. She nuzzles at me, snuffing, blowing her breath in a sweet, hot blast through my dress against my hot nakedness, moaning. You got to wait a little while, then I'll tend to you. She follows me into the barn where I set the bucket down. She breathes into the bucket, moaning. I told you, you just got to wait more. I got more to do than I can tend to. The barn is dark. When I pass, he kicks the wall a single blow. I go on. The broken plank is like a pale plank standing on end. Then I can see the smoke, feel the air moving on my face again. Pale as a I'm empty seeing. The pine crumbs blotched up the tilted slope, secret and waiting. The cow, in silhouette against the door, nuzzles at the silhouette of the bucket, moaning. Then I pass the stall. I have almost passed it. I listen to it, saying for a long time before it can say the word, and the whistling turns full and the time point. I feel my body, my bones and flesh beginning to part and open upon the alone, and the process of coming unalone is terrible. Leif. 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 I lean a little forward, one foot advanced with dead walking. I feel the darkness rushing past my breast, past the cow. I begin to rush upon the darkness, but the cow stops me, and the darkness rushes upon the sweet bark of her moaning breath, filled with wood and with silence. Vardaman. You, Vardaman. He comes out of the stall. You darn little sneak. You darn little sneak. He does not resist. The last of rushing darkness flees, whistling away. What? I ain't done nothing. You darn little sneak. My hands shake him hard. Maybe I couldn't stop them. I didn't know they could shake so hard. They shake both of us, shaking. I never done it, he says. I never touched them. My hands stop shaking him, but I still hold him. What are you doing here? Why didn't you let me call you? I ain't doing nothing. You go on to the house and get your supper. He draws back. I'll hold him. You quit now. You leave me be. What were you doing down there? You didn't come down here to sneak after me? I never. I never. You quit now. I didn't even know you was down here. You leave me be. I hold him. Lean down to see his face. Feel it with my eyes. He's about to cry. Go on now. I don't put supper on, and I'll be there as soon as I milk. You better go on before he eats everything up. I hope that team runs clean back to Jefferson. He killed her, he says. He begins to cry. Hush. She never hurt him, and he come and killed her. Hush. He struggles. I hold him. Hush. He killed her. The cow comes up behind us, moaning. I shake him again. He's sick now. I'm pregnant. You're fit. And then you can't go to town. You go on to the house and eat your supper. I don't want no supper. I don't want to go to town. We'll leave you here then. Listen, you behave. We will leave you. Go on now. Before that old green eating tub of guts eats everything up from you. He goes on, disappearing slowly into the hill. The crest, the trees, the roof of the house stand against the sky. The cow nuzzles on me, moaning. You'll just have to wait. What you got in you ain't nothing to what I got in me, even if you are a woman too. She follows me, moaning. Then the bone don't pale and breathes on my face again. He could fix it all right if he just would. But I don't know it. He could do everything for me if he just knowed it. The cow breathes me in my lips. Her breath warm, sweet, stirrers, moaning. The sky lies flat down the floor, upon the secret clumps. Beyond the world, the sea and the and fades. The dead air shapes the dead earth in the dead darkness. Further away than the seeing, shapes the dead earth. It lies dead and warm upon me, touching me naked from my clothes. I said, you don't know what worry is. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether I'm worrying or not. Whether I can or not. I don't know whether I can cry or not. I don't know whether I have tried to or not. I feel like a wet sea wild in the hot, blind earth. Vardaman. When they get it finished, they are going to put her in it, and then for a long time, I couldn't stand it. I saw the dog stand up and go whirling away, and I said, are you going to nail her up in it, Cash? 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 I got shut up in the crib, then you do it up before me. It would shut. I couldn't breathe because the rat was breathing up all the while. I said... Are you going to nail it shut, Cash? Nail it? Nail it? Pa walks around. His shadow walks around over Cash going up and down above the saw at the bleeding plank. Do do. The train is behind the glass, red on the track. When it runs, the track shines on and off. Pa said flour and sugar and coffee cost so much. Because I am a country boy, because boys in town. 
popsicles. Why do flour and sugar and coffee cost so much when he's a country boy? Wouldn't you rather have some bananas instead? Bananas are gone. Eaten. <laughs> when it runs on the track, shines again. Why ain't I a town boy, Pa? I said. God made me. I did not say to God to make me in the country. If he can make the train, why can't he make them all in the town because flour and sugar and coffee? Wouldn't you rather have bananas? He walks around. His shadow walks around. It was not her. I was there looking. I saw. I thought it was her, but it was not. It was not my mother. She went away when the other one lay down in her bed and drew the coat out. She went away. Did she go as far as town? She went further to town. Did all those birds and possums go further than town? God made the rabbits in the country. He made the train. Why must he make a different place for them to go if she is just like the rabbit? Pa walks away. His shadow does. The saw sounds like it is. And so if Cash nails the box, she is not a rabbit. And so if she is not a rabbit, I couldn't breathe in the crib and Cash is going to nail it up. And so if she lets him, it is not her. I know. I was there. I saw when it did not be her. I saw. They think it is, and Cash is going to nail it up. It was not her, because it was laying right yonder in the dirt. It's all chopped up. I chopped it up. It's laying in the kitchen in a bleeding pan, waiting to be cooked in it. No, it wasn't, and she was. And now it is, and she wasn't. And tomorrow, it will be cooked and et, and she will be him and Pa and Cash and Dewey Dell, and there won't be anything in the box, and so she can breathe. It was laying right yonder on the ground. I can get Vernon. He was there, and he seen it. And with both of us, it will be, and then it will not be. Tall. It was not at midnight, and it had set in to rain when he woke us. It had been a misdoubtful night, with the storm making. A night when a fellow looks for most anything to happen before he can get the stock fed and himself to the house and supper at and in bed with the rain starting. And when people soon come up, naked, with the broke heart dragging and the neck yoke and kicks the off creature's legs, Cora says, it's Addie Bundren. She's gone at last. Peabody might have been to air one of a dozen houses hereabouts, I says. Besides, how do you know it's Peabody's team? Well, ain't it? She says. You hitch up now. What for, I says. If she's gone, we can't do nothing till morning. And it's it. It's my duty, she says. You put the team in. But I wouldn't do it. It's their reason they'd send for us if they needed us. You don't even know she's gone yet. Why, don't you know that's Peabody's team? Do you claim it ain't? Well, then. But I wouldn't go. When folks wants a fellow, it's best to wait till they sends for him, I found. It's my Christian duty, Peter says. Will you stand between me and my Christian duty? You can stay there all day tomorrow if you want, I says. So the car waked me and it set into rain. Even while I was going to the door with the lamp and it shining on the glass so he could see I am coming, it kept on knocking. Not loud, but steady. Like he might have gone to sleep thumping. But I never noticed how low down on the door the knocking was till I opened it and never seen nothing. I held the lamp up, with the rain sparkling across it and Cora back in the hall saying, Who is it, Vernon? But I couldn't see nobody at all at first until I looked down and around the door, lowering the lamp. He looked like a drowned puppy, in them overalls, without no hat, splashed up to his knees where he'd walked them four miles in the mud. Well, I'll be derned, I says. Who is it, Vernon? Cora says. He looked at me, his eyes round and black in the middle like when you throw a light in an owl's face. You mind that your fish? He says. Come in the house, I says. What is it? Cora says. He stood down the lane behind the door in the dark. The rain was blowing all through the lamp, hissing on it, so I'm scared every minute it'll break. You was there, he says. You seen it. Then Clara come to the door. You come right in out in the rain, she says, pulling him in and him watching me. He looked just like a drowned puppy. I told you, Cora says. I told you it was a man. You go and hitch. But he ain't said, I says. He looked at me, dripping onto the floor. She's a ruin in the rug, Cora says. You go get the tea and I'll take him to the kitchen. But he looked pink, dripping, watching me with him eyes. You was there. You seen it laying there. Cash is fixing to nail her up, and it was laying right there on the ground. You seen it. You seen the mark in the dirt. The rain never come up till after I was coming here. So we can get back in time. I'd be darned if it didn't give me the creeps. He didn't know yet. And Cora did. You get that too quick as you can, she says. He's out in his head with grief and worry. I'd be darned if it didn't give me the creeps. Now and then a fellow gets to thinking about all the sorrow and afflictions in this world, how it's liable to strike anywhere, like lightning. I reckon it does take a powerful truth in the Lord to God, fellow. Though sometimes I think the chorus are mighty overcautious, like she was trying to call the other folks away and get in closer than anybody else. But then when something like this happens, I reckon she is right, and you've got to keep after it, and I reckon I am blessed in having a wife that ever strives for sanctity and well-doing like she says on them. Now and then a fellow gets to thinking about it. Not often, though, which is a good thing. For the Lord aimed for him to do and not to spend too much time thinking, because his brain is like a piece of machinery. It won't stand a whole lot of racking. It's best when it all runs along the same, doing the day's work and not no one part used no more than needful. I have said, and I say again, that's ever living thing of the matter with God. He just thinks by himself too much. Cora's right when she says all he needs is a wife to straighten him out. When I think about that, I think that if nothing but being married will help a man, he's darn nigh hopeless. But I reckon Cora's right when she says the reason the Lord had to create women is because man don't know his own good when he sees it. When I come back to the house with the team, they was in the kitchen. She was dressed on top of her nightgown, with a shawl over her head, and her umbrella on a Bible wrapped up in the oilcloth, and him sitting on an upturned bucket on the stove where she put him, tripping off the floor. 
I can't get nothing out in him except about a fish, she says. It's a judgment on them. I see the hand of the Lord upon this poor, but am thundering's judgment and warning. The rain never come up till after I left, he says. I had to I was on the way. And so it was there in the dust. You seen it. Cursed stuff. But you seen it. When we got there, it was raining hard, and him sitting on the feet between us, wrapped up in Cora's shawl. He hadn't said nothing else, just sitting there with Cora holding the umbrella over him. Now and then Carrie would sing long enough to say, It's a judgment on Ange Bundren. May it show him the path of sin he is a trodden. Then she would sing again, and him sitting there between us, leaning forward a little like the mules couldn't go fast enough to suit him. It was blowing right yonder, he says. But the rain come up after I take it left. So I can go and open the windows, because Cash ain't nailed her yet. It was long past midnight when we drove the last nail, and almost dusk dawn when I got back home and taken the team out and got back in bed, with Cora's nightcap laying on the other pillow. And be darned if even then it wasn't like I could still hear Cora singing and feel that boy leaning forward between us like he was ahead of the mules, and still see Cash going up and down with that saw, and Aunt standing there like a scarecrow, like he was a steer standing knee deep in a pond, and somebody come by and set the pond up on edge, and he ain't missed it yet. It was night toward midnight when we drove the last nail and towed it into the house, where she was laying on the bed with the window open and the rain blowing on her again. Yes, he did it. And him so dead for sleep that Cora says his face looked like one of these here Christmas masts that had done been buried a while and then dug up, until at last they put it into it and nailed it down so he couldn't open the window anymore no more. And the next morning they found him in his shirt tail, laying a few on the floor with his gun deer, and the top of the box board clean full of holes, and Cash's new auger broke off in the last one. When they'd taken the lid off, they found the two of them had bored onto a floor. If it's a judgment, he ain't right. Because the Lord's got more to do than that. He's bound to have. Because the only burden Aunt Bundren's ever had is himself. And when folks talk to him, I think to myself, he ain't that less of a man, or he couldn't have bore himself this long. But he ain't right. I'll be darned if it is. Because he said, suffer little children to come unto me, don't make it right neither. Cleo said, I have bore you what the Lord God sent me. I faced it without fear nor terror, because my faith was strong in the Lord, a bolstering and sustaining me. If you have no son, it's because the Lord has decreed otherwise in his wisdom. And my life is and has ever been an open book to all man or woman among his creatures, because I trust in my God and my reward. I reckon she's right. I reckon if there's ever a man or woman anywhere that he could turn it all over to and go away with his mind at rest, it would be Cora. And I reckon she would make a few changes, no matter how he was running it. And I reckon they would be for man's good. Leastways, we would have to like him. Leastways, we might as well go on and make like we did. Darl. The lantern sits on a stump, rusted, respiled. It's constantly smeared with crystalline with a story in its largest good. It sheds a feeble and sultry glare upon the trestles and the boards and the adjacent earth. Upon the dark ground, the chips smeared with a pale paint on a black canvas. The boards look like long, smooth tatters torn from the flat darkness and turned backside out. Cash labors under the trestles, moving back and forth, lifting and placing the planks with long, clattering reverberations in the dead air, as though he were lifting and dropping them at the bottom of an invisible well, the sounds ceasing without departing, as if any movement might dislodge them from the immediate air in reverberant repetition. He saws again, his elbow flashing slowly, a little clover. Lost and recovered at the top and bottom of each stroke in unbroken elongation, so that the saw appears to be six feet long, into and out of Paul's shabby and aimless silhouette. Give me that plank, Cash says. No, the other one. He puts the saw down and comes and picks up the plank he wants, sweeping paw away with the long, swinging gleam of the balanced board. The air is like Upon the impalpable plane of it, their shadows form as upon a wall, as though like sound, they had not gone very far away and falling, but had merely congealed for a moment, immediate and musing. Paul's works on, half turned into the feeble light, one thigh and one pole thin arm braced, his face sloped into the light with a rapt, dynamic immobility above his tireless elbow. Below the sky, sheet lightning slumbers lightly. Against it, the trees, motionless, are ruffled out to the last twig, swollen, increased, as though quick with young. It begins to rain. The first harsh, sparse, swift drops rush through the leaves and across the ground in a long sigh, as though of relief from intolerable suspense. They are big as buckshot, warm as though fired from a gun. They sweep across the lantern in a vicious hissing. Pa lifts his face, slack mount, the wet black rim of snuff plastered close along the base of his gums. From behind his slack-faced astonishment, he muses, as though from beyond time, upon the ultimate outrage. Cash looks once at the sky, then at the lantern. The saw has not faltered, the running gleam of its pistoning edge unbroken. Get something to cover the lantern, he says. Pa goes to the house. The rain rushes suddenly down, without thunder, without warning of any sort. He is swept onto the porch upon the edge of it, and in an instant passes wet to the skin. Yet the motion of the saw has not faltered, as though it and the arm functioned in a tranquil conviction that rain was an illusion of the mind. Then he puts down the saw and goes and crouches above the lantern, shielding it with his body, his back shaped lean and scrawny by his wet shirt, as though he had been abruptly turned wrong side out, shirt and all. Pa returns. He is wearing Jewel's raincoat and carrying Dewey Dells. Squatting over the lantern, Cash reaches back and picks up four sticks and drives them into the earth and takes Dewey Dells' raincoat from Pa and spreads it over the sticks, forming a roof above the lantern. Pa watches him. I don't know what you'll do, he says. Dial taking his coat with him. Get wet, he says. He takes up the saw again. Again, it moves up and down, in and out of that unhurried imperviousness as a piston moves in the oil, soaked, scrawny, tireless, with the lean, light body of a boy or an old man. Pa watches him, blinking, his face streaming. Again, he looks up at the sky with that expression of dumb and brooding outrage, and yet of vindication, as though he looks... He stirs, moves, gaunt and streaming, picking up a board or a tool and then laying it down. 
Vernon Tull is there now, and Cash is wearing Mrs. Tull's raincoat, and he and Vernon are hunting the saw. After a while, they find it in Paul's hand. Why don't you go on to the house, out of rain, Cash says. Paul looks at him, his face streaming slowly. It is as though upon a place carved by a savage caricaturist, a monstrous burlesque of all bereavement flowed. You go on in, Cash says. Me and Vernon can finish it. Paul looks at them. The sleeves of Jewel's coat are too short for him. Upon his face, the rain streams, slow as cold glycerin. I don't begrudge her the wedding, he says. He moved again and falls to shifting the planks, picking them up, laying them down again carefully, as though they are glass. He goes to the lantern and pulls at the propped raincoat until he knocks it down, and Cash comes and fixes it back. You get into the house, Cash says. He leads Paul to the house and returns with the raincoat and folds it and places it beneath the shelter where the lantern sits. Vernon is off. He looks up, still sawing. You ought to done that at first, he says. You know it was fixing to rain. It's his fever, Cash says. He looks at the board. Ah, uh, Vernon says. You look on anyway. Cash squints at the board. On the long flank of it, the rain crashes steadily, myriad, fluctuant. I'm going to devil it, he says. It'll take more time, Vernon says. Cash sets the plank on edge. A moment longer, Vernon watches him. Then he hands him the pole. Vernon holds the board steady while Cash bevels the edge of it with the tedious and minute care of a jeweler. Mrs. Tull comes to the edge of the porch and calls Vernon. How near are you done? She says. Vernon does not look up. Not long. Some yet. She watches Cash stooping at the plank, the turgid savage gleam of the lantern slicking on the raincoat as he moves. You go down and get some planks off the barn and finish it, and come in out of the rain, she says. You'll both catch your death. Vernon does not move. Vernon, she says. We won't be long, he says. We'll be done after a spell. Mrs. Tull watches them a while. Then she re-enters the house. If we get in a tight, we could take some of them planks, Vernon says. I'll help you put them back. He squeezes the plank and squeezes them on the plank, wiping it with his palm. Give me the next one, he says. Sometime toward dawn the rain ceases, but it is not yet day when Cash drives the last nail and stands stiffly up and looks down at the finished coffin. The others go to him. In the lantern light his face is calm, musing. Slowly he strokes his hands on his raincoated thighs in a gesture deliberate, final, and composed. Then the four of them, Cash and Paw and Vernon and Peabody, raise the coffin to their shoulders. They turn toward the house. It is light, yet they move slowly. Empty, yet they carry it carefully. Lifeless, yet they move with hushed precautionary words to one another, speaking of it as though, complete, it now slumbered lightly alive, waiting to come awake. On the dark floor, their feet clump awkwardly, as though for a long time they have not walked on floors. They set it down by the bed. Peabody says quietly, Let's eat a snack. It's almost daylight. Where's Cash? He has returned to the trestles, stooping at the lantern's feeble glare as he gathers up his tools and wipes them on the cloth carefully and puts them into the box with his leather sling to go over the shoulder. Then he takes up box, lantern, and raincoat and returns to the house, mounting the steps into faint silhouette against the paling east. In a strange room, you must empty yourself for sleep. sleep. What are you? And when you were empty for sleep, you are not. And when you were filled with sleep, you never were. I don't know what I am. I don't know if I am or not. Jewel knows he is, because he does not know that he does not know whether he is or not. He cannot empty himself for sleep because he is not what he is, and he is what he is not. Beyond the unlamped wall, I can hear the rain shaping the wagon of his ours. The load that is no longer theirs that fell and suffered, nor yet theirs that bought it, and which is not ours either. Lie on our wagon though it does, since only the wind and the rain shape it only the jewel and me, that are honestly. And since sleep is, is not, and rain and wind are was, it is not. Yet the wagon is, because when the wagon is was, Addie Bundling will not be. And jewel is, so that Bundling must be. And then I must be, or I could not empty myself for sleep in a strange room. And still, if I am not empty yet, I am his. How often have I lain beneath rain on a strange roof, thinking of home? Cash. Unaided on the bevel. Number one, there is more surface for the nails to grip. Number two, there is twice the gripping to each seam. Number three, the water will have to seep into it on a slant. Water moves easiest up and down or straight across. Number four, in a house people are upright two-thirds of the time, so the seams and joints are made up and down, because the stress is up and down. Number five, in a bed where people lie down all the time, the joints and seams are made sideways, because the stress is sideways. Number six, except. Number seven, a body is not square like a cross tie. Number eight, Animal magnetism. Number nine, the animal magnetism of a dead body makes the stress come slanting, so that the coffin are made on the bevel. Number ten, you can do either. The earth sinks down on the bevel. Number eleven, while in a natural hold, it sinks by the center. The stress going up and down. Number twelve, so I made it on the bevel. Number thirteen, it makes a neater job. End of this three. My mother is a fish. Tull. It was ten o'clock when I got back. When Peabody's came hitched onto the back of the wagon, they'd already dragged the buckboard back from where Quick found it upside down, straddled at the ditch about a mile from the spring. It was pulled out of the road at the spring, and about a dozen wagons was already there. It was Quick found it. He said the river was up and still rising. He said it had already covered the highest water mark on the bridge pylon he had ever seen. That bridge won't stand a whole lot of water, I said. Somebody told Ants about it? I told him, Quick said. He says he reckons them boys has heard and unloaded and are on the way back by now. He says they can load up and get across. He better go on and bury her in the Armstead said. That bridge is old. I wouldn't monkey with it. His mind is set on taking her to Jefferson, Quick said. Then he better get at it soon as he can, Armstead said. Ants meets us at the door. He is shaved, but not good. There was a long cut on his jaw, 
and he's wearing his Sunday pants and a white shirt with the neckband buttoned. It is drawn, making it look bigger than ever, like a white shirt will. And it's different too. He looks folks in the eye now, dignified, his face tragic and composed, shaking us by the hand as we walk up onto the porch and stand out. A little stiff in our Sunday clothes, our Sunday clothes rustling, not looking full of him as he meets us. The Lord giveth, we say. The Lord giveth. That boy is not there. Peabody told about how he come into the kitchen, hollering, swarming, and clawing at Cora when he found her cooking that fish. And how do we Dell taking him down to the barn? My team all right? Peabody says. All right, I tell him. I'll give them a bait this morning. Your brother seems all right too. It ain't hurt. And no fault of somebody's, he says. I'd give a nickel to know where that boy was when that team broke away. If it's broke anywhere, I'll fix it, I'll say. The women folks go on into the house. We can hear them, talking and fanning. The fans go whish, 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 and them talking, and talking sounding kind of like bees murmuring in a water bucket. The men stop on the porch, talking some, not looking at one another. Howdy, Vernon, they say. Howdy, Ted. Looks like more rain. It does for a fact. Yes, sir, it will rain some more. We come up quick. And going away is slow. It don't fail. I go around to the back. Cass is filling up the hole, he bored in the top of it. He's trimming out plugs for them, one at a time, the wood wet and hard to work. He could cut up a tin can and hide the holes and nobody wouldn't know the difference. Wouldn't mind, anyway. I have seen him spend an hour trimming out a wedge, like it was glass he was working, when he could have reached around and picked up a dozen sticks and drove them into the joint and made it do. When we finished, I go back to the front. The men have gone a little piece from the house, sitting on the ends of the boards and on the sawhorses where we made it last night, some sitting and some squatting. Whitfield ain't come yet. They look up at me, their eyes asking. It's a bad, I say. He's ready to move. While they're getting up, I want we scrape our shoes again, careful, waiting for one another to go in first, milling a little at the door. Anne stands inside the door, dignified, composed. They had laid her in it reversed. Cash made it cock-shaped like this, with every joint and seam beveled and scrubbed with a plane, tight as a drum and neat as a sandbag. And they had laid her in it head to foot so it wouldn't crush her dress. It was her wedding dress, and it had a flare-out bottom. And they had laid her head to foot in it so the dress could spread out. And they had made her a veil out of a mosquito bar so the auger holes in her face wouldn't show. When we are going out, Whitfield comes. He is wet and muddy to the waist, coming in. The Lord comfort this house, he says. I was late because the bridge has gone. I went down to the old ford and swum my horse over, the Lord protecting me. His grace be upon this house. We go back to the trestles and plank ends and sit or squat. I knowed it would go, Armstead says. It's been there a long time, Daddy, a bridge, Quick says. The Lord has kept it there, you mean, Uncle Billy says. I don't know any man touched power to it in twenty-five years. How long has it been there, Uncle Billy? Quick says. It was built in. Let me see. It was in the year 1888, Uncle Billy says. I mind it because the first man to cross it was Peabody coming to my house when Jody was born. If I'd have crossed it every time your wife lit it since, it'd have been wore out long before this, Billy, Peabody says. We laugh, suddenly loud, then suddenly quiet again. We look a little side at one another. Lots of folks has crossed it that won't cross no more bridges, Houston says. It's a fact, Little John says. It's so. One morning, no ways, Armstead says. It'd take them two, three days to got her to town in the wagon. They'd be gone a week, getting her to Jefferson and back. What's Aunt so itching to take her to Jefferson for, anyway? Houston says. He promised her, I say. She wanted it. She come from there. Her mind was set on it. And Aunt's set on it, too, Quick says. Hey, Uncle Billy says. It's like a man that's let everything slide all his life to get set on something that will make the most trouble for everybody he knows. Well, it'll take the Lord to get her over that river now, he won't say. Aunt's can't do it. And I reckon he will, Quick says. He's took care of Aunt's a long time now. It's a fact, Little John says. Too long to quit now, Armstead says. I reckon he's like everybody else around here. Uncle Billy says. He's done it so long now, he can't get it. Cash comes out. He's put on a clean shirt. His hair wet, his comb smoothed down on his brow, smooth and black as if he had painted it onto his head. He squats stiffly among us. We watch him. You feeling this weather, ain't you? Armstead says. Cash says nothing. A broke bone always feels it, Little John says. A fellow with a broke bone can tell it a coming. Lucky Cash got off with left a broke leg, Armstead says. He might have hurt himself bedrid. How far do you fall, Cash? Twenty-eight foot, four and a half inches about, Tom says. I'll move over beside him. A fellow can show slip quick on wet planks, Quick says. It's too bad, I say, but you couldn't hope it. It's them darn women, he says. I made it to balance with her. I made it to her measure and weight. If it takes wet boards for folks to fall, it's fixing to be lots of falling before the spell is done. You couldn't hope it. It's the cotton and corn I mind. Neither does Peabody mind the folks falling. How about, Doc? It's a fact. Once clean out in the ground it will be. It seems like something is always happening to you. Of course it does. That's why it's worth anything. If nothing didn't happen, and everybody made a big crop, do you reckon it would be worth the wait? Well, I'd be darned if I'd like to see my work washed out in the rain. Work I sweat over. It's a fact. A fellow wouldn't mind seeing it washed up if he could just turn on the rain himself. Who's that man who can do that? Where is the color of his eyes? Hey, the Lord made it to grow. It's his'n to wash up if he sees it fitting so. 
You couldn't have hoped it, I say. It's them darn women, he says. In the hands, the women begin to sing. We hear the first line commence, beginning to swell as they take hold, and we rise and move toward the door, taking off our hats, throwing our shoes away. We do not go in. We stop at the steps, clumped, holding our hats between our lax hands in front or behind, standing with one foot advanced and our heads lowered, looking aside, down at our hats in our hands, and at the earth or now and then at the sky, and at one another's grave, composed face. The song ends. The voices quaver away with a rich and dying fall. Whitfield begins. His voice is bigger than him. It's like they are not the same. It's like he is one, and his voice is one, swimming on two horses side by side across the ford and coming into the house, the mud-splashed one and the one that never even got wet, triumphant and sad. Somebody in the house begins to cry. It sounds like her eyes and her voice were turned back inside her, listening. We move, shifting to the other leg, meeting one another's eye and making like they hadn't touched. Whitfield stops at last. The women sing again. In the thick air, it's like their voices come out of the air, flowing together and on in sad, comforting tunes. When they cease, it's like they hadn't gone away. It's like they had just disappeared into the air. And when we moved, we would loose them again out of the Orlando, sad and comforting. Then they finish, and we put on our hats, our movements stiff, like we hadn't never wore hats before. On the way home, Cora is still singing. I'm bounding toward my God and my reward, she sings, sitting on the wagon, the shawl around her shoulders and the umbrella open over her, though it is not raining. She has her, I'll say, wherever she went, she has her reward in being free of Aunt Spundren. She lay there three days in that box, waiting for Doll and Jewel to come clean back home and get a new wheel and go back to where the wagon was in the ditch. Take my tea, Nance, I said. We'll wait for Owen, he said. She, so, she was ever a particular woman. On the third day, they got back and they loaded her into the wagon and started and it already too late. You'll have to go all the way round by Samson's Bridge. It'll take you a day to get there. Then you'll be forty miles from Jefferson. Take my tea, Nance. We'll wait for Alan. She wanted so. It was about a mile from the house we saw him, sitting on the edge of the flue. It hadn't had a fish in it, never that I knowed. He looked around at us, his eyes round and calm, his face dirty, the pool across his knees. Cora was still singing. This ain't no good day to fish, I said. You come on home with us, and me and you'll go down to the river first thing in the morning and catch some fish. It's one of you, he said. Do we do? You come on with us. It's in here, he said. Do we dare seen it? I'm bounding toward my God and my reward, call it some. Darl, it's not your horse that's dead, Jewel. I see. He sits erect on the seat, leaning on the forward, wooden act. The brim of his hat is soaked free of the crown in two places, drooping across his wooden face, so that, head lowered, he looks through it, like through the visor of the moon. Looking all the faces. Shaping the invisible horse. See them? I say. High above the house, against the quick, thick sky, they hang in narrowing circles. From here they are no more than specks, impactful, patient, portentous. But it's not your horse that's dead. God damn you, he says. God damn you. I cannot love my mother because I have no mother. Jules' mother is a horse. Motionless, the tall bugger hang in soaring circles, the clouds giving them an illusion of retrograde. Motionless, wooden-backed, wooden horse. He shapes the horse in a rigid stoop like a hulk, but winged. They are waiting for us, ready for the moving of it, waiting for him. He enters the stall and waits until it kicks at him so that he can slip past and mount onto the trough and pause peering out across the intervening stall tops toward the empty path before he reaches into the loft. God damn you. God damn you. Cash. It won't balance. If you wanted to tow the ride on a balance, we will have pit up. God damn you, pit up. I'm telling you, it won't tow and it won't ride on a balance unless pit up. Pit up, god damn your thick-nosed soul to hell. Pick up. It won't balance. If they wanted to tow it and ride on a balance, they will have... He stoops above it, two of the eight hands. In his face, the blood goes in waves. In between them, his flesh is greenish-looking, about that smooth, thick, pale green of cow's cud. His face suffocated, furious, his lip lifted upon his teeth. Pick up, he says. Pick up, God damn your thick-nosed soul. He heaves, lifting one whole side so suddenly that we all spring into the lift to catch and balance it before he hurls it completely over. For an instant it resists, as though volitional, as though within it her pole-thin body clings furiously, even though dead, to a sort of modesty, as she would have tried to conceal a soiled garment that she could not prevent her body soiling. Then it to Rising suddenly, as though the emaciation of her body had added buoyancy to the planks, or as though, seeing that the garment was about to be torn from her, she rushes suddenly after it in a passionate reversal that flanks its own desire and need. Jewel's face goes completely green, and I can hear teeth in his breath. We carry it down the hall, our feet harsh and clumsy on the floor, moving with shuffling steps, and through the door. Steady it a minute now. Let it go. He turns back to shut and lock the door, but Jewel will not wait. Come on, he says in that suffocating voice. <laughs> we lower it carefully down the steps. We move, balancing it as though it were something infinitely precious. Our face breathing through our teeth to keep our nostrils closed. We go down the path, toward the slope. We better wait, Gus says. I tell you, it ain't balanced now. We'll need another hand on that hill. Then turn loose, Jewel says. He will not stop. Cash begins to fall behind, hobbling to keep up, breathing harshly. Then he's beat, and Jewel carries the entire front end alone, so that, tilting as the path begins to slant, it begins to rush away from me and slip down the air like a sled upon invisible snow, smoothly evacuating atmosphere in which the sense of it is still shaped. 
Wake you? I say, but he will not wake. He is almost running now, and can't his by him. It seems to me that the end which I now carry alone has no weight, as though it coasts like a rushing straw upon the furious tide of Jules' despair. I am not even touching it, when, turning, he lets it overshoot him, swinging, and stops it and sloughs it into the wagon bed, in the same motion, and looks back at me, his face suffused with fury and despair. God damn you! God damn you! Vardaman. We are going to town. Dewey Dell says it won't be sold because it belongs to Santa Claus, and he's taking it back with him until next Christmas. Then it will be behind the glass again, shining with waiting. Pa and Cash are coming down the hill, but Jewel is going to the barn. Pa says, Jewel does not stop. Pa says, but Jewel does not stop. You leave that horse here, Pa says. Jewel stops and looks at Pa. Jewel's eyes look like marble. You leave that horse here, Pa says. We'll all go in the wagon with Mumble and Mumble. But my mother is a fish. Vernon's seen it. He was there. Jewel's mother is a horse, Dar said. Then mine can be a fish, can it, Dar? I said. Jewel is my brother. Then mine will have to be a horse, too, I said. Why, Dar said. If Pa's your pa, why does your mother have to be a horse just because Jewel is? What does it? I said. What does it, Dar? Dar is my brother. Then what is your ma, Dar? I said. I haven't got ear one, Dar said. Because if I had one, it is was. And if it is one, it can't be is, can it? No, I said. Then I am not, Dar said. Am I? No, I said. I am. Dar is my brother. But you are, Dar, I said. I know it, Dar said. That's why I am not is. Are oh, is too many for one woman to fold. Cash is carrying his toolbox. He looks at him. I'll stop at toes on the way back, Cash says. Get on that barn roof. It ain't respectful, Paul says. It's a deliberate flouting of her and of me. Do you want him to come all the way back here and carry them up the toe of the foot? Dar says. Paul looks at him, his mouth chewing. Pa shaves every day now, because my mother is a fish. It ain't right, Pa says. Dewey Dell has the package in her hand. She has the package without dinner, too. What's that, Pa says. Mrs. Charles Cakes, Dewey Dell says, getting into the wagon. I'm taking them to town for her. It ain't right, Pa says. It's a flouting of the dead. It'll be there. It'll be there come Christmas, she says, shining on the track. She says he won't sell it to no town boys. Darl. He goes on toward the barn, entering a lock, wooden backed. Dewey Dell carries the basket on one arm, in the other hand something wrapped square in a newspaper. Her face is calm and sullen, her eyes brooding and alert. Within them, I can see Peabody's back, like two round keys and two thimbles. Perhaps in Peabody's back, two of those worms which work surreptitious and steady through you and out the other side, and you waking suddenly from sleep or from waking, without your acting expression sudden, intent and concerned. She sets the basket into the wagon and climbs in, her leg coming long from beneath her tightening dress, that lever which moves the world, one of that caliber which measures the length and breadth of life. She sits on the seat beside Vardaman and sets the parcel on her lap. Then he enters the barn. He has not looked back. It ain't right, Pa says. It's little enough for him to do for her. Go on, Cash says. Leave him stay if he wants. He'll be all right here. Maybe he'll go up to Tulls and stay. He'll catch us, I say. He'll cut across and meet us at Tulls Lane. He would have rid that horse, too, Holmes says, if I hadn't stopped him. The darn spotted critter wilder than a catamount. A deliberate flouting of her and of me. The wagon moves. The mule's ears begin to bob. Behind us, above the house, motionless in tall and soaring circles, they diminish and disappear. Ants. I told him not to bring that horse out of respect for his dead ma, because it wouldn't look right, him prancing along on a darn circus animal, and her wanting us all to be in the wagon with her that sprung from her flesh and blood. But we hadn't no more than passed Tall's knee when we were the road. Sitting back there on the plank seat with Cash, with his dead ma laying in a coffin at his feet, laughing. How many times I told him it's doing such things as that that makes folks talk about him, I don't know. I said, I got some regard for what folks says about my flesh and blood, even if you haven't. Even if I have raised such a darn passel of boys. And when you fix it so folks can say such about you, it's a reflection on your ma, I says, not me. I am a man, and I can stand it. It's on your women folks, your ma and sister, that you should care for. And I take a look back at him, and him sitting there laughing. I don't expect you to have no respect for me, I says, but with your own ma not cold in her coffin yet. Yonder, Cash says, jerking his head toward the lane. The horse is still a right smart piece away, coming up at a good pace, but I don't have to be told who it is. I just look back at Dar, sitting there laughing. I've done my best, I says. I tried to do as she would wish it. The Lord will pardon me and excuse the conduct of Grim, he sent me. And Dar, sitting on the plank seat right above her, where she was laying, laughing. Dar, he comes up the lane fast. Yet we are three hundred yards beyond the mouth of it when he turns into the road, the mud flying beneath the flicking drive of the hooves. And he slows a little, light and erect in the saddle, the horse mincing through the mud. Tall in his lot. He looks at us, lifts his hand. We go on, the wagon creaking, the mud whispering on the wheels. Vernon still stands there. He watches Jules passes, the horse moving with a light, high knee driving gait, three hundred yards back. We go on, with a motion so soporific, so dreamlike, as to be uninferent of progress, as though time and not space were decreasing between us and it. It turns off at right angles, the wheel marks last Sunday healed away now. A smooth, red scoriation curving away into the pines. A white with faded lettering. New Hope Church. 
three, and nine. It wheeled up like a motionless hand, lifted above the profound desolation of the ocean. Beyond it, the red road blazed like a spoke of which Addie Bundren is the rim. It wheels past, empty, unscarred. The white signboard turns away its fading and tranquil assertion. Cash looks up the road quietly, his head turning as we pass it, like an owl's head, his face composed. Pa looks straight ahead, humped. Dewey Dell looks at the road, too. Then she looks back at me, her eyes watchful and repudiant. Not like that question which was in those of Cash, or a smoldering file. The signboard passes. The unscarred road wheels on. Then Dewey Dell turns her head. The wagon creaks on. He spits over the wheel. In a couple of days now, it'll be smelling, he says. You might tell Jewel that, I say. He is motionless now, sitting the horse at the junction, upright, watching us, no less still than the signboard that lifts its fading capitulation opposite him. It ain't balanced right for no long ride, Cash says. Tell him that too, I say. The wagon creaks on. A mile further along, he passes us, the horse, arch-necked, reined back to a swift single foot. He sits lightly, poised, upright, wooden-faced, saddle, a broken hat raked at a swaggering angle. He passes us swiftly, without looking at us, the horse driving, its hooves, his hooves, his a gout of mud, back from cloth of the wheels. Cash leans forward and takes a tool from his box and removes it carefully. When the road crosses white leaf, the billows leaning near enough, he breaks off a branch and scours at the stain with the wet leaves. Hans. It's a hard country on man. It's hard. Eight miles of the sweat of his body washed up out in the Lord's earth, where the Lord himself told him to put it. Nowhere in this sinful world can an honest, hard-working man profit. It takes them that runs the stores in the towns, you and me, and all the men that sweats. It ain't the hard-working man, the farmer. It's because there is a reward for us above, where they can't take their autos and such. Every man will be equal there, and it will be taken from them that have, indeed to them that have not, by the Lord. But it's a long wait, seems like. It's bad that a fellow must earn the reward of his right doing by flouting himself in his dead. We drove all the rest of the day and got to Samson's at dusk dark, and then that bridge was gone too. They hadn't never seen the river so high, and it had not done raining yet. There was old men that hadn't never seen or hear of it being so in the memory of man. I am the children of the Lord, for who he loveth, so doeth he chastiseth. But I be damned if he don't take some curious ways to show it, seems like. But now I can get them teeth. That will be a comfort. It will. Samson. It was just before sundown. We were sitting on the porch when the wagon came up the road with the five of them in it, and the other one on the horse behind. One of them raised his hand, but they was going on past the store without stopping. Who's that? McCallum says. I can't think of his name. Rafe's twin. That one it was. It's thundering from down beyond New Hope, Quick says. There's one of them Snoke's horses, Jules Rabbit. I didn't know there was ever one of them horses left, McCallum says. I thought you folks down there finally contrived to give them all away. Try and get that one, Quick says. The wagon went on. A bit old man long never had to him, he says. No, Quick says. He bought it from Pappy. The wagon went on. They must not have heard about the bridge, he says. What are they doing up here anyway, McCallum says. Taking a holiday since he got his wife buried, I reckon, Quick says. Heading for town, I reckon, with Tull's bridge gone too. I wonder if they ain't heard about the bridge. They'll have to fly then, I says. I don't reckon there's a bridge between here and the mouth of Ishitawa. The sense of the new wagon. But Quick had been to the funeral three days ago, and we naturally never thought anything about it except that they were heading away from home mighty late, and that they hadn't heard about the bridge. You better holler at them, McCallum says. Damn it, the name is right on the tip of my tongue. So Quick hollered, and they stopped, and he went to the wagon and told them. He came back with them. They're going to Jefferson, he says. The bridge of Tulls is gone, too. Like we didn't know it, and his face looked funny, around the nostrils. But they just sat there, Bundren and the girl and the chap on the seat, and Cash and the second one, the one folks talks about, on a plank across the tailgate, and the other one on that spot of course. And I reckon they was used to it by then, because when I said to Pons that they'd have to pass by and we'll hope again, that what they'd better do, he just says, I reckon we can get there. I ain't much for meddling. Let every man run his own business to suit himself, I say. But after I talked to Rachel about them not having a regular man to fix her, and it being July and all, I went back down to the barn and tried to talk to Bundren about it. I'll give her my promise. I notice how it takes a lazy man, a man that hates moving, to get set on moving once he does get started off, the same as he was set on staying still. Like it ain't the moving he hates so much as the starting and the stopping. And like he would be kind of proud of whatever come up to make the moving or the setting still look hard. He sat there on the wagon, hunched up, blinking, listened to us tell about how quick the bridge went and how high the water was, and I'd be darned if he didn't act like he was pulling it, like he had made the river rise himself. You say it's higher than you ever see it before, he says. God's will be done, he says. I reckon it won't go down much by morning either, he says. You better stay here tonight, I says, before I start for New Hope tomorrow morning. I was just sorry for them bone gaunted mules. I told Rachel, I says, well, would you have had me turn them away at dark eight miles from home? What else can I do, I says. It won't be but one night, and they'll keep it in the barn, and they'll sure to get started by daylight. And so I says, you stay here tonight, and early tomorrow you can go back to New Hope. I got tools enough, and the boys can go on right after talking ready for If her eyes had been pistols, I wouldn't be talking now. I'd be dog if they didn't blaze at me. And so when I went down to the barn, I come on them, heard talking so she never noticed when I come up. You promised her, she says. She wouldn't go until you promised. She thought she could depend on you. If you don't do it, it will be a curse on you. Can't no man say I don't aim to keep my word, Bundren says. My heart is open to air man. I don't care what your heart is, she says. She was whispering, kind of, talking fast. You promised her. You've got to. You... Then she seen me and quit. Stand 
if they'd been pistols, I wouldn't be talking now. So when I talk to him about it, he says, I give him my promise, her mind is set on it. But it seems to me she'd rather have a mob very close by so she could, it's Addy I give the promise to, he says. Her mind is set on it. So I told them to drive it into the barn, because it was threatening and rainy blow, and that supper was about ready. Only they didn't want to come in. I thank you, Padre says. We wouldn't discommode you. We got a little something in the basket. We can make out. Well, I says, since you are so particular about your women folks, I am too. And when folks take you to one more time, it will come to the table. No one takes the answer insult. So the girl went on to the kitchen to help Rachel, and then Jewel come to me. She says, help yourself out in the loft. Feed him when you bake the mules. I'd rather pay you for him, he says. What for, I says. I wouldn't begrudge no man of eight for his horse. I'd rather pay you, he says. I thought he said extra. Extra for what, I says. Won't he eat hay and corn? Extra feed, he says. I feed him a little extra, and I don't want him to hold it to no man. You can't buy no feed for me, boy, I says. And if he can eat that loft clean, I'll help you load the barn onto the wagon in the morning. He ain't never been to hold it to no man, he says. I'd rather pay you for it. And if I had my rathers, you wouldn't be here at all, I wanted to say. But I just says, then it's high time he commenced. You can't bring no food for me. When Rachel put supper on, her and the girl went and fixed some beds. They wouldn't bring anything to me. over that sort of foolishness, I says. Because I got just as much respect for the dead as our man. But you've got to respect the dead themselves. And a woman that's been dead in a box four days, the best way to respect her is to get her into the ground as quick as you can. But they wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do that, Padre says. Of course, if the boys want to go to bed, I reckon I can set up with her. I don't begrudge her it. So when I went back down there, they were squatting on the ground around the wagon, all of them. Let that chap come to the house and get them sleep anyway, I says. And you better come too, I says to the girl. I wasn't aiming to interfere with them, and I surely hadn't done nothing to her that I knowed. He's done already asleep, Padre says. They had done put him to bed in the trough in an empty stall. Well, you come on then, I says to her. But still, she never said nothing. They just squatted there. You couldn't hardly see them. How about you, baby? You got a full day tomorrow. After a while, Claude says. I thank you. We can make out. We wouldn't be beholden, Bundren says. I thank you kindly. So I left them squatting there. I reckon after four days they was used to it. But Rachel wasn't. It's an outrage, she says. An outrage. What could he have done, I says. They gave her a promised word. Who's talking about him, she says. Who cares? She says, crying. I just wish that you and him and all the men in the world that torture us alive and flout us dead, dragging us up and down the country. Now, now, I says, you're upset. Don't you touch me, she says. Don't you touch me. A man can't tell nothing about them. I've lived with them for 15 years, and I'd be darned if I can. And I imagine a lot of things coming up between us. But I'd be darned if I ever thought it would be a body of four days dead, and that a woman. But they make life hard on them, not taking it as it comes up. So I lay there, hearing it commence to rain, thinking about them down there, squatting around the wagon in the rain on the roof. And thinking about Rachel crying there until after a while, it was like I could still hear her crying even after she was asleep, and smelling it even when I knowed I couldn't. I couldn't decide even then whether I could or not, or if it wasn't just knowing it was what it was. I heard them hitching up, and then they left. Take I went out the front and went down the road toward the bridge until I heard the wagon come out of the lot and go back toward New Hope. And then when I come back to the house, Rachel jumped on me because I wasn't there to make them come in to breakfast. You can't tell about them. Just about you decide they mean one thing. I'd be burned if you not only haven't got to change your mind, like as not you got to take a wall out and think they meant it. But it was still like I could smell it. And so I decided then that it wasn't smelling it, but it was just knowing it was there. Like you will get fooled now and then. But when I went to the pool, it was different. When I walked into the hallway, I saw something. It kind of hunkered up when I come in. I thought at first it was one of them got left. Then I saw what it was. It was a buzzard. It looked around me and saw me, and went on down the hall, straddle-legged, with its wings kind of hunkered out, walking in the first of the and then over the other, like an old, bald-headed man. When it got outdoors, it began to fly. It had to fly a long time before it ever got up into the air, with it thick and heavy and full of rain like it was. If they was bent on going to Jefferson, I reckon they could have gone around up by Mount Vernon, like McCallum did. He'll get home about day after tomorrow, horseback. Then they'd be over 14 miles from town. But maybe this bridge being gone too has learned him the Lord's sense and judgment. That McCallum. He's been trading with me off and on for 12 years. I have known him from a boy up. Know his name as well as I do my own. But be darned if I can say it. Do we, Dale? The soundboard comes in sight. It is looking out at the road now, because it can wait. New Hope 3 MI, it will say. New Hope 3 MI. New Hope, three MI. And then the road will begin. Carving away to the trees, empty. Saying New Hope, three miles. I heard that my mother was dead. I wish I had time to let her die. I wish I had time to wish I had. It is because in the wild and outraged earth, too soon, too soon, too soon. It's not that I wouldn't and will not. It's that it is too soon, too soon, too soon. Now it begins to say it. New Hope, three miles. New Hope, three miles. That's what they mean by the womb of time. The agony and the despair of spreading bones. The hard girdle in which the outraged entrails of events. Cash's head turned slowly as we approach, his pale, empty, sad, composed, and questioning face, following the red and empty curve. Beside the back wheel, Jewel sits on the horse, gazing straight ahead. The land runs out of girls' eyes. They swim to pinpoints. They begin at my feet and rise along my body to my face. And then my dress is gone. I sit naked on the seat above the unholy mules, above the travail. Suppose I tell him to turn. 
He will do what I say. Don't you know he will do what I say? Once I waked with the black void rushing under me. I could not see. I saw Vardaman rise and go to the window and strike the mouth into the fish. The blood gushing, hissing like steam, but I couldn't see. He'll do as I say. He always does. I can persuade him to anything. You know I can. Suppose I say, turn here. Thought was when I died that time. Suppose I do. We'll go to New Hope. We won't have to go to Tim. I rose and took the knife from the streaming fish, still hissing, and I killed Darl. When I used to sleep with Vardaman, I had a nightmare once. I thought I was awake, but I couldn't see and couldn't feel. I couldn't feel the bed under me, and I couldn't think what I was. I couldn't think of my name. I couldn't even think I am a girl. I couldn't even think I, nor even think I want to wake up, nor remember what was opposite to awake, so I could do that. I knew that something was past, but I couldn't even think of time. And all of a sudden, I knew that something was. It was wind blowing over me. It was like the wind came and blew me back from where it was. I was not. Blowing the room, and Vardaman asleep, and all of them back under me again, and going on like a piece of cool silk dragging across my naked legs. It blows cool out of the pines. A sad, steady sound. New hope. Was three am I. Was three am I. I believe in God. I believe in God. Why didn't we go to New Hope, Pa? Pardon me. Mr. Sampson said we was, but we don't pass the road. Daryl says, look, Jim. But he is not looking at me. He is looking at the sky. The buzzard is as still as if he were nailed to it. We turn into Tulflane. We pass the bar and go on. The wheels whispering in the mud, tossing the green rows of cotton in the wall earth, and Vernon Little across the field behind the plow. He lifts his hand as we pass and stands there looking after us for a long while. Look, Jewel, Daryl says. Jewel sits on his horse like they were both into the room, looking straight ahead. I believe in God. God. God, I believe in God. Tull. Most of their parents died taking the mule out and looped up the trench. They were sitting in the wagon at the end of the levee. The house was sitting there, looking at the bridge where it was slabbed down into the river with just the two ends inside. He was looking at it like he had believed all the time that folks had been lying to him about it being gone. But like he was hoping all the time it really was. Kind of pleased astonishment he looked, sitting on the wagon with his hungry parents, mumbling his mouth, looking like an uncurried horse dressed up. I don't know. The boy was watching the bridge where it was mid-sunk and logs and such drifted up over it, and it's swagging and shivering like the whole thing would go any minute. Big-eyed, he was watching it like he was to a circus. And the gal, too. When I come up, she looked around at me, her eyes kind of blaring up and going hard like I'd made to touch her. Then she looked at ants again, and then back at the water again. It was not up to the levee on both sides. The earth hid except for the tongue of it we was on going out to the bridge and then down into the water, and except for knowing how the road and the bridge used to look. I still couldn't tell where was the river and where the land. It was just a tangle of yellow, and the levee not less wider than a knife back kind of, with us sitting in the wagon and on the horse and the mule. Dar was looking at me, and then Cash turned and looked at me with that look in his eyes like when he was figuring on whether the planks would fit her that night, like he was measuring them inside of him and not asking you to say what you thought, and not even letting on he was listening if you did say it, but listening all right. He had moved. He sat there on the horse, leaning a little forward, with that same look on his face when him and Dar passed the house yesterday, holding it together. If it was just up, we could drive across, Aunt says. We could drive right on across it. Something the would get shoved over the jam and float on, rolling and turning, and we could watch it go on to where the ford used to be. It would slow up and whirl crossways and hang out of water for a minute, and you could tell by that that the ford used to be there. But that don't fit nothing, I say. It could be a wall of quicksand built up there. We watch the log. Then the gal is looking at me again. Mr. Whitfield crossed it, she says. He was a horseback, I say. And three days ago. It's been five foot since. If the bridge was just up, Aunt says. The log bobs up and goes on again. There's a lot of trash and foam, and you can hear the water. But it's down, Aunt says. Cash says, a careful fellow could walk across yonder on the planks and logs. But you couldn't take nothing, I say. Likely the time you set foot on that mess, it'll all go too. What do you think, Dar? He's looking at me. He don't say nothing. Just looks at me with them clear eyes of his and makes folks talk. I always say it ain't never been what he'd done so much, or said, or anything so much, as he looks at you. It's like he had got into the inside of you, some way. Like somehow he was looking at yourself, and your doings out in his eyes. Then I can feel that gal watching me, like I had made to touch her. She said something to Ants. Mr. Whitfield, she says. I give her my promised word in the presence of the Lord, Ants says. I reckon it ain't no need to worry. But still, he does not start the mules. We see there above the water. Another log bobs up over the jam and goes on. We watch it just and swing slow for a minute where the fall used to be. Then it goes on. It might start falling tonight, I say. You can lay over one more day. Then Jewel turns sideways on the horse. He's not moved until then. And he turns and looks at me. His face is kind of green. Then it would go red and then green again. Get the hell on back to your damn plowing, he says. Who the hell asked you to follow us here? I never meant no harm. I say. Shut up, Jewel. Hush. Jewel looks back at the water. His face gritted going red, and green, and then red. Well, Cash says after a while, what do you want to do? Ants don't say nothing. He sits humped up, mumbling his mouth. If it was just up, we could drive across it, he says. Come on, Jewel says, moving the horse. Wait, Cash says. He looks at the bridge. We look at him, except Ants and the gal. We look at the water. Do Dell and Vardman and Pa better walk across on the bridge, Cash says. Vernon can help them, Jewel says, and we can hit his mule ahead of ours. You ain't going to take my mule into that water, I say. Jewel looks at me. His eyes look like pieces of a broken plate. I'll pay for your damn mule. I'll buy it from you right now. My mule ain't going into that water, I say. Jewel's going to use his horse. Now, why won't you risk your mule, Vernon? 
Shut up, dog, Cash says. You and Jewel both. My mule ain't going into that water, I say. Donald. He sits the horse, glaring at Vernon, his lean face suffused up to and beyond the pale rigidity of his eyes. The summer when he was fifteen, he took a spell of sleeping. One morning, when I went to feed the mules, the cows were still in the tie-up, and I heard Paul go back to the house and call him. When we came on back to the house for breakfast, he passed us, carrying the milk buckets, stumbling along like he was drunk, and he was milking when we put the mules in and went onto the field without him. We had been there an hour, and still he never showed up. When Dewey Dell came with our lunch, Paul sent her back to find Jewel. They found him in the tie-up, sitting on the stool, asleep. After that, every morning Paul would go in and wake him. He would go to sleep at the supper table, and soon as supper was finished, he would go to bed. And when I came into bed, he would be lying there like a dead man. Yet still, Paul would have to wake him in the morning. He would get up, but he would hardly have half sense. He would stand for Paul's jawing and complaining without a word. He'd take the milk buckets and go to the barn, and once I found him asleep at the cow, the whole thing closed and half full, and his hands up to the wrists in the milk, and his head against the cow's flank. And I didn't have to be He still got up when Paul waked him, going about what we told him to do in that dazed way. It was like he was trying hard to do them, but he was as puzzled as anyone else. Are you sick? Master. Don't you feel all right? Yes, Jewel said. I feel all right. He's just lazy, trying me, Paul said. And Jewel, standing there, asleep on his feet like his knot. Ain't you? he said, waking Jewel up again to answer. No, Jewel said. You take off and stay in the house today, Ma said. With that whole bottom piece to be busted out? Pa said. If you ain't sick, what's the matter with you? Nothing, Jewel said. I'm all right. All right, Pa said. You're asleep on your feet this minute. No, Jewel said. I'm all right. I want him to stay at home today, Ma said. I'll need him, Pa said. He's tired enough with all of us to do it. You'll just have to do the best you can with Cash and Darl, Ma said. I want him to stay in today. But he wouldn't do it. I'm all right, he said, going home. But he wasn't all right. Anybody could see it. He was losing flesh, and I've seen him go to sleep shopping. Watched the hoe going slower and slower up and down, with less and less of an arc, until it stopped, and he leaning on it motionless in the hot shimmer of the sun. Ma wanted to get the doctor, but Pa didn't want to spend the money without it was needful. And Jewel did seem all right, except for his thinness and his way of dropping off to sleep at any moment. He ate hardy enough, except for his way of going to sleep in his plate, with a piece of bread halfway to his mouth and his jaws still chewing. But he swore he was all right. It was Ma that got Dewey Dell to do his milking, a little something, and the other chance. And doing them herself when Pa wasn't there. She would pick some special things to eat and hide them for him. And that may have been when I first found it out that Addie Bundren should be hiding anything she did, who would try to teach us that deceit was such that, in a world where it was, nothing else could be very bad or very important, not even poverty. And at times, when I went in to go to bed, she would be sitting in the dark by Jewel, where he was asleep, and I knew that she was hating herself for that deceit, and hating Jewel because she had to love him so, that she had to act the deceit. One night, she was taken sick, and when I went to the barn to put the team in and drive to Tull's, I couldn't find the lantern. I remembered noticing it on the nail the night before, but it wasn't there now at midnight. So I hitched in the dark, and went on and came back with Mrs. Tull just after daylight. And there the lantern was, hanging on the nail where I remembered it and couldn't find it before. And then one morning, while Dewey Dell was milking just before sunup, Jewel came into the barn from the back, through the hole in the back wall, with the lantern in his hand. I told Cash, but Cash and I looked at one another. Nothing, Cash said. Yes, I said. But why the lantern? And every night, too. No wonder he's losing flesh. Are you going to say anything to him? Not do any good, Cash said. What he's doing now won't do any good either. I know, but he'll have to learn that himself. Give him time to realize that it'll save, that there'll be just as much more tomorrow, and he'll be all right. I wouldn't tell anybody, I reckon. No, I said. I told Dewey Dell not to. Not Ma, anyway. No, not Ma. After that, I thought it was right comical. He acting so bewildered and willing and dead for sleep and gaunt as a beanpole, and thinking he was so smart with it. And I wondered who the girl was. I thought of all I knew that it might be, but I couldn't say for sure. Ain't any girl, Cash said. It's a daring in it somewhere. Ain't any young girl got that much daring and staying power. That's what I don't like about it. Why, I said. She'll be safer for him than a girl would. More judgment. He looked at me, his eyes fumbling, the words fumbling at what he was trying to say. It ain't always the safe things in this world, little fella. You mean the safe things are not always the best things? I'm best, he said, fumbling again. It ain't the best things, the things that are good for him. A young boy. A fellow kind of hates to see, wallowing in somebody else's mire. That's what he was trying to say. When something is new and hard and bright, there ought to be something a little better for it than just doing it. Since the safe things are just the things that folks have been doing so long, they have worn the edges off, and there's nothing to the doing of them that leads a man to say, that was not done before, and it cannot be done again. So we didn't tell, not even when after a while he'd appear suddenly in the field beside us and go to work, without having had time to get home and move out who'd been in bed all night. He would tell Ma that he hadn't been hungry at breakfast, or that he had eaten a piece of bread while he was hitching up the team. But Cash and I knew that he hadn't been home at all on those nights, and he had come up out of the woods when we got to the field. But we didn't tell. Something was almost over then. We knew that when the nights began to cool, she would be done, if he wasn't. But when fall came, and the nights began to get longer, the only difference was that he would always be in bed for Paul to wake him, getting him up at last in that first state of semi-idiocy like when it first started, worse than when he had stayed out all night. She's sure a stayer, I told Cash. I used to admire her, but I don't like respect her now. It ain't a woman, he said. You know, I said, but he was watching me. What is it, then? That's what I need to find out, he said. You can trail him to the woods all night if you want to, I said. I'm not. I ain't trailing him, he said. What are you talking about? I ain't he said. I don't mean it that way. And so a few nights later, I heard Jewel get up and him out the window, and then I heard Cash get up and follow him. The next morning, when I went to the barn, Cash was already there, the mule sped, and he was helping Dewey down milk. And when I saw him, I knew that he knew what it was. Now and then I would keep watching Jewel with a queer look. I hadn't found out where Jewel went and what he was doing had given him something to really think about at last. But it was not a worried look. 
It was the kind of look I would see on him when I would find him doing some of Jewel's work around the house, work that Paul still thought Jewel was doing and that Ma thought Dewey Dell was doing. So I said nothing to him, believing that when he got done digesting it in his mind, he would tell me. But he never did. One morning, it was November then, five months since it started, Jewel was not in bed, and he didn't join us in the field. That was the first time Ma learned anything about what had been going on. Disc four. That was the first time Ma learned anything about what had been going on. She sent Bardeman down to find where Jewel was, and after a while she came down too. It was as though, so long as the deceit read along quiet and monotonous, all of us let ourselves be deceived, abetting it unawares, or maybe through cowardice, since all people are cowards and naturally prefer any kind of treachery because it has a bland outside. But now, and I kind of tell all the people the whole thing down with covers on my head, and we all sitting bolt upright in our nakedness, staring at one another and saying, now is the truth. He hasn't come home. Something has happened to him. We let something happen to him. Then we saw him. He came up along the ditch, and then turned straight across the field, riding the horse. Its mane and tail were going, as though in motion they were carrying out the splotchy pattern of its coat. He looked like he was riding on a big pinwheel, bareback, with a rope bridle, and no hat on his head. It was a defendant of those Texas ponies Flem Snopes brought here twenty-five years ago, and auctioned off for two dollars a head, and nobody but old Lon Quick ever caught him, and still owned some of the blood, because he could never give it away. He galloped up and stopped, his heels in the horse's ribs, and it dancing and swirling like the shape of its mane and tail, and the splotches of its coat had nothing whatever to do with the flesh and bone horse inside him, and he sat there, looking at us. Where did you get that horse? Pa said. Bought it, Jewel said. From Mr. Quick? Bought it, Pa said. With what? Did you buy that thing on my word? It was my money, Jewel said. I earned it. You won't need to worry about it. Jewel, Ma said. Jewel. It's Cash said. He earned the money. He cleaned up the 40 acres of new ground quick laid out last spring. He did it single-handed, working at night by lantern. I saw him. So I don't reckon I was going to anybody anything. I don't reckon we need worry. Jewel, Ma said. Jewel. Then she said, You come back to the house and go to bed. Not yet, Jewel said. I ain't got time. I gotta get me a saddle and bridle. Mr. Quick says he... Jewel, Ma said. Looking at him. I'll give. I'll give. You. Then she began to cry. She cried hard, not hiding her face, standing there in a faded wrapper, looking at him, and him on the horse, looking down at her. <laughs> sick looking, until he looked away quick, and Cash came and touched her. You go on to the house, Cash said. This here ground is too wet for you. You go on now. She put her hands to her face then, and after a while she went on, stumbling a little on the plow marks. But pretty soon she straightened up and went on. She didn't look back. When she reached the ditch, she stopped and called on him. He was looking at the horse, kind of dancing up and down by it. Let me ride, Jewel, he said. Let me ride, Jewel. Jewel looked at him. Then he looked away again, holding the horse reined back. Pa watched him, mumbling his lip. So, you bought a horse? He said. You went behind my back and bought a horse. You never consulted me? You know how tight it is for us to make by. That you bought a horse for me to feed. Taken the work from your flesh and blood and bought a horse with it. Jewel looked at Pa, his eyes paler than ever. He won't never eat a mouthful of yours, he said. Not a mouthful. I'll kill him for you. Never mouthful. Let me ride, Jewel, Bartman said. Let me ride, Jewel. He sounded like a cricket in the grass, a little one. Let me ride, Jewel. That night, I found Ma sitting beside the bed where he was sleeping, in the dark. She cried hard. Maybe because she had to cry so quiet. Maybe because she felt the same way about tears she did about deceit. Hating herself for doing it. Hating him because he had to. And then I knew that I knew. I knew that as plain on that day as I knew about Dewey Bell on that day. Toe. So they finally got Ants to say what he wanted to do. And him and the gal and the boy got out of the wagon. But even when we were on the bridge, Ants kept on looking back. I thought maybe once he was out in the wagon, the whole thing would kind of blow up. And he would find himself back yonder in the field again. And her laying up there in the house, waiting to die. And it to be all over again. You ought to let them take in your mule, he says. And the bridge shaking and flying under us, going down into the moiling water like it went clean through to the other side of the earth. And the other end, coming up out in the water like it wasn't the same bridge at all. And the ground that would walk up out in the water on that side must come from the bottom of the earth. But it was still whole. You could tell that, by the way, when this end swagged. It didn't look like the other end swagged at all. Just like the other trees in the bank yonder were swinging back and forth slow, like on a big clock. And the logs scraping and bumping at the sunk part, and tilted the end up and, and clean out in the water, and tumbling on toward the feet. Slick, whirling, and foamy. What good would that have done, I said? If your team can't find a board and haul it across, what good would three mules or even ten mules do? I ain't asking it of you, he says. I can always do for me and mine. I ain't asking you to risk your mule. It ain't your dead. I'm not blaming you. They ought to went back and laid over until tomorrow, I says. The water was cold. It was thick, like slush on it. Only it kind of moved. One part of you knowed it was just water. The same thing that had been running under the same bridge for a long time. Yet when them logs would come spewing up out, you were not surprised that there was a part of water of the waiting and the threat. It was like when we was across, up out of the water again in the hard earth under us, that I was surprised. It was like we hadn't expected the bridge to end on another bank, on something tame like the hard earth again that we'd tromped on before this time, and knowed well. Like it couldn't be me here. It is bad. And to done what I'd just done. And when I looked back and saw the other bank, and saw my mule standing there where I used to be, and knew that I'd have to get back there some way, I knew it couldn't be, because I just couldn't think of anything that could make me cross that bridge ever even once. Yet here I was, and the fellow that could make himself cross it twice couldn't be me, not even if Cora told him to. It was that boy. I said, here. You better take a hold of my hand. And he waited and held to me. I'd be a if it wasn't like he'd come back and got me. Like he was saying, they won't nothing hurt you. 
Like he was saying about a fine place he knowed where Christmas come twice with Thanksgiving and lasts on through the winter and the spring and the summer. And if I just stayed with him, I'd be all right too. When I looked back at my mule, it was like he was one of these here spy glasses, and I could look at him standing there and see all the broad land and my house sweated out in it like it was the more the sweat the broader the land. The more the sweat, the tighter the house, because it would take a tight house for Cora to hold Cora like a jar of milk in the spring. You've got to have a tight jar, or you'll need a powerful spring. So if you have a big spring, why then you have the incentive to have tight, well-made jars? Because it is your milk, sour or not, because you would rather have milk that will sour than to have milk that won't, because you are a man. And him holding to my hand, his hand that hot and confident, so that I would like to say, look at here, can't you see that mule yonder? He never had no business over here, so he never come, not being nothing but a mule. Because a fellow can see ever now and then that children have more sense than him. But he'll like to admit it to them until they have beards. After they have a beard, they're too busy because they don't know if they'll ever quite make it back to where they were in sense before they was had. So you don't mind admitting them to folks that are worrying about the same thing that ain't worth the worry that you are yourself. Then we was over, and we stood there. You could cash turning the wagon around. We watched them drive back down the road to where the trail turned off into the bottom. After a while, the wagon was out of sight. We better get on down to the fort and get ready to help, I said. I give her my word, Aunt says. It is sacred on me. I know you'll begrudge it, but she will bless you in heaven. Well, they got to finish circumventing the land before they can dare the wall, he said. Come on. It's the turning back, he said. It ain't no luck in turning back. He was standing there, humped, mournful, looking at the empty road beyond the swagging and swaying bridge. And that gal, too, with the lunch basket under one hand and the package under the other, just going to town, bent on it. He had the fire and the earth and the water and all, just to eat a sack of bananas. You ought to lay over a day, I said. It would have fell some by morning. It might not have rained tonight, and it can't get no higher. I give my promise, he says. She is counting on it. Darl. Before us the thick, dark current rides. It talks up to us in a murmur becomes ceaseless and myriad. The yellow surface dimpled monstrously into fading swirls traveling along the surface for an instant, silent, impermanent, and profoundly significant, as though just beneath the surface. For a moment the blazing darkness round will fade into white slumber again. It clucks and murmurs among the spokes and about the mule's knees, yellow, scummed with flotsam, and with thick soiled gouts of foam, as though it had sweat, lathering like a driven horse. Through the undergrowth it goes with a plaintive sound, a musing sound. In it, the unwinded cane and saplings lean as before a little gale. Swaying without reflections, as though suspended on invisible wires from the branches overhead. Above the ceaseless surface they stand, trees, cane, vines, rootless, severed from the earth, spectral above the of immense, yet circumscribed desolation, filled with the voice of the waste and mournful water. Cash and I sit in the wagon. Jewel sits the horse at the off rear wheel. The horse is trembling, its, its breathing stertorous like groaning. He sits erect, poised, looking quietly and steadily and quickly this way and that, his face calm, a little pale, alert. Cash's face is also gravely composed. He and I look at one another with long, probing looks, looks that plunge unimpeded through one another's eyes and into the ultimate secret place, where for an instant, Cash and Donald crouch flagrant and unabashed in all the old terror and the old foreboding, alert and secret, and without shame. When we speak, our voices are quiet, detached. I reckon we're still in the road, all right. It's all taken and cut them two big white oaks. I heard tell how at high water, in the old days, they used to line up the ford by them trees. I reckon he did that two years ago when he was logging down here. I reckon he never thought that anybody would ever use this ford again. I reckon not. Yes, it must have been then. He cut us Most folks that logs in this here country, they need a darn good farm to support the sawmill, or maybe a store. But I reckon Vernon could. I reckon so. He's a... Aye, Vernon is. Yes, it must still be here. He never would have got that timber out of here if he hadn't cleaned out that old road. I reckon we are still on it. He looks about quietly, at the position of the trees, leaning this way and that, looking back along the floorless road shaped vaguely high in air by the position of the lopped and felled trees, as if the road, too, had been soaked free of earth and floated upward, to leave in its spectral tracing a monument to a still more profound desolation than this above which we now sit, talking quietly of old security and old, trivial things. Jewel looks at him. In, in that quiet, constant questing about the scene, the horse trembling quietly and steadily between his knees. He could go on ahead slow and sort of feel it out, I say. Yes, Cash says, not looking at me. His face is in profile as he looks forward where Jewel has moved on ahead. He can't miss the river, I say. He couldn't miss it if he wants to. Cash does not look at me. His face in profile. If I just suspicioned it, I could have come down last week and taken a sight on it. The bridge was up then, I say. He does not look at me. Whitfield crossed it a horseback. Jewel looks at us again, his expression silver and alert and subdued. His voice is quiet. What do you want me to do? I have to come down last week and take a study. Cash says. We couldn't have known, I say. There wasn't any way for us to know. I'll ride on ahead, Jewel says. You can follow where I am. He lifts the horse. It shrinks, loud. He leans to it, speaking to it, lifting the foot almost quietly, setting his feet down with gingerly splashings, trembling, breathing harshly. He speaks to it, murmurs to it. Go on, he says. I ain't gonna let nothing hurt you. Go on now. Jewel, Cash says. Jewel does not look back. He lifts the horse on. He can swim, I say. If you'll just give the horse time, anyhow. When he was born, he had a bad time of it. Ma would hold him on a pillow on her lap. We would wake him. There would be no sound from them. That pillow was longer than him, Cash says. He was leaning a little forward. I want to come down last week, I say. I say. 
now that his feet nor his head would reach the end of it. You couldn't have known, I say. I ought to have done it, he says. He lifts the reins. The mules move into the traces. The wheels murmur alive in the water. He looks back and down at Addie. Hang on the balance, he says. At last, the trees open. Against the open river, Jules sits the horse, half turned, with bum deep now. Across the river, we can see Vernon and Paul and Bartman and Dewey Dell. Vernon is waving at us, waving us further downstream. We are too high up, Kirk says. Vernon is shouting too, but we cannot make out what he says for the noise of the water. It runs steadily and deep now, unbroken, without sense of motion until a log comes along, turning slowly. Watch it, Kirk says. We walk it and see the water change in a moment, the current building up behind it in a thick wave, submerging it for an instant before it shoots up and tumbles on. There it is, I say. Aye, Cash says. It's there. We look at Vernon again. He is now flapping his arms up and down. We move on downstream, slowly and carefully, watching Vernon. He drops his hands. This is the place, Cash says. Well, God damn it, let's get across then, Jules says. He moves the horse on. You wait, Cash says. Jules stops again. Well, by God, he says. Cash looks at the water. Then he looks back at Addy. It ain't on a balance, he says. Then go on back to the goddamn bridge and walk across, Jules says. You and Darrell both. Let me on that wagon. Cash does not pay him any attention. It ain't on a balance, he says. Yes, we got to watch it. What's it? Jules says. You get out of that wagon and let me have it. Oh, God, if you're afraid to drive it over. His eyes are pale as two bleached chips in his face. Cash is looking at him. We'll get it over, he says. I tell you what you do. You ride on back and walk across the bridge and come down the other bank and meet us with the rope. Vernon will take your horse home with him and keep it till we get back. You go to hell, Jules says. You take the rope and come down the bank and be ready with it, Cash says. Three can't do no more than two can. One to drive and one to steady it. God damn you, Jules says. Let Jules take the end of the rope and cross upstream of us and brace it, I say. Will you do that, Jules? Jules watches me, hard. He looks quick at Cash, then back at me, his eyes alert and hard. I don't give a damn. Just so we do something. Set me and not lifting a goddamn hand. Let's do that, Cash, I say. I'll look and we'll have to, Cash says. And Paul and Vernon and Vernon and Dewey Dell are the only things in sight, not of that single monotony of desolation leaning with that terrific quality a little from right to left, as though we had reached the place where the motion of the wasted world accelerates just before the final precipice. Yet they appear dwarfed. It is as though the space between us were time and irrevocable quality. It is as though time, no longer running straight before us in a diminishing line, now runs parallel between us, like a looping stream, the distance between the of the of the breath, and not the interval between. The mules sound. Their forefooters already sloped a little, their rumps high. They too are breathing now with a deep groaning sound. Looking back once, their gaze sweeps across us, within their eyes a wild, sad, profound, and despairing quality, as though they had already seen in the thick water the shape of the disaster which they could not speak and we could not see. Cash turns back into the wagon. He lays his hands flat on Addie, rocking her a little. His face is pulled, downsloped, calculant, concerned. He lifts his box of tools and wedges it forward under the seat. Together we shove Addie forward, wedging her between the tools and the wagon bed. Then he looks at me. No, I say. I reckon I'll stay. Might take both of them. From the toolbox he takes his coiled rope and carries the end twice around the seat stanchion and passes the end to me without tying it. The other end he pays out to Jewel, who takes a turn about his saddle horn. He must force the horse down into the current. It moves, high-kneed, arch-necked, boring and chafing. Jewel sits lightly forward, his knees lifted a little. Again, his swift, alert, calm gaze sweeps upon us and on. He lowers the horse into the stream, speaking to it in a soothing murmur. The horse slips, surges to its feet again, the current building up against Jewel. Watch yourself, Cash says. He needed me, Jewel says. You can come ahead now. Cash takes the reins and lowers the team carefully and skillfully into the stream. I felt the current take us, and I knew we were on the ford by that reason, since it was only by means of that slipping contact that we could tell that we were in motion at all. What had once been a flat surface was now a succession of troughs and hillocks lifting and falling about us, shoving at us, teasing at us with light, lazy touches in the vain instance of solidity underfoot. Paul looked back at me, and then I knew that we were gone. But I did not realize the reason for the rope until I saw the log. It surged up out of the water and stood for an instant upright upon that surging and heaving desolation. Like Christ. Get out and let the current take you down to the bend, Cash said. You can make it all right. No, he said. I'd get just as wet that way as this. The log appears suddenly between two hills, as if it was just the bottom of the river. Upon the end of it, a long gown of fur hangs like the beard of an old man or a goat. When Cash speaks to me, I know that he has been watching it all the time, watching it and watching Jewel ten feet ahead of us. Let the rope go, he says. With his other hand, he reaches down and reaves the two turns from the stanchion. Right on, Jewel, he says. See if you can pull us ahead of the log. Jewel shouts at the horse. Again, he appears to lift it bodily between his knees. He is just a lord, and the horse has a of some sort, for it surges forward, shining wetly half out of water, crashing on in a six inches of inches. It moves on the lead fast. By that token, he will the walls, and the rope is free, for I can see him sawing back on the reins, his head turned, as the log rears in a long, sluggish lunge between us, bearing down upon the team. They see it, too. For a moment, they also shine black out of water. Then the downstream one vanishes, dragging the other with him. The wagon shears crosswise, poised on the crest of the ford as the log strikes it, tilting it up and on. Cash is half-turned, the reins running taut from his hand and disappearing into the water. The other hand reached back upon Addie, holding her jammed over against the high side of the wagon. Jump clear, he says quietly. Stay away from the team, and don't try to fight it. It'll swing you to the bend, all right. You come, too, I say. Vernon and Bartman are running along the bank. Pa and Dewey Dell stand watching us. Dewey Dell with the basket and the package of arms. Jewel is trying to fight the horse back. The head of one mule pulls. It's eyes wide. It looks back at us for an instant, making a sound almost human. The head vanishes again. Back, Jewel! Cash shouts. Back, Jewel! For another instant, I see him leaning to the tilting wagon, his arm braced back against Addie and his tools. I see the bearded head of the wheeling log strike up again, and beyond it, Jewel holding the horse upreared, its head wrenched around, hammering its head with his fist. 
I jump from the wagon on the downstream side. Between two hills, I see the mules once more. They roll up out of the water in succession, turning completely over. Their legs are stiffly extended as they drop contact with the earth. Vardaman. Cash tried, but she fell off. And Dara jumped, going under. He went under, and Cash hollering to cats. And I hollering, running, and hollering, and Dewey Dell hollering at me. Vardaman, you, Vardaman, you, Vardaman. And Vernon passed me because he was seeing her come up, and she jumped into the water again, and Dara hadn't caught her yet. He came up to see, and I hollering, catch her, doll, catch her. And he didn't come back because she was too heavy. He had to go on catching at her. And I hollering, catch her, doll, catch her, doll, because in the water she could go faster than a man. And doll had to grapple for her, so I knew he could catch her because he is the best grappler, even with the mules. And the way again they dived up, rolling their feet, stiff rolling down again, and their backs up now. And doll had to again because in the water she could go faster than a man or a woman. And I passed Vernon, and he wouldn't get in the water and help doll. He wouldn't grapple for her with doll. He knew, but he wouldn't help. The mules dived up again, diving their legs stiff, their stiff legs rolled in slow, and then doll again, and I hollering, catch her, doll, catch her, head her into the bank, doll, and Vernon wouldn't help, and then doll dodged past the mules where he could, he had her under the water, coming into the bank, coming in slow, because in the water she fought to stay under the water, but doll is strong, and he was coming in slow, and so I knew he had her, because he came slow, and I ran down into the water to help, and I couldn't stop her, because doll was strong and steady, holding her under the water, even if she did fight, he would not let her go, he was seeing me, and he would hold her, and it was all right now, it was all right now, it was all right. Then he comes up out of the water. He comes a long way up slow before his hands do, but he's got to have her, got to, so I can bear it. Then his hands come up, and all of him above the water. He can't stop. I have not got time to try. I will try to when I can, but his hands came empty out of the water, emptying the water, emptying away. Where's Ma, Dar? I said. You never got her. You knew she's a fish, but you let her get away. You never got her. Dar, Dar, Dar. I began to run along the bank, watching the mules dive up slow again, and then down again. Tull. When I told Cora how Dar jumped out of the wagon, and left Cass sitting there trying to save it, and the wagon turning over, and Jewel that was almost to the bank, fighting on horse back where it had more sense than to go, she says, And you're one of the folks that says Dar is the queer one, the one that ain't bright, and him the only one of them that had sense enough to get off that wagon. I noticed Ants was too smart to bin on it at all. He couldn't have done no good if he had been there, I said. They was going about it right, and they would have made it if it hadn't have been for that log. No, Dix, Cora said. It was the hand of God. Then how can we put it forward? I said. Nobody can't guard against God. It would be sacrilege to try to. Then why dare it? Cora says. Tell me that. Ants didn't, I said. That's just what you thought. His place was there, Cora said. If he had been a man, he would have been there instead of making his sons do what he doesn't. I don't know what you want then, I said. One breath you say they were there and I mean to try it. And the next day they didn't have to go the Then she began to sing again working at the washtub, with that singing look in her face like she had done give up folks and all their foolishness, and had done went on ahead of them, marching up the sky, singing. The wagon hung for a long time while the current built up under it, shoving it off the ford, and Cash leaning more and more, trying to keep the coffin braced, stood down and jumped the wagon over. Soon as the wagon got tilted good, to where the current could finish it, the log went on. It headed around the wagon, and went on good as a swimming man could have done. It was like it had been sent there to do a job, and done it, and went on. When the mules finally kicked loose, it looked for a minute like maybe Cash would get the wagon back. It looked like him on the wagon wasn't moving at all, and just Jewel fighting that horse back to the wagon. Then that boy passed me, running and hollering at Darl, and the gal trying to catch him. And then I see the mules come rolling slow up out of the water, their legs sprouted stiff like they had walked up on the top, and rolled on into the water again. Then the wagon tilted over, and then it and Jewel and the horse was all mixed up together. Cash went out in sight, still holding the coffin braced, and then I couldn't tell anything for the horse lunging and splashing. I thought that Cash had give up then, and was swimming for it, and I was yelling at Jewel to come on back, and then, all of a sudden, him and the horse went under too, and I thought they was all going. I knew that the horse had got dragged off the floor too, and with that wild drowning horse, and that wagon, and that loose box, it was going to be pretty bad. And there I was, standing knee deep in the water, yelling at Ants behind me. See what you've done now? See what you've done now? The horse come up again. It was headed for the bank now, throwing its head up, and then I saw one of them holding to the saddle on the downstream side, so I started running along the bank, tried to catch sight of Cash because he couldn't swim, yelling at Jewel where Cash was, like a darn fool, bad as that boy that was on down the bank, still hollering at Darl. So I went down into the water so I could still keep some kind of a grip in the mud when I saw Jewel. He was middle deep, so I knew he was on the ford anyway, leaning hard upstream. And then I see the rope, and then I see the water building up where he was holding the wagon and snubbed just below the ford. So it was cash holding to the horse when it came flashing and scrambling up the bank, moaning and groaning like a natural man. When I come to it, it was just kicking cash loose from his hold on the saddle. His face turned up a second when he was sliding back into the water. It was there, with his closed and a long swipe of mud across his face. Then he let go and turned over in the water. He looked just like an old bundle of clothes kind of washing up and down against the bank. He looked like he was moving in the water on his face, rocking up and down a little, looking at something on the bottom. We could watch the rope cutting down into the water, and we could feel the weight of the wagon kind of blump and lunge lazy-like, like it just as soon as not, and that rope cutting down into the water hard as an iron bar. We could hear the water hissing on it like it was red hot, like it was a straight iron bar stuck into the bottom and us holding the end of it. And the wagon lazy, kind of pushing and crowding at us, like it had come around and got behind us, lazy-like, 
like it just as soon as not, but it made up its mind. There was a choke come by, blowed up like a balloon. One of them spotted chokes at long clicks. It bumped against the it was a fire. It bumped off and went on. And us watching that rope slanting down into the water. We wanted it. Carl. Elish lies on his back on the earth, his head raised on a rolled garment. And like steam, I couldn't. He'll do as I say. He always does. I can persuade him to anything. You know I can. Suppose I say, turn here. Oh, it was when I died that time. Suppose I do. We'll go to New Hope. We won't have to go to town. I rose and took the knife from the streaming fish, still hissing, and I killed Darl. When I used to sleep with Vardaman, I had a nightmare once. I thought I was awake, but I couldn't see and couldn't feel. I couldn't feel the bed under me, and I couldn't think what I was. I couldn't think of my name. I couldn't even think I'm a girl. I couldn't even think I, nor even think I want to wake up, nor remember what was opposite to awake, so I could do that. I knew that something was past, but I couldn't even think of time. And all of a sudden, I knew that something was. It was wind blowing over me. It was like the wind came and blew me back from where it was. I was not. Blowing in the room, and Vardaman asleep, and all of them back under me again, and going on like a piece of cool silk dragging across my naked legs. It blows cool out of the pines. A sad, steady sound. New hope. Was three am I? Was three am I? I believe in God. I believe in God. Why didn't we go to New Hope, Pa? Pardon me. Mr. Sampson said he was, but we done passed the road. Dale says, look, Jim. But he isn't looking at me. He is looking at the sky. The buzzard is as still as if he were nailed to it. We turn into Tull's Lane. We pass the bar and go on. The wheels whispering in the mud, passing the green rows of cotton in the wall there, and Vernon Little across the field behind the plow. He lifts his hand as we pass and stands there looking after us for a long while. Look, Jewel, Dar says. Jewel sits on his horse like they were both made of wind, looking straight ahead. I believe in God. God. God, I believe in God. Tull. After they passed, I had taken the mule out and looked up the trench. They were sitting in the wagon at the end of the levee. So we sat in there, looking at the bridge where it was slabbed down into the river with just the two ends inside. He was looking at it like he had believed all the time that folks had been lying to him about it being gone. But like he was hoping all the time it really was. Kind of pleased astonishment, he looked. Sitting on the wagon in the front of the pants, mumbling his mouth. Looking like an uncurried horse dressed up. I don't know. The boy was watching the bridge where it was mid-sunk and logs and such drifted up over it, and it swagging and shivering like the whole thing would go any minute. Big-eyed, he was watching it like he was to a circus. And the gal, too. When I come up, she looked around at me, her eyes kind of blaring up and going hard like I'd made to touch her. Then she looked at ants again, and then back at the water again. It was not up to the levee on both sides. The earth hid except for the tongue of it we was on going out to the bridge and then down into the water, and except for knowing how the road and the bridge used to look. I still couldn't tell where was the river and where the land. It was just a tangle of yellow, and the levee not less wider than a knife back kind of, with us sitting in the wagon and on the horse and the mule. Dar was looking at me, and then Cash turned and looked at me with that look in his eyes like when he was figuring on whether the planks would fit her that night, like he was measuring them inside of him and not asking you to say what you thought, and not even letting on he was listening if he did say it, but listening all right. Here he moved. He sat there on the horse, leaning a little forward, with that same look on his face when him and Dar passed the house yesterday, holding it together. If it was just up, we could drive across, Aunt says. We could drive right on across it. Sometimes the lump would get shoved over the jam and float on, rolling and turning, and we could watch it go on to where the forge used to be. It would slow up and whirl crossways and hang out of water for a minute, and you could tell by that that the ford used to be there. But that don't feel nothing, I say. It could be a ball of quicksand built up there. We watch the log. Then the gal is looking at me again. Mr. Whitfield crossed it, she says. He was a horseback, I say. And three days ago. It's been five weeks since. If the bridge was just up, he says. The log bobs up and goes on again. There's a lot of trash and foam, and you can hear the water. But it's down, Aunt says. Cash says, a careful fellow could walk across yonder on the planks and logs. But you couldn't take nothing, I said. Likely the time you set foot on that mess, it'll all go too. What do you think, Dar? He's looking at me. He don't say nothing. Just looks at me with them clear eyes of his and makes folks talk. I always say it ain't never been what he'd done so much, or said, or anything so much, he looks at you. It's like he had got into the inside of you some way. Like somehow you was looking at yourself and your doings out in his eyes. Then I can feel that gal watching me like I had made to touch her. She said something to Ants. Mr. Whitfield, she says. I give her my promised word in the presence of the Lord, Ants says. I reckon it ain't no need to worry. But still, he does not start the mules. We see there above the water. Another log bobs up over the jam and goes on. We watch it slip and swing slow for a minute where the fall used to be. Then it goes on. It might start falling tonight, I say. You can lay over one more day. Then Jewel turns sideways on the horse. He's not moved until then. Then he turns and looks at me. His face is kind of green. Then it would go red and then green again. Get the hell on back to your damn plowing, he says. Who the hell asked you to follow us here? I never meant no harm. I say. Shut up, Jewel. Hush. Jewel looks back at the water. His face gritted. Going red and green and then red. Well, Cash sits after a while. What do you want to do? Ants don't say nothing. He sits humped up, mumbling his mouth. If it was just up, we could drive across it, he says. Come on, Jewel says, moving the horse. Wait, Cash says. He looks at the bridge. We look at him, except Ants and the gal. They're looking at the water. Do Dell and Vardman and Pa better walk across on the bridge, Cash says. Vernon can help them, Jewel says. And we can hit his mule ahead of ours. You ain't going to take my mule into that water, I say. Jewel looks at me. 
His eyes look like pieces of a broken plate. I'll pay for your damn mule. I'll buy it from you right now. My mule ain't going into that water, I say. Jewel's going to use his horse. No. Why won't you risk your mule, Vernon? Shut up, doll. Cash says. You and Jewel both. My mule ain't going into that water, I say. Donald. He sits the horse, glaring at Vernon, his lean face suffused up to and beyond the pale rigidity of his eyes. The summer when he was fifteen, he took a spell of sleeping. One morning, when I went to feed the mules, the cows were still in the tie-up, and I heard Paul go back to the house and call him. When we came on back to the house for breakfast, he passed us, carrying the milk buckets, stumbling along like he was drunk, and he was milking when we put the mules in and went out to the field without him. We had been there an hour, and still he never showed up. When Dewey Dell came with our lunch, Paul sent her back to find Jewel. They found him in the tie-up, sitting on the stool, asleep. After that, every morning Paul would go in and wake him. He would go to sleep at the supper table, and as soon as supper was finished, he would go to bed. And when I came into bed, he would be lying there like a dead man. Yet still, Paul would have to wake him in the morning. He would get up, but he wouldn't hardly have half sense. He would stand for Paul's jawing and complaining without a word. He'd take the milk buckets and go to the barn, and once I found him asleep at the cow, the walk of him close to half and his hands up to the wrists in the milk, and his head against the cow's flank. He still got up when Paul waked him, going about what we told him to do in that dazed way. It was like he was trying hard to do them, but he was as puzzled as anyone else. Are you sick? Mark. Don't you feel all right? Yes, Jewel said. I feel all right. He's just lazy, trying me, Pa said, and Jewel standing there, asleep on his feet like it's not. Ain't you? he said, waking Jewel up again to answer. No, Jewel said. You take off and stay in the house today, Ma said. With that whole bottom piece to be busted out? Pa said. If you ain't sick, what's the matter with you? Nothing, Jewel said. I'm all right. All right, Pa said. You're asleep on your feet this minute. No, Jewel said. I'm all right. I want him to stay at home today, Ma said. I'll need him, Pa said. He's tired enough with all of us to do it. He'll just have to do the best he can with Cash and Darl, Ma said. I want him to stay in today. But he wouldn't do it. I'm all right, he said, rubbing on. But he wasn't all right. Anybody could see it. He was losing flesh, and I've seen him go to sleep chopping. Watched the hoe going slower and slower up and down, with less and less of an arc, until it stopped, and he leaning on it motionless in the hot shimmer of the sun. Ma wanted to get the doctor, but Pa didn't want to spend the money without it was needful. And Jewel did seem all right, except for his thinness and his way of dropping off to sleep at any moment. He ate hardy enough, except for his way of going to sleep in his plate, with a piece of bread halfway to his mouth and his jaws still chewing. But he swore he was all right. It was Ma that got Dewey Dale to do his milking, and the other chance. And doing them herself when Pa wasn't there. She would pick some special things to eat and hide them for him. And that may have been when I first found it out. That Addie Bundren should be hiding anything she did. Who would try to teach us that deceit was such that, in a world where it was, nothing else could be very bad or very important. Not even poverty. And at times, when I went in to go to bed, she would be sitting in the dark by Jewel, where he was asleep. And I knew that she was hating herself for that deceit, and hating Jewel because she had to love him so, that she had to act the deceit. One night, she was taken sick. And when I went to the barn to put the team in and drive to Tunnels, I couldn't find the lantern. I remembered noticing it on the nail the night before. But it wasn't there now at midnight. So I hitched in the dark and went on and came back with Mrs. Tull just after daylight. And there the lantern was, hanging on the nail where I remembered it and couldn't find it before. And then one morning while Dewey Dell was milking just before sunup, Jewel came into the barn from the back, through the hole in the back wall, with the lantern in his hand. I told Cash, and Cash and I looked at one another. Nothing, Cash said. Yes, I said. But why the lantern? And every night, too. No wonder he's losing flesh. Are you going to say anything to him? Well, come on, God. Cash said. What he's doing now won't do any good either. I know, but he'll have to learn that himself. Give him time to realize that it'll save, that there'll be just as much more tomorrow, and he'll be all right. I wouldn't tell anybody, I reckon. No, I said. I told Dewey Dell not to. Not Ma, anyway. No, not Ma. After that, I thought it was more comical. He acting so bewildered and willing and dead for sleep and called as a bean pole, and thinking he was so smart with it. And I wondered who the girl was. I thought of all I knew that it might be, but I couldn't say for sure. Take any girl, Cash said. It's a man somewhere. Ain't any young girl got that much daring and staying power. That's what I don't like about it. Why? I said. She'll be safer for him than a girl would. More judgment. He looked at me, his eyes fumbling, the words fumbling at what he was trying to say. It ain't always the safe things in this world that a fella. You mean the safe things are not always the best things? I'm best, he said, fumbling again. It ain't the best things, the things that are good for him. A young boy. A fellow kind of hates to see wallowing in somebody else's mire. That's what he was trying to say. When something is new and hard and bright, there ought to be something a little better for it than just being safe. Since the safe things are just the things that folks have been doing so long, they have worn the edges off, and there's nothing to the doing of them that leads a man to say, that was not done before, and it cannot be done again. So we didn't tell. Not even when after a while he'd appear suddenly in the field beside us and go to work, without having had time to get home when more had been in bed all night. He would tell Ma that he hadn't been hungry at breakfast, or that he had eaten a piece of bread while he was hitching up the team. But Cash and I knew that he hadn't been home at all on those nights, and he had come up out of the woods when we got to the field. But we didn't tell. We knew that when the nights began to cool, she would be done, if he wasn't. But when fall came, and the nights began to get longer, the only difference was that he would always be in bed for Paul to wake him, getting him up at last in that first state of semi-idiocy like when it first started, worse than when he had stayed out all night. She's sure a stayer, I told Cash. I used to admire her, but I don't like respect her now. It ain't a woman, he said. You know, I said, but he was watching me. What is it, then? That's what I need to find out, he said. You can trail him through the woods all night if you want to, I said. I'm not. I ain't trailing him, he said. What are you talking about? I ain't he said, I don't need it that way. And so a few nights later, I heard Jewel get up and call him off the window, and then I heard Cash get up and follow him. The next morning, when I went to the barn, Cash was already there, the mule was fed, and he was having to do with that milk. 
And when I saw him, I knew that he knew what it was. Now and then I might get to watching Jewel with a queer look. I kind of found out where Jewel went and what he was doing and giving him something to really think about at last. But it was not a worried look. It was the kind of look I would see on him when I would find him doing some of Jewel's work around the house. Work that Paul still thought Jewel was doing and that Ma thought Dewey Dell was doing. So I said nothing to him, believing that when he got done digesting it in his mind, he would tell me. But he never did. One morning, it was November then, five months since it started, Jewel was not in bed and he didn't join us in the field. That was the first time Ma learned anything about what had been going on. Disc four. That was the first time Ma learned anything about what had been going on. She sent Bartman down to find where Jewel was, and after a while she came down too. It was as though, so long as the deceit read alone quiet and monotonous, all of us let ourselves be deceived, abetting it unawares, or maybe through cowardice, since all people are cowards and naturally prefer any kind of treachery because it has a bland outside. But now, it was well, and we're kind of telling all the people the whole thing with feathers in the bed, and we all sitting bolt upright in our nakedness, staring at one another and saying, now is the truth. He hasn't come home. Something has happened to him. We let something happen to him. Then we saw him. He came up along the ditch, and then turned straight across the field, riding the horse. Its mane and tail were going, as though in motion they were carrying out the splotchy pattern of its coat. He looked like he was riding on a big pinwheel, bareback, with a rope bridle, and no hat on his head. It was a defendant of those Texas ponies Flynn Snopes brought here twenty-five years ago, and auctioned off for two dollars a head, and nobody but old Lon Quick ever caught his, still owned some of the blood, because he could never give it away. He galloped up and stopped, his heels in the horse's ribs, and it dancing and swirling like the shape of its mane and tail, and the splotches of its coat had nothing whatever to do with the flesh-and-bone horse inside him. And he sat there, looking at us. Where did you get that horse? Pa said. Bought it, Jewel said. From Mr. Quick? Bought it, Pa said. With what? Did you buy that thing on my word? It was my money, Jewel said. I earned it. You won't need to worry about it. Jewel, Ma said. Jewel. It's Cash said. He earned the money. He cleaned up all 40 acres of new ground quick laid out last spring. He did it single-handed, working at night by lantern. I saw him. So I don't reckon I lost up anybody anything. I don't reckon we need worry. Jewel, Ma said. Jewel. Then she said, You can walk to the house and go to bed. Not yet, Jewel said. I ain't got time. I gotta get me a saddle and bridle. Mr. Quick says he... Jewel, Ma. Look at him. I'll give. I'll give. You. Then she began to cry. She cried hard, not hiding her face, standing there in a faded wrapper, looking at him, and him on the horse, looking down at her. This is cool. And he was sick looking, until he looked away quick, and Cash came and touched her. You go on to the house, Cash said. This here ground is too wet for you. You go on now. She put her hands to her face then, and after a while she went on, stumbling a little on the plow marks. But pretty soon she straightened up and went on. She didn't look back. When she reached the ditch, she stopped and called Barman. He was looking at the horse, kind of dancing up and down by it. Let me ride, Jewel, he said. Let me ride, Jewel. Jewel looked at him. Then he looked away again, holding the horse reined back. Pa watched him, mumbling his lip. So, you bought a horse, he said. You went behind my back and bought a horse. You never consulted me? You know how tight it is for us to make by. Yet you bought a horse for me to feed. Taken the work from your flesh and blood and bought a horse with it. Jewel looked at Pa, his eyes paler than ever. He won't never eat a mouthful of yours, he said. Not a mouthful. I'll kill him for you. Never make it. Never. Let me ride, Jewel, Bartman said. Let me ride, Jewel. He sounded like a cricket in the grass, a little one. Let me ride, Jewel. That night, I found Ma sitting beside the bed where he was sleeping, in the dark. She cried hard. Maybe because she had to cry so quiet. Maybe because she felt the same way about tears she did about deceit. Hating herself for doing it. Hating him because he had to. And then I knew that I knew. I knew that as plain on that day as I knew about Dewey Dell on that day. Tull. So they finally got Ants to say what he wanted to do. And him and the gal and the boy got out of the wagon. But even when we were on the bridge, Ants kept on looking back. Like he thought maybe once he was out in the wagon, the whole thing would kind of blow up. And he would find himself back yonder in the field again. And her laying up there in the house, waiting to die. And it to be all over again. You ought to let them take in your mule, he says. And the bridge shaking and coming under us, going down into the moiling water like it went clean through to the other side of the earth. And the other end, coming up out in the water like it wasn't the same bridge at all. And that one that would walk up out in the water on that side must come from the bottom of the earth. But it was still whole. You could tell that, by the way, when this end swagged. It didn't look like the other end swagged. Just like the other trees in the bank yonder were swinging back and forth slow, like on a big clock. And the logs scraping and bumping at the sunk part, and tilting the end up, and, and clean out in the water, and tumbling on toward the feet, and quaking, slick, whirling, and foamy. What good would that have done, I said? If your team can't find the board and hold it across, what good would three mules or even ten mules do? I ain't asking it of you, he says. I can always do for me and mine. I ain't asking you to risk your mule. It ain't your dead. I'm not blaming you. They ought to went back and laid over until tomorrow, I says. The water was cold. It was thick, like flat water. Only it kind of moved. One part of you knowed it was just water. The same thing that had been running under the same bridge for a long time. Yet when them logs would come spewing up out in it, you were not surprised that there was a part of water, of the waiting, and the threat. It was like when we was across, up out of the water again, in the hard earth under us, that I was surprised. It was like we hadn't expected the bridge to end on the other bank, on something tame like the hard earth again that we'd tromped on before this time, and knew it well. Like it couldn't be me here. It is bad. And to done what I'd just done. And when I looked back and saw the other bank, and saw my mule standing there where I used to be, and knew that I'd have to get back there some way, I knew it couldn't be, because I just couldn't think of anything that could make me cross that bridge ever even once. Yet here I was, and the fellow that could make himself cross it twice couldn't be me, not even if Cora told him to. It was that boy. I said, here, you better take a hold of my hand. And he waited and held to me. 
I'd be a good if it wasn't like he'd come back and got me. Like he was saying, they won't know to hurt you. Like he was saying about a fine place he knowed where Christmas come twice with Thanksgiving and lasts on through the winter and the spring and the summer. And if I just stayed with him, I'd be all right too. When I looked back at my mule, it was like he was one of these here spy glasses, and I could look at him standing there and see all the broad land and my house sweated out in it like it was the more the sweat, the broader the land. The more the sweat, the tighter the house, because it would take a tight house for Cora to hold Cora like a jar of milk in a pot. You've got to have a tight thing, or you'll need a powerful spring. So if you have a big spring, why then you have the incentive to have tight, well-made jars? Because it is your milk, sour or not, because you would rather have milk that will sour than to have milk that won't, because you are a man. And him holding to my hand, his hand that hot and confident, so that I was like to say, look at here, can't you see that mule yonder? He never had no business over here, so he never come, not being nothing but a mule. Because a fellow can see ever now and then that children have more sense than him. But he don't like to admit it to them until they have beards. After they have a beard, they are too busy because they don't know if they'll ever quite make it back to where they were in stands before they was had. So you don't mind admitting them to folks that are worrying about the same thing that ain't worth the worry that you are yourself. Then we was over, and we stood there, you could catch turning the wagon around. We watched them drive back down the road to where the trail turned off into the bottom. After a while, the wagon was out of sight. We better get on down to the fort and get ready to help, I said. I give her my word. Aunt says, it is sacred on me. I know you begrudge it, but she will bless you in heaven. Well, they got to finish circumventing the land before they can dare the wall, he said. Come on. It's the turning back, he said. It ain't no luck in turning back. He was standing there, humped, mournful, looking at the empty road beyond the swagging and swaying bridge. And that gal, too, with the lunch basket and the package under the other, just going to town, bent on it. They were looking fire and the earth and the water and all, just to eat a sack of bananas. You ought to load over a day, I said. It would have fell some by morning. It might not have rained tonight, and it can't get no higher. I give my promise, he says. She is counting on it. Darl, before us the thick, dark current runs. It talks up to us in a murmur becomes ceaseless and myriad. The yellow surface dimpled monstrously into fading swirls traveling along the surface for an instant, silent, impermanent, and profoundly significant, as though just beneath the surface. For a moment the blaze eagerness out of and into white slumber again. It clucks and murmurs among the spokes and about the mule's knees, yellow, scummed with flotsam and with thick soiled gouts of foam as though it had sweat, lathering like a driven horse. Through the undergrowth it goes with a plaintive sound, a musing sound. In it, the unwinded cane and saplings lean as before a little gale, swaying without reflections, as though suspended on invisible wires from the branches overhead. Above the ceaseless surface they stand, trees, cane, vines, rootless, severed from the earth, spectral above its human remains, its circumscribed desolation filled with the voice of the waste and mournful water. Cash and I sit in the wagon. Jewel sits the horse at the off-rear wheel. The horse is trembling. It's it's breathing stertorous like groaning. He sits erect, poised, looking quietly and steadily and quickly this way and that, his face calm, a little pale, alert. Cash's face is also gravely composed. He and I look at one another with long, probing looks, looks that plunge unimpeded through one another's eyes and into the ultimate secret place, where for an instant Cash and Darrow crouch flagrant and unabashed in all the old terror and the old foreboding, alert and secret, and without shame. When we speak, our voices are quiet, detached. I reckon we're still in the road all right. It's all taken and cut them two big white oaks. I heard tell how at high water, in the old days, they used to line up the ford by them trees. I reckon he did that two years ago when he was logging down here. I reckon he never thought that anybody would ever use this ford again. I reckon not. Yes, it must have been then. He cut us. Yes, yes, I That's a fact. Most folks that logs in this here country, they need a darn good farm to support the sawmill, or maybe a store. But I reckon Vernon could. I reckon so. He's a saint. Aye, Vernon is. Yes, it must still be here. He never would have got that timber out of here if he hadn't cleaned out that old road. I reckon we are still on it. He looks about quietly, at the position of the trees, leading this way and that, looking back along the floorless road shaped vaguely high in air by the position of the lopped and felled trees, as if the road, too, had been soaked free of earth and floated upward, to leave in its spectral tracing a monument to a still more profound desolation than this above which we now sit, talking quietly of old security and old, trivial things. Jewel looks at him, and at me, but his face turns in in that quiet, constant questing about the scene, the horse trembling quietly and steadily between his knees. He could go on ahead slow and sort of feel it out, I say. Yes, Cash says, not looking at me. His face is in profile as he looks forward where Jewel has moved on ahead. He can't miss the river, I say. He couldn't miss it if he passed it yet. Cash does not look at me, his face in profile. If I just suspicioned it, I could have come down last week and taken a sight on it. The bridge was up then, I say. He does not look at me. Whitfield crossed it horseback. Jewel looks at us again, his expression sober and alert and subdued. His voice is quiet. What do you want me to do? I have to come down last week and take a sight on it, Cash says. We couldn't have known, I say. There wasn't any way for us to know. I'll ride on ahead, Jewel says. You can follow where I am. He lifts the horse. It shrinks, loud. He leans to it, speaking to it. Lifting the it it's setting its feet down with gingerly splashings, trembling, breathing harshly. He speaks to it, murmurs to it. Go on, he says. I ain't gonna let nothing hurt you. Go on now. Jewel, Cash says. Jewel does not look back. He lifts the horse on. He can swim, I say. If you'll just give the horse time, anyhow. When he was born, he had a bad time of it. Ma would hold him on a pillow on her lap. We would wake him. There would be no sound from them. That pillow was longer than him, Cash says. He is leaning a little forward. 
Caught the ball, lost my face. I have to come in. That's me, I say. Now that his feet are his head would reach the end of it. You couldn't have known, I say. I ought to have done it, he says. He lifts the reins. The mules move into the traces. The wheels murmur alive in the water. He looks back and down at Addy. Then he got out, he says. At last, the trees open. Against the open river, Jules hits the horse, half-turned, but probably deep now. Across the river, we can see Vernon and Pa and Barnum and Dewey Dell. Vernon is waving at us, waving us further downstream. We're too high up, Cash says. Vernon is shouting too, but we cannot make out what he says for the noise of the water. It runs steady and deep now, unbroken, without sense of motion until a log comes along, turning slowly. Watch it, Cash says. We watch it and see it in a moment. A current building up behind it in a big wave, submerging it for an instant before it shoots up and tumbles on. There it is. I... Aye, Cash says. It's there. We look at Vernon again. He is now flapping his arms up and down. We move on downstream, slowly and carefully, watching Vernon. He drops his hands. This is the place, Cash says. Well, God damn it, let's get across then, Jules says. He moves the horse on. You wait, Cash says. Jules stops again. Well, by God, he says. Cash looks at the water. Then he looks back at Addy. It ain't on the balance, he says. Then go on back to the goddamn bridge and walk across, Jules says. You and Darrell both. Let me on that wagon. Cash does not pay him any attention. It ain't on the balance, he says. Yes, we got to watch it. Watch it, Jules says. You get out of that wagon and let me have it. God damn it, you're afraid to drive it over. His eyes are pale as two bleached chips in space. Cash is looking at him. We'll get it over, he says. I tell you what you do. You ride on back and walk across the bridge and come down the other bank and meet us with the rope. Vernon will take the horse home with him and keep it till we get back. You go to hell, Jewel says. You take the rope and come down the bank and be ready with it, Cash says. Three can't be no more than two can. One to drive and one to steady it. I'll damn you, Jewel says. Let Jewel take the end of the rope and cross upstream of us and brace it, I say. Will you do that, Jewel? Jewel watches me, hard. He looks quick at Cash, then back at me, his eyes alert and hard. I don't give a damn. Just so we do something. Set me and not lifting a goddamn hand. Let's do that, Cash, I say. I'll let them go off, dude, Cash says. <laughs> sight not of that single monotony of desolation leaning with that terrific quality all over from right to left, as though we had reached the place where the motion of the wasted world accelerates just before the final precipice. Yet they appear dwarfed. It is as though the space between us were time an irrevocable quality. It is as though time, no longer running straight before us in a diminishing line, now runs parallel between us, like a looping string, the distance between the future of the threat and now the interval between. The mules sleep. Their feet there is already sloped a little, their rumps high. They too are breathing now with a deep groaning sound. Looking back once, their gaze sweeps across us, within their eyes a wild, sad, profound, and despairing quality as though they had already seen in the thick water the shape of the disaster which they could not speak and we could not see. Cash turns back into the wagon. He lays his hands flat on Addy, rocking her a little. His face is downsloped, calculate, concerned. He lifts his box of tools and wedges it forward under the seat. Together we shove Addy forward, wedging her between the tools and the wagon bed. Then he looks at me. No, I say, I reckon I'll stay. Might take both of us. From the toolbox he takes his coiled rope and carries the end twice around the seat stanchion and passes the end to me without tying it. The other end he pays out to Jewel, who takes a turn about his saddle horn. He must force the horse down into the current. It moved, high-kneed, arch-necked, boring and chafing. Jewel sits lightly forward, his knees lifted a little. Again, his swift, alert, calm gaze sweeps upon us and on. He lowers the horse into the stream, speaking to it in a soothing murmur. The horse slips, surges to its feet again, the current building up against Jewel's mouth. Watch yourself, Cash says. You need to be, Jewel says. You can come ahead now. Cash takes the reins and lowers the team carefully and skillfully into the stream. I felt the current take us, and I knew we were on the ford by that reason, since it was only by means of that slipping contact that we could tell that we were in motion at all. What had once been a flat surface was now a succession of troughs and hillocks lifting and falling about us, shoving at us, teasing at us with light, lazy touches in the vain instance of solidity underfoot. Paul looked back at me, and then I knew that we were gone. But I did not realize the reason for the rope until I saw the log. It surged up out of the water and stood for an instant upright upon that surging and heaving desolation, like Christ. Get out and let the current take you down to the bend, Cash said. You can make it all right. No, he said. I get just as wet that way as this. The log appears suddenly between two hills. It's a of the Upon the it, a log out of trouble hangs like the beard of an old man or a goat. When Cash speaks to me, I know that he has been watching it all the time, watching it and watching Jewel ten feet ahead of us. Let the rope go, he says. With his other hand, he reaches down and reaves the two turns from the stanchion. Ride on, Jewel, he says. See if you can pull us ahead of the log. Jewel shouts at the horse. Again, he appears to lift it bodily between his knees. He is just a on a horde, and the horse has gauges of some sort, for it surges forward, shining wetly half out of water, crashing on in a succession of crunches. It moves unbelievably fast. By that token, he rears the log, and the rope is free, for I can see him sawing back on the reins, his head turned as the log rears in a long, sluggish lunge between us, bearing down upon the team. They see it too. For a moment, they also shine black out of water. Then the downstream one vanishes, dragging the other with him. The wagon shears crosswise, poised on the crest of the ford as the log strikes it, tilting it up and on. Cash is half-turned, the reins running taut from his hand and disappearing into the water. The other hand reached back upon Addy, holding her jammed over against the high side of the wagon. Jump clear, he says quietly. Stay away from the team and don't try to fight it. It'll swing you into the bend, all right. You come too, I say. Vernon and Bardman are running along the bank. Pa and Dewey Dell stand watching us. Dewey Dell with the back of the package in her arms. Jewel is trying to fight the horse back. The head of one mule pulls, its eyes wide. It looks back at us for an instant, making a sound almost human. The head vanishes again. Back, Jewel! Cash shouts. Back, Jewel! For another instant, I see him leaning to the tilting wagon, his arm braced back against Addy and his tools. 
I see the bearded head of a weary log strike up again, and beyond it, Jewel holding the horse upward, its head wrenched around, hammering its head with his fist. I jump from the wagon on the downstream side. Between two hills, I see the mules once more. They roll up out of the water in succession, turning completely over, their legs stiffly extended, and suddenly drop in contact with the earth. Vardaman. Cash tried, but she fell off. And now jumped, going under. He went under, and Cash hollering to cats. And I hollering, running, and hollering, and Dewey Dell hollering at me. Vardaman, you! Vardaman, you! Vardaman! And Vernon passed me, and he was seeing her come up, and she jumped into the water again, and Dahl hadn't caught her yet. He came up to see, and I hollering, catch her, doll, catch her. And he didn't come back because she was too heavy. He had to go on catching at her. And I hollering, catch her, doll, catch her, doll, because in the water she could go faster than a man. And doll had to grapple for her, so I knew he could catch her because he is the best grappler, even with the mules in the way again they dived up, rolling their feet, stiff rolling down again, and their backs up now. And doll had to again because in the water she could go faster than a man or a woman. And I passed Vernon, and he wouldn't get in the water and help doll. He wouldn't grapple for her with doll. He knew, but he wouldn't help. The mules dived up again, diving their legs stiff, their stiff legs rolled in snow, and then Dahl again, and I hollering, catch her, Dahl, catch her, head her into the bank, Dahl, and Vernon wouldn't help, and then Dahl dodged past the mules where he could, he had her under the water, coming into the bank, coming in slow, because in the water she fought to stay under the water, but Dahl is strong, and he was coming in slow, and so I knew he had her, because he came slow, and I ran down into the water to help, and I couldn't stop him, because Dahl was strong and steady, holding her under the water, even if she did fight, he would not let her go, he was seeing me, and he would hold her, and it was all right now, it was all right now, it was all right. Right. Then he comes up out of the water. He comes a long way up slow before his hands do, but he's got to have her, got to, so I can bear it. Then his hands come up, and all of him above the water. He can't stop. I have not got time to try. I will try to when I can, but his hands came empty out of the water, emptying the water, emptying away. Where's Ma, Dar? I said. You never got her. You knew she was a fish, but you let her get away. You never got her. Dar, Dar, Dar. I began to run along the bank, watching the mules dive up slow again, and then boom again. Tull. When I told Cora how Dahl jumped out of the wagon, and left Cass sitting there trying to save it, and the wagon turning over, and Jewel that was almost to the bank, fighting my horse back where it had more sense than to go, she says, And you're one of the folks that says Dahl is the queer one, the one that ain't bright, and him the only one of them that had sense enough to get off that wagon. I noticed Ants was too smart to bin on it at all. He couldn't have done no good if he had been there, I said. They was going about it right, and they would have made it if it hadn't have been for that log. Log for the kicks, Cora said. It was the hand of God. Then how can you say what it is? I said. Nobody can't guard against God. It would be sacrilege to try to. Then why bear it? Cora says. Tell me that. Ants didn't, I said. That's just what you thought. This place was there, Cora said. If he had been a man, he would have been there instead of making his sons do what he doesn't. I don't know what you want then, I said. One day they were there in the hand of God. Try it. And the next day they just called Ants because they wanted Then she began to sing again working at the wash tub, with that singing look in her face like she had done give up folks and all their foolishness, and had done went on ahead of them, marching up the sky, singing. The wagon hung for a long time while the current built up under it, shoving it off the ford, and Cash leaning more and more, trying to keep the coffin braced, down and the wagon over. Soon as the wagon got tilted good, to where the current could finish it, the log went on. It headed around the wagon, and went on good as a swimming man could have done. It was like it had been sent there to do a job, and done it, and went on. When the mood finally kicked loose, it looked for a minute like maybe Cash would get the wagon back. It looked like him and the wagon wasn't moving at all, and just Jewel fighting that horse back to the wagon. Then that boy passed me, running and hollering at Darl, and the gal trying to catch him. And then I see the mules come rolling slow up out of the water, their legs sprouted stiff like they had fucked up, and roll on into the water again. Then the wagon tilted over, and then it and Jewel and the horse was all mixed up together. Cash went out in sight, still holding the coffin braced, and then I couldn't tell anything for the horse lunging and splashing. I thought that Cash had give up then, and was swimming for it, and I was yelling at Jewel to come on back, and then, all of a sudden, him and the horse went under too, and I thought they was all going. I knew that the horse had got dragged off the floor too, and with that wild drowning horse, and that wagon, and that loose box, it was going to be pretty bad, and there I was, standing deep in the water, yelling at the horse behind me, see what you've done now, see what you've done now? The horse come up again, it was headed for the bank now, throwing its head up, and then I saw one of them holding to the saddle on the downstream side, so I started running along the bank, tried to catch sight of Cash because he couldn't swim, yelling at Jewel where Cash was, like a darn fool, bad as that boy that was on down the bank still hollering at Darl. So I went down into the water so I could still keep some kind of a grip in the mud, when I saw Jewel. He was middle deep, so I knew he was on the ford anyway, leaning hard upstream. And then I see the rope, and then I see the water building up where he was holding the wagon and snubbed just below the ford. So it was Cash holding to the horse when it came flashing and scrambling up the bank, moaning and groaning like a natural man. When I come to it, it was just kicking Cash loose from his hold on the saddle. His face turned up a second when he was sliding back into the water. It was closed, with his eyes closed and a long swipe of mud across his face. Then he let go and turned over in the water. He looked just like an old bundle of clothes kind of washing up and down against the bank. He looked like he was laying in the water on his face, rocking up and down a little, looking something on the bottom. We could watch the rope cutting down into the water, and we could feel the weight of the wagon kind of blump and lunge lazy-like, like it just as soon as not, and that rope cutting down into the water hard as an iron bar. We could hear the water hissing on it like it was red hot, 
like it was a straight iron bar stuck into the bottom and us holding the end of it. And the wagon lazy, kind of pushing and prodding at us, like it had come around and got behind us, lazy like, like it just as soon as not, but it made up its mind. There was a shelf come by, blowed up like a balloon. One of them spotted shelves along cooks. It bumped against the like it was a iron bar, and bumped off and went on. And us watching that rope slanting down into the water. We won't eat. Carl. Carl flies on his back on the earth, his head raised on a rolled garment. To his sons, he ought to run them away from home, no matter how big they are. And if he can't do that, I'd be darned if he oughtn't to leave himself. I'd be darned if I wouldn't. You mean you tried to slump my hoof? She says. Aunt stands there, dangle on. For fifteen years, I ain't had a tooth in my head, he says. God knows it. He knows in fifteen years, I ain't at the vittles he aims for man to eat to keep his strength up. And me saving a nickel here and a nickel here. I'll give you money. I'm that if I could do it, my sons could do without riding. God knows I did. Jules stands with his hands on his hips, looking at ants. Then he looks away. He looked out across the field, his face still as a rock, like it was somebody else talking about somebody else's horse. You know then he spit. He turned and went on to the boat and unhitched the horse and got on it. It was moving when he came into the stomach. By the time he got on it, was like the Lord might have been behind him. They went out of sight that way, the two of them looking like some kind of a spotted cyclone. Well, I says, you take my team, I said. But he wouldn't do it. And they wouldn't even stay. And that boy chasing them buzzards all day in the hot sun until he was nigh as crazy as the rest of them. Leave cash here anyway, I said. But they wouldn't do that. They made a pallet for him with quilts on top of the coffin and laid him on it and set his tools by him. And we put my team in and hauled the wagon about a mile down the road. If we'll bother you here, Aunt says, just say so. Show, I said. It'll be fine here. Safe, too. Now let's go back to the okay? I thank you, Aunt said. We got a little something in the basket. We can make out. Where'd you get it? I said, we brought it from home. But it'll be stale now. I said, come and get some hot vittles. But they wouldn't come. I reckon we can make eight, Aunt said. So I went home and ate and taken the basket back to them and tried again to make them come back to the house. I thank you, he said. I reckon we can make out. So I left them. Squatting around a little fire, waiting. God knows what for. I come on home. I kept thinking about the name and about that fellow coming away in that horse. And that would be the last they would give me. And I'd be done if I could leave. Not for wanting to not give up his horse. But for getting shot of such a darn fool as Ants. Well, that's what I thought then. Because he think something about a darn fella like Ants that seems to make a man have to help him, even when he knows he'll be wanting to kick himself next minute. Because about an hour after breakfast next morning, Eustace Grimm worked Snopes' place come up with a band of mules, hunting Ants. I thought him and Ants never traded, I said. Yes, Eustace said. All they liked was the horse. Like I said to Mr. Snopes, he must take over $50. Because if his Uncle Flem had just kept them Texas horses when he owned them, Ants wouldn't have never... The horse? I said. Ants' boy taking that horse and cleared out last night. Probably halfway to Texas by now, and Ants. I didn't know who brung it, Eustace said. I never see them. I just found the horse in the barn this morning when I went to feed. And I told Mr. Snopes, and he said to bring the team on over here. Well, that'll be the last they'll ever see of him now. Sure enough. Come Christmas time, they'll maybe get a postal card from him in Texas, I reckon. And if it hadn't have been Jewel, I reckoned it'd have been me. I own that much myself. I'll be darned if Ants don't conjure a man some way. I'll be darned if he's a sight. Vitamin. Now there are seven of them in little tall black circles. Look, Dar, I say. See? He looks up. We watch them in little tall black circles of not moving. Yesterday, there were just four, I say. There were more than four on the barn. Do you know what I would do if he tried to lie on the wagon again? I say. What would you do? Dar says. I wouldn't let him lie on her. I say. I wouldn't let him lie on Cash either. Cash is sick. He is sick on the box. But my mother is a fish. We got to get some medicine in Motson, Pa says. I reckon we'll just have to. How do you feel, Cash? Dar says. It don't bother none, Cash says. Do you want it propped a little higher? Dar says. Cash has broken leg. He is got teeth. He lies on the box with a quilt rolled under his head and a piece of wood under his knee. I reckon we ought to have left him at Armstead's, Pa says. I haven't even broken leg, and Dar hasn't, and Dar hasn't, and it's just the bumps, Cash says. He kind of grinds together a little on a bump. It don't bother none. Jewel has gone away. He and his horse went away one supper time. It's because he wouldn't have us beholden, Pa says. For God, I do the best that am, man. Is it because Jules' mother is a horse, Dar? He said. Maybe I can draw the ropes a little tighter, Dar says. That's why Jules and I were both in the shed, and she was in the wagon, because the horse lived in the barn, and I had to keep on running the buzzard away from. If he just would, he says. And Dewey Dale hasn't got a broken leg, and I haven't. Cash is my brother. We stop. When Dar loosens the rope, Cash begins to play again. His teeth look out. Hurt, Dar says. I reckon you better put it back, Cash says. Dar puts the rope back, pulling hard. Cash's teeth look out. Hurt? Dar says. It don't bother none. Cash says. Do you want Pa to drive slower? Dar says. No. Cash says. Ain't no time to hang back. It don't bother none. We'll have to get some medicine at Motson. Pa says. I reckon we'll have to. 
Going to go on, Cash says. We go on. Dewey Dale leans back and wipes Cash's face. Cash is my brother. But Jules' mother is a horse. My mother is a fish. Doll says that when we come to the water again, I'll not see her. And Dewey Dale said, she's in the box. How could she have got out? Out through the holes I bored. Into the water, I said. And when we come to the water again, I'm going to see her. My mother is not in the box. My mother does not smell like that. My mother is a fish. Those cakes will be in fine shape by the time we get to Jefferson, Doll says. Dewey Dale does not look around. You better try to sell them in Motson, Doll says. When will we get to Motson, David? I say. Tomorrow, Doll says. If this team won't wrap to pieces, Snopes must have fed them on sawdust. Why did he feed them on sawdust, Doll? I say. Look, Doll says. See? Now there are nine of them, tall in little tall black circles. When we come to the foot of the hill, Pa stops and Doll and Dewey Dale and I get out. Cash can't walk because he has a broken leg. Come up, mules, Pa says. The mules walk hard. The wagon creaks. Doll and Dewey Dale and I walk behind the wagon up the hill. When we come to the top of the hill, Pa stops and we get back into the wagon. Now there are ten of them, tall in little tall black circles on the sky. Mosley. I happened to look up and saw her outside the window, looking in. Not close to the glass and not looking at anything in particular. Just standing there with her head turned this way and her eyes full on me and kind of blank, too, like she was waiting for a sign. When I looked up again, she was moving toward the door. She kind of fumbled with the keys a minute, like they do when King out. She had on a stiff, grim straw hat sitting on the top of her head, and she was carrying a package wrapped in newspaper. I thought that she had a quarter or a dollar at the moment, and that after she stood around the wall, she buy a cheap comb or a bottle of nigger toilet water, so I never disturbed her for a minute or so except to notice that she was pretty in a kind of thoroughly awkward way, and that she looked a sight better in her gingham dress and her own complexion than she would after she bought whatever she would find with the on, or tell that she wanted. I knew that she had already decided before she came in. But you have to let them take their time. So I went on with what I was doing, figuring to let Albert wait on her when he caught up at the fountain, when he came back to me. That woman, he said, you better see what she wants. What does she want, I said. I don't know. I can't get anything out of her. You better wait on her. So I went around the counter. I saw that she was barefooted, standing with her feet flat and easy on the floor, like she was used to it. She was looking at me, hard, holding the package. I saw she had about as black a pair of eyes as ever I saw. And she was a stranger. I never remembered seeing her in Motson before. What can I do for you, I said. Still, she didn't say anything. She stared at me without winking. Then she looked back at the folks at the fountain. Then she looked past me, toward the back of the store. Do you want to look at some toilet things? I said. Oh, I said. That's it, she said. She looked quick back at the fountain again. So I thought maybe her ma or somebody had sent her in for some of this female dope and she was ashamed to ask for it. I knew she couldn't have a complexion like hers and use it herself, let alone not being much more than old enough to barely know what it was for. It's a shame, the way they poison themselves with it. But a man's got to go out of business and something. Oh, I said. What do you use? We have... She looked at me again, almost like she had said hush, and looked toward the back of the store again. I'd leave her go back there, she said. All right, I said. You have to humor them. You save time by it. I followed her to the back. She put her hand on the gate. There's nothing back there but the prescription case, I said. What do you want? She stopped and looked at me. It was like she had taken some kind of a lid off her face, her eyes. It was her eyes kind of dumb and hopeful and sullenly willing to be disappointed all at the same time. But she was in trouble of some sort. I could see that. What's your trouble? I said. Tell me what it is you want. I'm pretty busy. I wasn't meaning to hurry her. But a man just hasn't got the time they have out there. It's the female trouble, she said. Oh, I said. Is that all? I thought maybe she was younger than she looked. And the first one had scared her. Or maybe one had been a little abnormal as it will in young women. Where's your ma? I said. Haven't you got one? She's out yonder in the wagon, she said. Why not talk to her before you take her back? I said. Any woman would have told you about it. She looked at me, and I looked at her again and said, How old are you? Seventeen, she said. Oh, I said. I thought maybe you were... She was watching me. But then in the eyes, all of them looked like they had no age and knew everything in the world anyhow. Are you too regular or not regular enough? She quit looking at me, but she didn't move. Yes, she said. I reckon so, yes. Well, which, he said. Don't you know? It's a cool thing. But after all, they'll buy it from somebody. She stood there, not looking at me. You want something to stop it? I said. Is that it? No. She said. That's it. It's already stopped. Well, what? Her face was lowered a little still, like they do in all their dealings with a man so he don't ever know just where the lightning will strike next. You're not married, are you? I said. No. Oh, I said. And how long has it been since it stopped? About five months, maybe? It ain't been but two, she said. Well, I haven't got anything in my store you want to buy, I said, unless it's a nickel. And I'd advise you to buy that and go back home and tell your pony, if you have one, and let it make somebody buy you a wedding license. Was that all you wanted? But she just stood there, not looking at me. I got the money to pay you, she said. Is it your own? Or did he act enough of a man to give you the money? He gave it to me. Ten dollars. He said that would be enough. A thousand dollars wouldn't be enough in my store, and ten cents wouldn't be enough, I said. You take my advice and go home and tell your pa or your brothers if you have any, or the first man you come to in the road. But she didn't move. I said I could get it at the drugstore. He said to tell you me and him wouldn't never tell nobody you sold it to us. Well, I'd wish your precious lady would come forward himself. That's what I mean. 
I don't know. I'd have had a little respect for him then. And you can go back and tell him I said so. If he ain't halfway to Texas by now, which I don't doubt. Me, a respectable druggist, that's kept store and raised a family and church member for 56 years in this town. I'm a good mind to tell your folks myself, if I can just find who they are. She looked at me now, her eyes and face kind of blank again, like when I first saw her. I didn't mean, she said. He told me I could get something at the drugstore. He said they might not want to sell it to me, but if I had ten dollars and told them I wouldn't never tell nobody, he never said this drugstore, I said. If he did or mention my name, I defy him to prove it. I defy him to repeat it or I'll prosecute him to the full extent of the law, and you can tell him so. But maybe another drugstore would, she said. Then I don't want to know it. Me, that's... Then I looked at her. But it's a hard life they have. Sometimes a man, if there can ever be any excuse for sin, which it can't be. And then life wasn't made to be easy on folks. They would never have any reason to be good and die. Look here, I said. You got that notion out of your head. The Lord gave you what you have, even if he did use the devil to do it. You let him take it away from you, if it's his will to do so. You go on back to Leif and use him to that ten dollars and get married with it. Leif will never get something at the drugstore, she said. Then go and get it, I said. You won't get it here. She went out, carrying the package, her feet making a little hissing on the floor. She bumbled again at the door and went out. I could see her through the glass going on down the street. It was Albert told me about the rest of it. He said the wagon was stopped in front of Grummet's hardware store, with a load of a crowd of hard-nosed men and boys standing around the wagon, listening to the marshal arguing with the man. He was a kind of tall, gaunted man sitting on the wagon, saying it was a public street and he reckoned he had as much right there as anybody, and the marshal telling him he would have to move on. Folks couldn't stand it. It had been dead eight days, Albert said. They came from some place out in Yachnapatawpha County, trying to get the Jefferson with it. It must have been like a piece of wanton cheese coming into an anthill, in that ramshackle wagon that Albert said folks were scared would fall all to pieces before they could get it out of town, with that homemade box and another fellow with a broken leg lying on a quilt on top of it and a father and a little boy sitting on the seat, and the marshal trying to make them get out of town. It's a public street, the man says. I reckon we can stop to buy something same as every other year. We want the money to pay for it, and it ain't every law that says a man can't spend his money where he wants. They'd stop to buy some cement. The others don't need some grunts, trying to make Grummet break a sack and let him have ten cents worth, and finally Grummet broke the sack to get him out. They wanted the cement to fix the fellow's broken leg some way. Why, you'll kill him, the marshal said. You'll cause him to lose his leg. You take him on to a doctor, and you get this thing buried soon as you can. Don't you know you're liable to jail for endangering the public health? We're doing the best we can, the father said. Then he told a long tale about how they had to wait for the wagon to come back, and how the bridge was washed away, and how they went eight miles to another bridge and it was gone too, so they came back and swung the ford and the mules got drowned, and how they got another team and found that the road was washed out, and they had to come clean around by Mutson, and then the one with the cement came back and told him to shut up. We'll be gone in a minute, he told the marshal. We never aimed to bother nobody, the father said. You take that fellow to a doctor, the marshal told the one with the cement. I reckon he's all right, he said. It ain't that we're hard-hearted, the marshal said. But I reckon you can tell yourself how it is. Show, the other said. We'll take her out soon as Dewey Dale comes back. She went to deliver a package. So they stood there with the folks backed off with handkerchiefs to their faces, until in a minute the girl came up with that newspaper package. Come on, the one with the cement. we have lost too much time. So they got in the wagon and went on. And when I went to supper, it still seemed like I could smell it. And the next day I met the marshal, and I began to sniff and said, Smell anything? I reckon they're in Jefferson by now, he said. Or in jail. Well, thank the Lord it's not our jail. That's a fact, he said. Here's a place, Paul says. He pulls the team up and sits in the kitchen. We can get some more into yonder. All right, I say. We'll have to borrow a bucket from them, do we now? Paul says, I wouldn't be home. God knows. If you see a good sized can, you might bring it, I say. Dewey Dale gets them from the wagon, carrying the package. You had more trouble than you expected, selling those cakes in Motson, I say. How do our lives rattle out into the no wind, no sound, the weary gestures, wearily we capitulant? Echoes of old compulsions with no hand on no strings. In sunset, we fall into furious attitudes, dead gestures of dolls. Cash broke his leg, and now the sawdust is running out. He is bleeding to death, his tears. I wouldn't be home, Paul says. God knows. Then make some water yourself, I say. We can use Cash's hat. When Dewey Dog comes back, the man comes with her. Then he stops, and she comes on, and he stands there. And after a while, he goes back to the house and stands on the porch, watching us. We better not try to lift him down, Paul says. We can think Do you want to be far, Paul? I say. Won't we get to Jefferson tomorrow? He says. He is watching us, his eyes interrogatory, intent, and sad. I can blast it out. It'll be easier on you, Paul says. It'll keep it from rubbing together. I can last it, Cash says. We'll lose time stopping. We done bought the cement now, Paul says. I could last it, Cash says. It ain't but one more day. It don't bother to speak of. He looks at us, his eyes wide in his thin gray face, questioning. It sets up so, he says. We done bought it now, Paul says. I mix the cement in the can, stirring the slow water into the pale green thick coils. I bring the can to the wagon where Cash can see. He lies on his back, his thin profile in silhouette, ascetic and profound against the sky. Does that look about right, I say. You don't want too much water, or it won't work right, he says. Is this too much? Maybe if you could get a little sand, he says. It ain't but one more day, he says. It don't bother me none. Hardiman goes back down the road to where we cross the branch and returns with sand. He pours it slowly into the thick coiling in the can. I go to the back again. Is this the moment? Yes, 
Pal says. I could have lasted. It don't bother me none. We loosen the splints and pour the cement over his leg slow. Watch out for it, Cash says. Don't get none on it if you can help. Yes, I say. Huey Dell tears a piece of paper from the package and wipes the cement from the top of it as it drips from Cash's leg. How does that feel? It feels fine, he says. It's cold. It feels fine. If it'll just help you, Pa says. I ask your forgiveness. I never foreseen it no more than you. It feels fine, Cash says. If you could just rattle out into time, that would be nice. It would be nice if you could just rattle out into time. We replace the splints, the cords, drawing them tight. The cement and thick, pale green slow surges among the cords. Cash watching us quietly with that profound, questioning look. That's steady it, I say. Aye, Cash says. I'm obliged. Then we all turn on the wagon and watch him. He is coming up the road behind us, wooden-backed, wooden-backed, moving over from his hips down. He comes up the road with his pale, rigid eyes and his high, sullen face and gets into the wagon. Here's a hill, Pa says. I reckon you'll have to get out and walk. Vogelman. Dahl and Jewel and Dewey Dell and I are walking up the hill behind the wagon. Jewel came back. He came up the road and got into the wagon. He was walking. Jewel hasn't got a horse anymore. Jewel is my brother. Cash is my brother. Cash has a broken leg. We fixed Cash's leg so it doesn't hurt. Cash is my brother. Jewel is my brother too, but he hasn't got a broken leg. Now there are five of them, tall in little tall black circles. Where do they stay at night, Mom? I say. When we stop at night in the barn, where do they stay? The hill goes off into the sky. Then the sun comes up from behind the hill, and the mules and the wagon and pa walk on the sun. You cannot watch them walking slow on the sun. In Gruffert, it is red on the track behind the glass. The track goes shining round and round. Dewey Dell says so. Tonight, I'm going to see where they stay while we're in the barn. Darl. Jewel, I say. Whose son are you? The breeze was setting up from the barn, so we put her under the apple tree, where the moonlight can dapple the apple tree upon the long, slumbering flanks within which now and then she talks. I took Barnum to listen. When we came up, the cat leaped down from it and flicked away with silver claw and... Your mother was a horse. But who was your father, Jewel? You goddamn lying son of a bitch. Don't call me that, I say. You goddamn lying son of a bitch. Don't you call me that, Jewel. In the tall moonlight, his eyes looked like spots of white paper pasted on a high, small football. After supper, Cash began to sweat a little. It's getting a little hot, he said. It was a thunderstorm. You want some water, Jewel? I say. Maybe that will ease it some. I'd be obliged, Cash said. It was the sun shining on it, I reckon. We have to find it covered. We have to find it. You couldn't have suspicion. I never noticed it getting hot, Cash said. I ought to mind it. So we poured the water over it. His leg and foot on the cement looked like they had been boiled. Does that feel better, we said. I'm obliged, Cash said. He feels fine. Dewey Dell wipes his face with the hem of her dress. See if you can get some sleep. So, Cash says. I'm right obliged. It feels fine now. Jewel, I say. Who is the father, Jewel? God damn you. God damn you. Vardaman. She was under the apple tree, and Darl and I go across the moon, and the cat jumps down and runs, and we can hear her inside the wood. Here, Darl says, put your ear close. I put my ear close, and I can hear her. Only I can't tell what she's saying. What is she saying, Darl? I say. Who is she talking to? She's talking to Darl, Darl says. She's calling on him to help her. What does she want him to do? I say. She wants him to hide her away from the sight of man, Darl says. Why does she want to hide her away from the sight of man, Darl? So she can lay down her life, Dar says. Why does she want to lay down her life, Dar? Listen, Dar says. We hear her. We hear her turn over on her side. Listen, Dar says. She's turned over, I say. She's looking at me through the wood. Yes, Dar says. How can she see through the wood, Dar? Come, Dar says. We must let her be quiet. Come. She can't see out there because the holes are in the top, I say. How can she see, Dar? Let's go see about cash, Dar says. And I saw something Dewey Dell told me not to tell nobody. Cash is sick in his leg. We fixed his leg this afternoon, but he is sick in it again, lying on the bed. We pour water on his leg and then he feels fine. That's it's fine, Cash says. I'm obliged to you. Try to get some sleep, we say. I feel fine, Cash says. I'm obliged to you. And I saw something Dewey Dell told me not to tell nobody. It is not about Pa, and it is not about Cash, and it is not about Jewel, and it is not about Dewey Dell, and it is not about me. Dewey Dell and I are going to sleep on the pallet. It is on the back porch where we can see the barn, and the moon shines on half of the pallet, and we will lie half in the white and half in the black, with the moonlight on our legs. And then I'm going to see where they stay at night while we are in the barn. We are not in the barn tonight, but I can see the barn, and so I'm going to find where they stay at night. We lie on the pallet, with our legs in the moon. Look, I say, my legs look black. Your legs look black too. Go to sleep, Dewey Dell says. Jefferson is a far piece. Dewey Dell? What? If it's not Christmas now, how will it be there? It goes round and round on the shining track. Then the track goes shining round and round. We're walking there. 
That train, in the window. You go to sleep. You can see tomorrow if it's there. Maybe Santa Claus won't know they are town boys. Do we, Doug? You go to sleep. He ain't going to let none of them town boys have it. It was behind the window. Red on the track, the track shining round and round. It made my heart hurt. And then it was Pa and Jewel and Dark and Mr. Gillespie's boy. Mr. Gillespie's boy's legs come down under his nightshirt. When he goes into the moon, his legs fuzz. They go on around the house toward the apple tree. What are they going to do, do we, Doug? They went around the house toward the apple tree. I can smell her, I said. Can you smell her too? Hush, Dewey Dell says. The wind's changed. Go to sleep. And so I'm going to know where they stay at night soon. They'll come around the house, going across the yard in the moon, carrying her on their shoulders. They carry her down to the barn, the moon shining flat and quiet on her. Then they come back and go into the house again. While they were in the moon, Mr. Gillespie's boy's leg fuzzed. And then I waited, and I said, Dewey Dell? And then I waited, and then I went to find where they stayed at night. And I saw something that Dewey Dell told me not to tell nobody. End of disc five, disc six. Against the dark doorway, he seemed to materialize out of darkness, lean as a racehorse in his underclothes in the beginning of the glare. He leaped forward with honest sense of expression of hideous and He seemed to have or his knees, in which the glare swims like two small torches. Come on, he says, leaping down the slope toward the barn. For an instant longer, he runs silver in the moonlight. Then he springs out like a flat figure cut leanly from tin against an abrupt and soundless explosion as the whole loft of the barn takes fire at once. This old is stuffed with powder. The front, the conical facade with the square orifice of doorway broken only by the square squat shape of the coffin on the sawhorses like a cubistic bulb comes into relief. Behind me, Pa and Gillespie and Mac and Dewey Dale and Bartman emerge from the house. He points to the coffin, stepping, looking at me, his face furious. Overhead, the flames sound like thunder. Across us, there is a cool draft. There is no heat in it at all yet. And a handful of chaff lifts suddenly and sucks swiftly along the stalls where a horse is screaming. Quick, I say, the horses. He glares a moment longer at me, then at the roof overhead. Then he leaps toward the stall where the horse screams. It plunges and kicks, the sound of the crashing blows sucking up into the sound of the flames. They sound like an eternal bubble. Gillespie and Matt me in knee-length nightshirts, shouting, their voices thin and high and meaningless, and at the same time profoundly wild and sad. Cow! Stall! Gillespie's nightshirt rushes ahead of him on the draft, ballooning above his hairy thighs. The stall door swung shut. Jewel thrust it back with his buttocks, and he appears, his back arched, the muscles ridged through his garments as he drags the horse out by its head. In the gloom, its eyes roll with soft, fleet, wild, opaline fire. Its muscles bunch and run as it flings its head about, lifting Jewel clear of the ground. He drags it on, slowly, terrifically. Again, he gives me across the shoulder a single glare, furious and brief. Even when they are clear of the barn, the horse continues to fight and lash backward toward the doorway until the lesbian passes me, stark naked, his neck shirt wrapped about the mule's head, and beats the maddened horse on out of the door. Jewel returns, running. Again, he looks down at the coffin, but he comes on. Where's Cal? He cries, teasing me. I follow him. In the stall, Mac is struggling with the other mule. When its head turns into the glare, I can see the wild rolling of its eye, too, but it makes no sound. It just stands there, watching Mac over its shoulder, swinging its hindquarters toward him whenever he approaches. He looks back at us, his eyes and mouth three round holes in his face on which the freckles look like English peas on a plate. His voice is thin, high, far away. I can't do nothing! It is as though the sound of his went through the lips and up and away, speaking back to us from an immense distance of exhaustion. The mule whirls, but he's already gained its head. I lean to Mac's ear. Nightshirt! Around his head! Mac stares at me. Then he rips the nightshirt off and flings it over the mule's head, and it becomes docile at once. Jewel is yelling at him. Cow! Cow! Back! Mac cries. Last stall! The cow watches us as we enter. She is backed into the corner, head lowered, still chewing, though rapidly. And she makes a move. Jewel is paused, looking up, and suddenly we watch the entire floor to the loft dissolve. It just turns to fire. A faint litter of sparks rains down. He glances about. Back under the trough is a three-legged milking stool. He catches it up and swings it into the planking of the rear wall. He splinters a plank, then another. A third. We tear the fragments away. While we are stooping to the opening, something charges into us from behind. It is a cow. When a single whistling breath, she rushes between us and through the gap and into the outer glare. Her tail erect and rigid as a broom nailed upright to the end of her spine. Jewel turns back to the front. Here, I say. Jewel! I grasp at him. He strikes my hand down. You fool! I say. Don't you see you can't make it back yonder? The hallway looks like a searchlight turned into rain. Come on! I say. Around this way! When we are through the gap, he begins to run. Jewel! I say, running. He bought it in the thingy. When I reach it, he has almost reached the next one, running against the glare like that figure cut from tin. Pa and Gillespie and Mac are some distance away, watching the barn, pink against the darkness, where for the time the moonlight has been vanquished. Catch him! I cry. Stop him! When I reach the front, he is struggling with Gillespie, the one lean in underclothes, the other. They are like two figures in a Greek frieze, isolated out of all reality by the red glare. Before I can reach them, he has struck Gillespie to the ground and turned and run back into the barn. The sound of it has become quite peaceful now, like the sound of the river did. We watch through the dissolving proscenium of the doorway as Jewel runs crouching to the far end of the coffin and stoops to it. For an instant, he looks up and out at us through the rain of burning hay like a portrait of flaming beads, and I can see his mouth shape as he calls my name. Jewel! Dewey Dell cries. Jewel! It seems to me that I now hear the accumulation of her voice through the last five minutes, and I hear her scuffling and struggling as Pa and Mac hold her, screaming, Jewel! Jewel! But he is no longer looking at us. We see his soldier. Dead from the sawhorses. It looms unbelievably tall, hiding him. I would not have believed that Addie Bundren would have needed that much room to lie comfortable in. For another instant, it stands upright, while the sparks rain on it in scattering bursts as though they engendered other sparks from the contact. 
Then it topples forward, gaining momentum, revealing Jubal, and sparks raining on him too in engendering gusts, so that he appears to be enclosed in a thin nimbus of fire. Without stopping, it overends and rears again, pauses, then crashes. A sky jewel is rolling upon it, hanging to it, as it crashes and flings it forward and clear, and Mac leaps forward into a thin smell of scorching meat and slaps at the widening crimson-edged holes that bloom like flowers in his undershirt. Vardaman. When I went to find where they stay at night, I saw something. They said, Where's Dar? Where did Dar go? They carried her back under the apple tree. The barn was too hot. I wasn't there. It was sunk down, and the red went swirling up. The barn went swirling up in little red pieces against the sky and the stars so that the stars moved backward. And then Cash was still awoke. He turned his head from side to side with sweat on his face. Do you want some more water on it, Cash? Dewey Dale said. Cash's leg and foot turned black. We held the lamp and looked at Cash's foot and leg where it was black. Your foot looks like a nigger's foot, Cash, I said. I reckon we'll have to bust it off, Pa said. What in the tarnation you put it on there for, Mr. Gillespie said. I thought it would steady it some, Pa said. I just aimed to help him. They got the flat iron and the hammer. Dewey Dell held the lamp. They had to hit it hard. And then Cash went to sleep. He's asleep now, I said. You can't hurt him while he's asleep. It just cracked. It wouldn't come off. It'll take the hide, too, Mr. Gillespie said. Why in the tarnation you put it on there? Didn't none of you think to grease his leg first? I just aimed to help him, Pa said. It was Dar put it on. Where is Dar? They said. Didn't none of you have more sense than that? Mr. Gillespie said. I'd have thought he would anyway. Jewel was lying on his face. His back was red. Dewey Dale put the medicine on it. The medicine was made out of butter and soot to draw out the fire. Then his back was black. Does it hurt, Jewel? I said. Your back looks like a nigger's, Jewel. I said. Cash's foot and leg looked like a nigger's. Then they broke it off. Cash's leg bled. You go on back and lay down, Dewey Dale said. You ought to be asleep. Where is Dar? They said. He is out there under the apple tree with her, lying on her. He is there so the cat won't come back. I said, are you going to keep the cat away, Dar? The moonlight dappled on him, too. On him it was still, but on Dar it dappled up and down. You needn't to cry, I said. Jewel got her out. You needn't to cry, Dar. The ball was too wet. It used to be redder than this. Then it went swirling, making the stars run backward without falling. It hurt my heart like the train did. When I went to find where they stay at night, I saw something that Dewey Dale says I mustn't tell nobody. Darl, we have been passing the signs for some time now. The drugstores, the clothing stores, the patent medicine in the garages and cafes, and the mile boards diminishing, becoming more starkly recurrent. Three miles, two miles. From the crest of the hill, as we get into the wagon again, we can see the smoke, low and flat, seemingly unmoving in the unwinded afternoon. Is that it, Darl? Bardeman says. Is that Jefferson? He too has lost flesh. Like ours, his face has an expression strained, dreamy, and gaunt. Yes, I say. He lifts his head and looks at the sky. High against it, they hang in narrowing circles, like the smoke, with an outward semblance of form and purpose, but with no inference of motion, progress, or retrograde. We mount the wagon again where Cash lies on the box, the jagged shards of cement cracked about his leg. The shabby mules droop rattling and planking down the hill. We'll have to take him to the doctor, Pa says. I reckon there ain't no way around it. The back of Jewel's shirt, where it touches him, stained slow and black with grease. Life was created in the valleys. It blew up onto the hills on the old terrors, the old lusts, the old desires. That's why you must walk up the hills, so you can ride down. Dewey Dells. When we reach the foot of the hill where the road flattens between close walls of trees, she begins to look about quietly from one side of the road to the other. At last, she says, I got to stop. Pa looks at her, his shabby profile, that of anticipant and disgruntled annoyance. He does not check the team. What for? I got to go to the butcher. Dewey Dale says. Pa does not check the team. Can't you wait till we get to town? It ain't over a mile now. Stop, Dewey Dale says. I got to go to the bushes. Pa stops in the middle of the road and we watch Dewey Dale descend, carrying the package. She does not look back. Why not leave your cakes here? I say. We'll watch them. She descends steadily, not looking at us. How would she know where to go if she waited till we get to town? Barnum says. Where would we go to do it in town, Dewey She lifts the package down and turns and disappears among the trees and undergrowth. Don't be no longer than you can help, Pa says. We ain't got no time to waste. She does not answer. After a while, we cannot hear her even. We ought to done like Armstead and Gillespie said and sent word to town and had it dug and ready, he says. Why didn't you? I say. You could have telephoned. What for? Jewel says. Who the hell can't dig a hole in the ground? A car comes over the hill. Slowing. It runs along the roadside in low gear, the outside wheels in the ditch, and passes us and goes on. Vardaman watches it until it is out of sight. How far is it now, Darl? He says. Not far, I say. We ought to done it, Pa says. I just never wanted to be beholden to none except her flesh and blood. Who the hell can't dig a damn hole in the ground? Jewel says. It ain't respectful. Talking that way about her grave, Pa says. You all don't know what it is. You never care about her. None of you. Jewel does not answer. He sits a little stiffly erect, his body arched away from his shirt, his high-colored jaw jumps. Dewey Dell returns. We watch her emerge from the bushes, carrying the package, and climb into the wagon. She now wears her Sunday dress, her beads, her shoes, and stockings. I thought I told you to leave them closed at home, Pa says. She does not answer, does not look at us. She sets the package in the wagon and gets in. The wagon moves on. 
How many more hills now, Darrow? Bartiman says. Just one, I say. The next one goes right up into town. This hill is red sand, bordered on either hand by Negro cabins. Against the sky ahead, the masked telephone lines run, and the clock on the courthouse lifts among the trees. In the sand, the wheels whisper, as though the very earth would hush our entry. We follow the wagon, the whispering wheels, passing the cabins where faces come suddenly to the doors, white-eyed. We hear sudden voices, ejaculate. Jewel has been looking from side to side. Now his head turns forward, and I can see his ears taking on a still deeper tone of furious red. Three Negroes walk beside the road ahead of us. Ten feet ahead of them, a white man walks. When we pass the Negroes, their heads turn suddenly with that expression of shock and instinctive outrage. Great God, one says, what they got in that wagon? Jewel whirls. Son of a bitches, he says. As he does so, he is abreast of a white man who is paused. It is as though Jewel had gone blind for the moment, for it is the white man toward whom he whirls. Darl, Cash says from the wagon. I grab the Jewel. The white man has fallen back a pace, his face still slack-jawed. Then his jaw tightens, claps too. Jewel leans above him, his jaw muscles gone white. What did you say? He says. Here, I say. He don't mean anything, mister. Jewel, I say. When I touch him, he swings at the man. I grasp his arm. We struggle. Jewel has never looked at me. He is trying to free his arm. When I see the man again, he has an open knife in his hand. Hold up, mister, I say. I've got him. Jewel, I'll say. Thanks because he's a dog. Jewel says, panting, wrenching at me. Son of a bitch, he says. A man moves. He begins to edge around me, watching Jewel, the knife low against his blade. Hey, no man call me that, he says. Pa has got down, and Dewey Dell is holding Jewel, pushing at him. I release him and face the man. Wait, I say. He don't mean nothing. He's sick. Got burned up last night, and he ate himself. Fire or no fire, the man says. Hey, no man call me that. He thought you said something to him, I say. I never said nothing to him. I've never seen him before. For God, Pa says. For God. I know, I say. He never meant anything. He'll take it back. Let him take it back, then. Put up your knife and he will. The man looks at me. He looks at Jewel. Jewel is quiet now. Put up your knife, I say. The man shuts the knife. For God, Pa says. For God. Tell him you didn't mean anything, Jewel, I say. I thought he said something, Jewel says. Just because he's hush, I say. Tell him he didn't mean it. I didn't mean it, Jewel says. He better not, the man says. Calling me a... Do you think he's afraid to call you that, I say. The man looks at me. I never said that, he said. Don't make it here, Jewel Shut up, I say. Come on. Drive on, Pa. The ball will move. The man stands watching us. Jewel does not look back. Jewel would have whipped him, Barterman says. We approach the crest, where the street runs, where cars go back and forth. The mules haul the wagon up and onto the crest, and the street. Pa stops them. The street runs on the window, where the square opens and the monument stands before the courthouse. We mount again, while the heads turn with that expression which we know, said Jewel. He does not get on, even though the wagon has started again. Get in, Jewel, I say. Come on, let's get away from here. But he does not get in. Instead, he sets his foot on the turning hub of the rear wheel one hand grasping the stanchion, and with the hub turning smoothly under his sole, he lifts the other foot and squats there, staring straight ahead, motionless, lean, wooden-backed, as though carved squatting out of the lean wood. Cash. It wasn't nothing it was to do. It was either send him to Jackson or have Gillespie sue him, because he knew some way the doll set fire to it. I don't know how he knowed, but he did. Vardaman didn't even do it, but he swore he never told nobody but Dewey Dell, and she told him not to tell nobody. But Gillespie knowed it, but he would have suspicioned it sooner or later. He could have done it that night just watching the way Darl acted. And so Pa said, I reckon there ain't nothing else to do. And Jewel said, you want to fix him? Man? Fix him? Pa said, catch him and tie him up. God damn it, you want to wait until he sets fire to the goddamn team and wagon? But there was no use in that. There ain't no use in that, I said. You can wait till she's underground. A fellow that's going to spend the rest of his life locked up, he ought to be let to have what pleasure he can have before he goes. I reckon he ought to be there, Pa says. God knows it's a trial on me. Seems like it ain't no end to bad luck when once it starts. Sometimes I ain't so sure who's got air right to say when a man is crazy and when he ain't. Sometimes I think it ain't none of us pure crazy and ain't none of us pure sane until the balance of us talks in that way. It's like it ain't so much what a fella does, but it's the way the majority of folks are looking at him when he does it. Because Jewel is too hard on him. Of course, it was Jewel's horse was traded together that night of town, and in a sense it was the value of the horse Dahl tried to burn up. But I thought more than once before we crossed the river on often how it would be God's blessing if he did take her out in our hands and get shut of her in some clean way, and it seemed to me that when Jewel worked so to get her out in the river, he was going against God in a way. And then when Dahl seen that it looked like one of us would have to do something, I can almost believe he'd done right in a way. But I don't reckon nothing excuses setting fire to a man's barn and endangering his stock and destroying his property. That's how I reckon a man is crazy. That's how he can't see eye to eye with other folks. And I reckon there ain't nothing else to do with him but what the most folks say is right. But it's a shame in a way. Folks seem to get away from the old and right teaching that the hard way of living between the edges of all things, like it was for your own use and comfort you were making it. It's like some folks has the smooth, pretty boards to build a courthouse with, and others don't have no more than rough lumber fitting to build a chicken coop. But it's better to build a tight chicken coop than a shoddy courthouse. And when they both build such a chicken coop, Neither, because it's one or t'other is going to make a man feel the better, nor the worse. So we went up the street, toward the square, and he said, We better take cash to the doctor first. We can leave him there and come back for him. That's it. It's because me and him were born close together, and it nigh ten years before Jewel and Dewey Dell and Vardaman begun to come along. I feel kin to them, all right, but I don't know. And me being the oldest, and thinking already the very thing that he'd done, I don't know. Pa was looking at me, then at him, mumbling his mouth. Go on, I said. We'll get it done first. She would want us all there, Pa says. 
Let's take Paris to the doctor first, Dal said. She'll wait. She's already waited nine days. You all don't know, Pa says. The somebody you was young with, and you growed old in her, and she growed old in you, seeing the old came on, and it was the warmth. You could hear say it don't matter, and know it was the truth out in the hard world, and all a man's grief and trouble. You all don't know. We got the digging to do, too, Pa said. Armstead and Gillespie both told you to send word ahead, Dal said. Don't you want to go to Peabody's now, Cash? Go on, I said. It feels right easy now. It's best to get things done in the right place. If it was just dog, Pa says. We forgot our spade, too. Yes, Dal said. I'll go to you. Oh, we'll have to buy one. It'll cost money, Pa says. Do you begrudge it? Dal says. Go on and get a spade, Jules said. Here, give me the money. But Pa didn't stop. I reckon we can get a spade, he said. I reckon there are Christians here. So Dal sat still and we went on, with Jules squatting on the tailgate, watching the back of Dal's head. He looked like one of these bulldogs, one of these dogs that don't bark anymore, squatting against the rope, watching the thing he was waiting to jump at. He kept that way all the time we was in front of Mrs. Bundren's house, hearing the music, walking with the dog's head with them hard white eyes. The music was playing in the house. It was one of them graphophones. It was natural as a music band. Do you want to go to Peabody's? Dal said. They can wait here and tell Pa, and I'll drive you to Peabody's and come back for you. No, I said. It was better to get her underground, now he was this close, just waiting until Pa borrowed the shovel. He drove along the street until we could hear the music. Maybe they got one here. He said. He pulled up at Mrs. Bundren's. It was like he knowed. Sometimes I think that if a worker man could see work as far ahead as a lazy man can see laziness. So he stopped there like he knowed, before that little new house, where the music was. We waited there, hearing it. I believe I could have dickered Surratt down to five dollars on that one of his. It's a comfortable thing, music is. Maybe they got one here, Pa says. You want Jewel to go? Dal says. Or do you reckon I better? I reckon I better, Pa says. He got down and went up the path and around the house to the back. The music stopped. Then it started again. He'll get it too, Dal said. Hey, I said. It was just like he knowed. Like he could keep the for the next ten minutes. Only it was more than ten minutes. The music stopped and never commenced again for a good spell. While her and Pa was talking at the back. We waited in the wagon. You let me take you back to Peabody's, Dal said. No, I said. We'll get her underground. If he ever gets back, Jewel said. He began to cuss. He started to get down from the wagon. I'm going, he said. Then we saw Pa coming back. He had two spades coming around the house. He laid them in the wagon and got in and we went on. The music never started again. Pa was looking back at the house. He kind of lifted his hand a little and I saw the shade pulled back a little at the window and her face in it. But the curiousest thing was Dewey Dell. It surprised me. I see all the while how folks could say he was queer, but that was the very reason couldn't nobody hold it personal. It was like he was outside of it too, same as you, and getting mad at it would be kind of like getting mad at a mud puddle that splashed you when you stepped in it. And then I always kind of had the idea that him and Dewey Dell kind of know things betwixt them. If I'd have said it was air one of us she liked better than air other, I'd have said it was dark. But when we got it filled and covered and drove out the gate and turned into the lane where them fellows was waiting, when they come out and come on him and he jerked back, it was Dewey Bell that was on him before even Jewel could get at him. And then I believed that he knew how the less he knows about how his barn taken fire. She never said a word. I hadn't even looked at him. But when them fellows told him what they wanted, and that they had come to get him, and he throwed back, she jumped on him like a wild cat because one of the fellows had to quit and hold her, and her scratched his throat like a wooden cat, while the other one and Pa and Jewel throwed Doll down and held him lying on his back, looking up at me. I thought you would have told me, he said. I never thought you wouldn't have. Da, I said. But he fought again, him and Jewel and the fellow, and the other one holding Dewey Dell and Vodham and yelling, and Jewel saying, Kill him, kill the son of a bitch. It was bad, so. It was bad. A fellow can't get away from a shiny job. He can't do it. I tried to tell him, but he just said, I thought you'd have told me. It's not that I... He said. Then he began to laugh. The other fellow pulled Jewel off of him, and he sat there on the ground, laughing. I tried to tell him. If I could have just moved, even set up. But I tried to tell him, and he quit laughing, looking up at me. Do you want me to go? He said. It'll be better for you, I said. Down there, it'll be quiet, with none of the bothering and such. It'll be better for you, doll, I said. Better, he said. He began to laugh again. Better, he said. He couldn't hardly say it for laughing. He sat on the ground and us watching him laughing and laughing. It was bad. It was bad, so. I'd be darned if I could see anything to laugh at. Because there just ain't nothing justifies the deliberate destruction of what a man has built with his own sweat and store the fruit of his sweat into. But I don't think so. There are many men to say what is crazy and what ain't. It's like there was a fellow in every man that's done a past the sanity or the infinity that reaches the sane and the insane doings of that man with the same horror and the same astonishment. Peabody. I said, I reckon the type might let Bill Vee patch him up like a damn mule. I'd be damned if the man that had let Aunt Spundren treat him with raw cement ain't got more spare legs than I have. They just aimed to ease it some, he said. Aimed hell, I said. What in hell did Armstead mean by even letting them put you on that wagon again? It was getting right noticeable, he said. We never had time to wait. I just looked at him. It never bothered me none, he said. Don't you lie there and try to tell me you rode six days on a wagon without springs with a broken leg and it never bothered you. It never bothered me much, he said. You mean it never bothered Aunt's much, I said. No more than it bothered him to throw that poor devil down in the public street and handcuff him like a damn murderer. Don't tell me. And don't tell me it ain't going to bother you to lose sixty-odd square inches of skin to get that concrete off. And don't tell me it ain't going to bother you to have to limp around on one short leg for the balance of your life. 
If you walk it all again, concrete. I said, God almighty, why didn't ants carry you to the nearest sawmill and stick your leg in the saw? That would have cured it. Then you all could have stuck his head into the saw and cured the whole family. Where's ants anyway? What's he up to now? He's taking back those spades he borrowed, he said. That's right, I said. Of course, he'd have to borrow a spade. Unless he could borrow a hole in the ground. Too bad y'all didn't put him in it, too. Does that hurt? Not to speak of, he said, and the sweat big as marbles running down his face, and his face about the color of blotting paper. Of course not, I said. About next. To speak of, if you had anything you could call luck, you might say it was lucky this is the same leg you broke before, I said. It's what Pa says, he said. McGowan. It happened I'm back of the prescription case pulling up some chocolate sauce when Jody comes back and says, Say, Skeet, there's a woman up front that wants to see the doctor. And when I said, What doctor you want to see? She said she wants to see the doctor that works here. And when I said, There ain't any doctor works here, she just stood there looking back at me. What kind of a woman is it? I says. Tell her to go upstairs to Alfred's office. Countrywoman, he says. Send her to the courthouse, I says. Tell her all the doctors have gone to Memphis to a barber's convention. All right, he says, going away. She looks pretty good for a country girl, he says. Ooh, I says. He waited and I went and peeped through the crack. But I couldn't tell nothing except she had a good leg against the light. Is she young, you say? I says. She looks like a pretty hot mama for a country girl, he says. Take this, I says, giving him the chocolate. I took off my apron and went up there. She looked pretty good. One of them black-eyed ones that looked like she'd as soon put a knife in you as not if you two-timed her. She was pretty good. That was... It was that time. What can I do for you, I says. Are you the doctor? She says. Sure, I says. She quit looking at me and came looking around. Can we go back yonder? She says. It was just a quarter past twelve. But I went and told Jody to kind of watch out and whistle if the old man come inside, because he never got back before one. He better lay off of that, Jody says. He'll fire your stern out of here so quick you can't wink. He don't never get back before one, I says. You can see him go into the post office. You keep your eye peeled now, and give me a whistle. What you going to do, he says. You keep your eye out. I'll tell you later. Ain't you going to give me no seconds on it, he says. What the hell do you think this is, I says. I stood fine. You watch it. I'm going into conference. So I go on to the back. I stopped at the glass and smoothed my hair. Then I went behind the prescription case where she was waiting. She's looking at the medicine cabinet. Then she looks at me. Now, madam, I says, what is your trouble? It's the female trouble, she says, watching me. I got the money, she says. Ah, I says, have you got female troubles, or do you want female troubles? And so, you come to the doctor. Them country people, half the time they don't know what they want, and a balance of the time they can't tell it to you. The clock said twenty past twelve. No, she says. No which, I says. I ain't had it, she says. That's it. She did I got the money, she says. So I knew what she was talking about. Oh, I says, you got something in value which you didn't have. She looks at me. You wish you had a little more or a little less, huh? I got the money, she says. He said I could get something at the drugstore for it. Who says so? I says. He did. She said, you don't need to call me. The one that put the acorn in your belly? He the one that told you? She don't say nothing. You ain't married, are you? I says. I never saw no ring. But like as not, they ain't heard yet out there that they use rings. I got the money, she says. She showed it to me, tied up in a handkerchief. I'll swear you have, I says. He give it to you? Yes, she says. Which one, he says. She looks at me. Which one of them give it to you? It ain't but one, she says. She looks at me. Go on, I says. She don't say nothing. The trouble about the cellar is, it ain't but one way out, and that's back up the inside stairs. The clock says twenty-five to one. A pretty girl like you, I says. She looks at me. She begins to tie the money back up in the handkerchief. Excuse me a minute, I says. I go around the prescription case. Did you hear about that fellow sprained his ear? I says. After that, he couldn't even hear a belch. You better get her out there before the old man comes, Jody says. If you stay up there in front where he pays you to stay, he won't catch nobody but me, I says. He goes on, slow, toward the front. What you doing to her, Skeet? He says. I can't tell you, he says. It wouldn't be ethical. You go on up there and watch. Say, Skeet, he says. Ah, go on, I says. I ain't doing nothing but filling a prescription. He may not do nothing about that woman back there, but if he finds you mugging with that prescription case, he'll kick your stern clean down them cellar stairs. My stern has been kicked by a bigger bastard than him, I says. Go back and watch out for him now. The doc said fifteen to one. She's tying the money in the handkerchief. You ain't done, she says. Sure I am, I says. She watches me. Is it because I look too young? Or am I too handsome? I says. We used to have a bunch of old water children doctors here, I says. Jefferson used to be a kind of old doctor's home for them. But business started falling off, and people so well, until one day they found out that the women wouldn't ever get sick at all. So they run all the old doctors out and got us young good-looking ones that the women would like. And then the women began to get sick again, and so business picked up. They're doing that all over the country. Haven't you heard about it? Maybe it's because they never needed a doctor. I need one now, she says. And you come to the right one, I says. I already told you that. Have you got something for it? She says. I got the money. Well, I says, of course, a doctor has to learn all sorts of things while he's learning to roll cattle <laughs> But I don't know about your trouble. He told me I could get something. He told me I could get it at the drugstore. I says, you better go back and ask him. Turn in the handkerchief. I got to do something, she says. How bad do you want to do something? I says. She looks at me. 
Of course, a doctor learns all sorts of things folks don't think he knows. But I'm supposed to be, you know. It's against the law. Up front, Jody says, Ski. Excuse me a minute, I says. I went up front. Do you see him? I says. Ain't you done yet? He says. Maybe you better come up here and watch and let me do that consultant. Maybe you lay an egg, I says. I come back. She's looking at me. Of course you realize that I could be put in the penitentiary for doing what you want, I says. I would lose my license and then I have to go to work. You realize that? I ain't got the ten dollars, she says. I could bring the rent next month, maybe. Cool, I said. Ten dollars? You see, I can't put no price on my knowledge and skill. Certainly not for no little paltry sawbuck. She looks at me. She don't even blink. What you want, then? The clock said four to one. So I decided I better get her out. You guess three times and then I'll show you, I says. She don't even blink her eyes. She says. She looks behind her and around, then she looks toward the front. She says. You mean you're ready to right now? I says. Here? Give me the medicine first, she says. So I took a graduated glass and kind of turned my back to her and picked out a bottle that looked all right, because a man that would keep poison sitting around in an unlabeled bottle all doing jail anyway. It smelled like turpentine. I poured some into the glass and give it to her. Across the house. It smells like turpentine, she says. Sure, I says. That's just the beginning of the treatment. You come back at ten o'clock tonight, and I'll give you the rest of it and perform the operation. Operation? She says. It won't hurt you. You've had the same operation before. Ever hear about the hair of the dog? She looks at me. Will it work? She says. Sure it'll work. If you come back and get it. So she drunk whatever it was without batting an eye and went out. I went up front. Didn't you get it? Jody says. Get what? I says. Ah, oh, come on, he says. I ain't going to try to beat your time. Oh, her, I says. She just wanted a little medicine. She's got a bad case of dysentery, and she's a little ashamed about mentioning it. It was me. real bastard. I got his hat on him. I went to the car with him. I went to the street lamps and went on out of sight. Then I came back to the store and waited until 9.30 and turned out the front lights and locked the door and left just one on the at the back. And I went back and put some talcum powder into six capsules and kind of cleared up the cellar. And then I was all ready. She come in just at ten, before the clock had done. I heard her down and she came in, walking fast. I looked out the door, but there wasn't nobody but a boy in overall sitting on the curb. You want something? I says. He never said nothing, just looking at me. I locked the door and turned off the light and went on back. She was waiting. Where is it? She said. I gave her the box of capsules. She held the box in her hand, looking at the capsules. Are you sure it'll work? She says. Sure, I says. Well, you take the rest of the treatment. Where do I take it? She says. Down in the cellar, I says. Vardaman. But the stores are dark because they've all gone home. The stores are dark, but the lights pass on the windows when we pass. The lights are in the trees around the courthouse. They roost in the trees, but the courthouse is dark. The clock on it looks four ways, because it is not dark. The moon is not dark, too. Not very dark. Doll, he went to Jackson as my brother. Doll is my brother. Only it was over that way, shining on the track. Let's be I see. What for? Dewey Dell says. The track went shining around the window. It read on the track. But she said he would not sell it to the town boys. But it will be there Christmas, Dewey Dell says. You'll have to wait when he brings it back. Doll went to Jackson. Lots of people didn't go to Jackson. Doll is my brother. My brother is going to Jackson. While we walk, the lights go around, roosting in the trees. On all sides, it is the same. They go around the courthouse, and then you cannot see them. But you can see them in the black windows beyond. They have all gone home to bed, except me and Dewey Dell. Going on the train to Jackson, my brother. There is a light in the store far back. In the window are two big ones with a green. Drink them. Two mules could not. Two cows could not. Dar. A man comes to the door. He looks at Dewey Dell. You wait out here, Dewey Dell says. Why can't I come in? I say, I want to come in too. You wait out here, she says. All right, I say. Dewey Dell goes in. Darl is my brother. Darl went crazy. The walk is harder than sitting on the ground. He is in the open door. He looks at me. You want something? He says. His head is slick. Jules' head is slick sometimes. Cash's head is not slick. Darl, he went to Jackson, my brother Darl. In the street. Wouldn't you rather have bananas? Dewey Dell said. You wait till Christmas. It'll be there then. Then you can see it. So we are going to have some bananas. We are going to have a bag full, me and Dewey Dell. He locks the door. Dewey Dell is inside. Then the light winked out. He went to Jackson. He went crazy and went to Jackson both. Lots of people didn't go crazy. Pa and Cash and Jewel and Dewey Dell and me didn't go crazy. We never did go crazy. We didn't go to Jackson either. No. I hear the cow a long time clapping on the street. Then she comes into the square. She goes across the square, her head down, clapping. She lows. There was nothing in the square before she lowed, but it wasn't empty. No, it is empty after she lowed. She goes on. Clapping. She lows. My brother is dark. He went to Jackson on the train. He didn't go on the train to go crazy. He went crazy in our wagon. Dog. She's been in there a long time. And the cow's gone too. A long time. She's been in there longer than the cow was. 
but not as known as Lupin. Dar is my brother. My brother, Dar. Dewey Dale comes out. She looks at me. Let's go around that way now, I say. She looks at me. It ain't going to work, she says. That son of a bitch. What ain't going to work, Dewey Dale? I just know it won't, she says. She is not looking at anything. I just... Let's go this way. We got to go back to the hotel. It's late. We got to slip back in. Can't we go by and see anyway? Hadn't you rather have bananas? Hadn't you rather? All right. My brother, he went crazy, and he went to Jackson, too. Jackson is further away than crazy. It won't work, Dewey Dale says. I just know it won't. What won't work, I say? He had to get on the train to go to Jackson. He's been on the train, but Darl has been on the train. Darl. Darl is my brother. Darl. Darl. Darl has gone to Jackson. They put him on the train, laughing. Down the lane, tearing laughing. The hands turning like the heads of owls when he passed. What are you laughing at? I said. Yes, 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 yes. Two men put him on the train. They wore mismatched coats, bulging behind over their right hip pockets. Their necks were shaved to the hairline, as though the recent and simultaneous barbers had had a chalk line like caches. Is it the pistols you're laughing at? I said. Why do you laugh? I said. Is it because you hate the sound of laughing? They pulled two seats together so Darl could sit by the window to laugh. One of them sat beside him, the other sat on the seat facing him, riding backward. One of them had to ride backward, because the state's money has a face to each backside, and a backside to each face. And they are riding on the state's money, which is incest. A nickel has a woman on one side and a buffalo on the other, two faces, and no back. I don't know what that is. Darl had a little spyglass he got in France at the war. In it, it had a woman and a pig with two backs and no face. I know what that is. Is that why you were laughing, Darl? Yes, 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 yes. The wagon stands on the square, hitched, the mules motionless, the reins wrapped about the seat spring, the back of the wagon toward the courthouse. It looks more than Jewel standing beside it and looking up the street like any other man in town that day. Yet there is something different, distinctive. There is about it an unmistakable air of definite and imminent departure. The train's here. Perhaps due to the fact that Dewey Dale and on the seat and cash on a pallet in the wagon bed are eating bananas from a paper bag. Is that why you are laughing, Darl? Darl is our brother. Our brother Darl. Our brother Darl in a cage in Jackson. Well, his grind hands lying light in the quiet interstices. Looking out, he foams. Yes, 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 yes. Dewey Dale. When he saw the money, I said, It's not my money. It doesn't belong to me. Whose is it then? It's Cora Tull's money. It's Mrs. Tull's. I sold the cakes for it. Ten dollars for two cakes? Don't you touch it. It's not mine. You never had them cakes. It's a lie. It was in Sunday clothes you had in that package. Do you put it? You, you are a thief. My own daughter told you to be a thief. My own daughter. Pa. Pa. I have fed you and sheltered you. I give you love and care. Yet my own daughter, the daughter of my dead wife, calls me a thief over her mother's grave. It's not mine, I tell you. If it was, God knows you could have it. Where did you get ten dollars? Pa. Pa. You won't tell me. Did you come out with people you dare not? It's not mine, I tell you. Can't you understand it's not mine? It's not like I wouldn't pay it back. But she calls her own father a thief. I can't, I tell you. I tell you it's not my money. God knows you could have it. I wouldn't take it. My own born daughter that has had my food for 17 years begrudges me the loan of $10. It's not mine. I can't. Whose is it then? It was given to me. To buy something with. To buy what with? Pa. Pa. It's just a loan. God knows I hate for my blood and children to reproach me. I would give them what was mine without stint. Cheerful I give them without stint. And now they deny me. Addie, it was lucky for you you died, Addie. Pa. Pa. God knows it is. He took the money and went out. Cash. So when we stopped there to borrow the shovels, we heard the graphophone playing in the house. And so when we got done with the shovels, Pa says, I reckon I better take them back. So we went back to the house. We better take cash on to Peabody's, Jules said. It won't take but a minute, Pa said. He got down from the wagon. The music would not play now. Let Barnum do it, Jules said. He can do it in half the time you can. Or here, you let me. I reckon I better do it, Pa says. As long as it was me that borrowed them. So we stepped in the wagon. But the music wasn't playing now. I reckon it. I reckon I wouldn't ever talk at all for listening to it. I don't know if a little music ain't about the nicest thing a fellow can have. Seems like when he comes in tired every night, there ain't nothing against him but a little music played and him resting. I've seen them that shuts up like a hand grip, with a handle and all, so a fellow can carry it with him wherever he wants. What you reckon he's doing? Jewel says. I could have toted them shovels back and forth ten times by now. Let him take his time, I said. He ain't a surprise, you remember. Why didn't he let me take them back then? We got to get your legs fixed so we can start home tomorrow. We got plenty of time, I said. I wonder what their machines costs on the installment. Installment of what? Jewel said. What you got to buy it with? A fellow can't tell, I said. He could have been called, I believe. And so Pa come back and we went to Peabody's. While we was there, Pa said he was going to the barber shop and get a shave. And for that night, he said he had some business to do, kind of looking away from us while he said it, with his hair combed wet and slick and smelling sweet with perfume. But I said, leave him be. I wouldn't mind hearing a little more of that music myself. And so next morning, he was going to Then he come back and told us to get hitched up and ready to take out and he would meet us. And when they was gone, he said, I don't reckon you got no more money. Peabody just gave me enough to pay the hotel with, I said. We don't need nothing else, do we? No, Pa said. No, we don't need nothing. He stood there, not looking at me. If it is something we got to have, I reckon maybe Peabody... I said. No, he said. It ain't nothing else. 
You all wait for me at the corner. So Jewel got the team and come for me and they fixed me a pallet in the wagon and we drove across the square to the corner where Pa said. And we was waiting there in the wagon with Dewey Dell and Vardaman eating bananas when we see them coming up the street. Pa was coming along with that kind of dancing and hangdog look all at once like when he's been up to something he knows Ma ain't gonna like, carrying a grip in his hand. And Jewel says, who's that? Then we see it wasn't the grip that made him look different. It was his face. And Jewel says, he got them teeth. It was a fact. It made him look a foot taller, kind of holding his head up, hangdog and proud too. And then we see her behind him, carrying the other grip, a kind of duck-shaped woman all dressed up with them kind of hard-looking pop eyes like she was daring air man to say nothing. And there we sat watching them with Dewey Dolls and Vardaman's mouth half open and half at bananas in their hands and her coming around from behind Pa, looking at us like she dared air man. And then I see that the grip she was carrying was one of them little graphophones. It was the awesome, prettiest picture. And every time a new record would come from the mail order and us sitting in the house in the winter, listening to it, I would think what a shame Dar couldn't be to enjoy it too. But it is better so for him. This world is not his world. This life is life. It's Cash and Jewel and Vardaman and Dewey Dell. Parsons. Kind of hangdog and proud too, with his teeth and all, even if he wouldn't look at us. Meet Mrs. Bundren, he says. We hope you have enjoyed this honorable introduction. As I lay dying, I will Faulkner. This program was produced by Dan Musselman and directed by Jill Whitesides. Text copyright 1930 by William Faulkner. Copyright renewed 1958 by William Faulkner.